Chapter 8, Part 2 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in August 2019. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter 8, Part 2. A strait of the sea separating England and Wales has also been introduced, on the evidence afforded by shells of existing species found in a deposit of gravel, sand, loam, and clay, called the Northern Drift, by Sir R. Murchison. And Mr. Trimmer has discovered similar recent marine shells on the northern coast of North Wales, and on Moyle Trefon, near the Menai Straits, at the height of 1,392 feet above the level of the sea. Some raised sea beaches and drift containing marine shells, which I examined in 1843 between Limerick and Dublin, and which have been traced over other parts of Ireland by different geologists, have required an extension of the dark lines so as to divide that island into several. In improving this part of my map, I have been especially indebted to the assistance of Mr. Oldham, who in 1843 announced to the British Association at Cork the fact that at the period when the drift or glacial beds were deposited, Ireland must have formed an archipelago, such as is here depicted. A considerable part of Scotland might also have been represented in a similar manner as underwater when the drift originated. A portion of Brittany is divided into islands because it is known to be covered with patches of marine tertiary strata, chiefly Miocene. When I examined these in 1830 and 1843, I convinced myself that the sea must have covered much larger areas than are now occupied by these small and detached deposits. The former connection of the White Sea and the Gulf of Finland is proved by the fact that a multitude of huge erratic blocks extend over the intervening space, and a large portion of Norway, Sweden and Denmark, as well as Germany and Russia, are represented as sea, on the same evidence, strengthened by the actual occurrence of fossil seashells, of recent species, in the drift of various portions of those countries. The submergence of considerable areas under large bodies of fresh water, during the tertiary period, of which there are many striking geological proofs in Auvergne and elsewhere, has not been expressed by ruled lines. They bear testimony to the former existence of neighboring lands, and a certain elevation of the areas where they occur above the level of the ocean. They are therefore left blank together with all the space that cannot be demonstrated to have been part of the sea at some time or other since the commencement of the Eocene epoch. In compiling this map, which has been entirely recast since the first edition, I have availed myself of the latest geological maps of the British Isles and north of Europe, and of those published by the government surveyors of France, Messieurs de Beaumont and Dufresnois, the map of Germany and part of Europe by von Dechen, and that of Italy by M. Tchihachov. Lastly, Sir R. Murchison's important map of Russia and the adjoining countries has enabled me to mark out not only a considerable area, previously little known, in which tertiary formations occur, but also a still wider expanse over which the northern drift and erratic blocks with occasional marine shells are traceable. The southern limits of these glacial deposits in Russia and Germany indicate the boundary, so far as we can now determine it, of the northern ocean at a period immediately antecedent to that of the human race. I was anxious, even in the title of this map, to guard the reader against the supposition that it was intended to represent the state of the physical geography of part of Europe at any one point of time. The difficulty, or rather the impossibility, of restoring the geography of the globe as it may have existed at any former period, especially a remote one, consists in this, that we can only point out where part of the sea has been turned into land, and are almost always unable to determine what land may have become sea. 
All maps, therefore, pretending to represent the geography of remote geological epochs, must be ideal. The map under consideration is not a restoration of a former state of things, at any particular moment of time, but a synoptical view of a certain amount of one kind of change, the conversion of sea into land, known to have been brought about within a given period. It may be proper to remark that the vertical movements to which the land is subject in certain regions occasion alternately the subsidence and the uprising of the surface, and that, by such oscillations at successive periods, a great area may have been entirely covered with marine deposits, although the whole may never have been beneath the waters at one time, nay, even though the relative proportion of land and sea may have continued unaltered throughout the whole period. I believe, however, that since the commencement of the tertiary period, the dry land in the northern hemisphere has been continually on the increase, both because it is now greatly in excess beyond the average proportion which land generally bears to water on the globe, and because a comparison of the secondary and tertiary strata affords indications, as I have already shown, of a passage from the condition of an ocean interspersed with islands to that of a large continent. But supposing it were possible to represent all the vicissitudes in the distribution of land and sea that have occurred during the tertiary period, and to exhibit not only the actual existence of land where there was once sea, but also the extent of surface now submerged which may once have been land, the map would still fail to express all the important revolutions in physical geography which have taken place within the epoch under consideration. For the oscillations of level, as was before stated, have not merely been such as to lift up the land from below the water, but in some cases to occasion a rise of many thousand feet above the sea. Thus the Alps have acquired an additional altitude of 4,000, and even in some places 10,000 feet, and the Apennines owe a considerable part of their present height to subterranean convulsions which have happened within the tertiary epoch. On the other hand, some mountain chains may have been lowered during the same series of ages, in an equal degree, and shoals may have been converted into deep abysses. Since this map was recast in 1847, geologists have very generally come to the conclusion that the numulitic limestone, together with the overlying phacoidal grit and shale, called flish in the Alps, belongs to the older tertiary or Eocene group. As these numulitic rocks enter into the structure of some of the most lofty and disturbed parts of the Alps, Apennines, Carpathians, Pyrenees, and other mountain chains, and form many of the elevated lands of Africa and Asia, their position almost implies the ubiquity of the post-Eocene ocean, not indeed by the simultaneous, but by the successive occupancy of the whole ground by its waters. Concluding Remarks on Changes in Physical Geography The foregoing observations, it may be said, are confined chiefly to Europe, and therefore merely establish the increase of dry land in a space which constitutes but a small portion of the northern hemisphere. But it was stated in the preceding chapter that the great lowland of Siberia, lying chiefly between the latitudes 55 degrees and 75 degrees north, an area nearly equal to all Europe, is covered for the most part by marine strata, which, from the account given by Pallas, and more recently by Sir R. Murchison, belongs to a period when all, or nearly all, the shells were of a species still living in the north. The emergence, therefore, of this area from the deep is, comparatively speaking, a very modern event, and must, as before remarked, have caused a great increase in coal throughout the globe. Upon a review, then, of all the facts above enumerated, respecting the ancient geography of the globe as attested by geological monuments, there appear good grounds for inferring that changes of climate coincided with remarkable revolutions in the former position of sea and land. A wide expanse of ocean, interspersed with islands, 
seems to have pervaded the northern hemisphere at the periods when the silurian and carboniferous rocks were formed and a warm and very uniform temperature then prevailed subsequent modifications in climate accompanied the deposition of the secondary formations when repeated changes were effected in the physical geography of our northern latitudes lastly the refrigeration became most decided and the climate most nearly assimilated to that now enjoyed when the lands in europe and northern asia had attained their full extension and the mountain chains their actual height soon after the first publication of this theory of climate an objection was made by an anonymous german critic in eighteen thirty three that there are no geological proofs of the prevalence of any former period of a temperature lower than that now enjoyed whereas if the causes above assigned were the true ones it might reasonably have been expected that fossil remains would sometimes indicate colder as well as hotter climates than those now established in answer to this objection i may suggest that our present climates are probably far more distant from the extreme of possible heat than from its opposite extreme of cold a glance at the map will show that all the existing lands might be placed between the thirtieth parallels of latitude on each side of the equator and that even then they would by no means fill that space in no other position would they give rise to so high a temperature but the present geographical condition of the earth is so far removed from such a state of things that the land lying between the poles and the parallels of thirty is in great excess so much so that instead of being to the sea in the proportion of one two three which is as near as possible the average general ratio throughout the globe it is nine to twenty three hence it ought not to surprise us if in our geological retrospect embracing perhaps a small part only of a complete cycle of change in the terrestrial climates we should happen to discover everywhere the signs of a higher temperature the strata hitherto examined may have originated when the quantity of equatorial land was always decreasing and the land in regions nearer the poles augmenting in height and area until at length it attained its present excess in high latitudes there is nothing improbable in supposing that the geographical revolutions of which we have hitherto obtained proofs had this general tendency and in that case the refrigeration must have been constant although for reasons before explained the rate of cooling may not have been uniform it may however be as well to recall the reader's attention to what was before said of the indication brought to light of late years of a considerable oscillation of temperature in the period immediately preceding the human era we have seen that on examining some of the most northern deposits those commonly called the northern drift in scotland ireland and canada in which nearly all in some cases perhaps all the fossil shells are of recent species we discover the signs of a climate colder than that now prevailing in corresponding latitudes on both sides the atlantic it appears that an arctic fauna specifically resembling that of the present seas extended farther to the south than now this opinion is derived partly from the known habitations of the corresponding living species and partly from the abundance of certain genera of shells and the absence of others the date of the refrigeration thus inferred appears to coincide very nearly with the era of the dispersion of erratic blocks over europe and north america a phenomenon which will be ascribed in the sequel to the cold then prevailing in the northern hemisphere the force moreover of the german critic's objection has been since in a great measure destroyed by the larger and more profound knowledge acquired in the last few years of the ancient carboniferous flora which has led the ablest botanists to adopt the opinion that the climate of the coal period was remarkable for its warmth moisture equability and freedom from cold rather than the intensity of its tropical heat we are therefore no longer entitled to assume that there has been a constant and gradual decline in the absolute amount of heat formerly contained in the atmosphere and waters of the ocean 
such as it was conjectured might have emanated from the incandescent central nucleus of a new and nearly fluid planet before the interior had lost by radiation into surrounding space a great part of its original high temperature astronomical causes of fluctuations in climate sir john herschel has lately inquired whether there are any astronomical causes which may offer a possible explanation of the difference between the actual climate of the earth's surface and those which formerly appear to have prevailed he has entered upon this subject he says impressed with the magnificence of that view of geological revolutions which regards them rather as regular and necessary effects of great and general causes than as resulting from a series of convulsions and catastrophes regulated by no laws and reducible to no fixed principles geometers he adds have demonstrated the absolute invariability of the mean distance of the earth from the sun whence it would at first seem to follow that the mean annual supply of light and heat derived from that luminary would be alike invariable but a closer consideration of the subject will show that this would not be a legitimate conclusion but that on the contrary the mean amount of solar radiation is dependent on the eccentricity of the earth's orbit and therefore liable to variation now the eccentricity of the orbit he continues is actually diminishing and has been so for ages beyond the records of history in consequence the ellipse is in a state of approach to a circle and the annual average of solar heat radiated to the earth is actually on the decrease so far this is in accordance with geological evidence which indicates a general refrigeration of climate but the question remains whether the amount of diminution which the eccentricity may have ever undergone can be supposed sufficient to account for any sensible refrigeration the calculations necessary to determine this point though practicable have never yet been made and would be extremely laborious for they must embrace all the perturbations which the most influential planets venus mars jupiter and saturn would cause in the earth's orbit and in each other's movements round the sun the problem is also very complicated inasmuch as it depends not merely on the ellipticity of the earth's orbit but on the assumed temperature of the celestial spaces beyond the earth's atmosphere a matter still open to discussion and on which m fourier and sir j herschel have arrived at very different opinions but if says herschel we suppose an extreme case as if the earth's orbit should ever become as eccentric as that of the planet juno or pallas a great change of climate might be conceived to result the winter and summer temperatures being sometimes mitigated and at others exaggerated in the same latitudes it is much to be desired that the calculations alluded to were executed as even if they should demonstrate as m arago thinks highly probable that the mean amount of solar radiation can never be materially affected by irregularities in the earth's motion it would still be satisfactory to ascertain the point such inquiries however can never supersede the necessity of investigating the consequences of the varying position of continents shifted as we know them to have been during successive epochs from one part of the globe to the other another astronomical hypothesis respecting the possible cause of secular variations in climate has been proposed by a distinguished mathematician and philosopher m poisson he begins by assuming first that the sun and our planetary system are not stationary but carried onward by a common movement through space secondly that every point in space receives heat as well as light from innumerable stars surrounding it on all sides so that if a right line of indefinite length be produced in any direction from such a point it must encounter a star either visible or invisible to us thirdly he then goes on to assume that the different regions of space which in the course of millions of years are traversed by our system must be of very unequal temperature inasmuch as some of them must receive a greater 
others a less quantity of radiant heat from the great stellary enclosure. If the earth, he continues, or any other large body pass from a hotter to a colder region, it would not readily lose in the second all the heat which it has imbibed in the first region, but retain a temperature increasing downwards from the surface, as in the actual condition of our planet. Now the opinion originally suggested by Sir W. Herschel, that our sun and its attendant planets were all moving onward through space, in the direction of the constellation Hercules, is very generally thought by eminent astronomers to be confirmed. But even if its reality be no longer matter of doubt, conjectures as to its amount are still vague and uncertain, and great indeed must be the extent of the movement before this cause alone can work any material alteration in the terrestrial climates. Mr. Hopkins, when treating of this theory, remarked, that so far as we were acquainted with the position of the stars not very remote from the sun, they seem to be so distant from each other that there are no points in space among them where the intensity of radiating heat would be comparable to that which the earth derives from the sun, except at points very near to each star. Thus, in order that the earth should derive a degree of heat from stellar radiation comparable to that now derived from the sun, she must be in close proximity to some particular star, leaving the aggregate effect of radiation from the other stars nearly the same as at present. This approximation, however, to a single star, could not take place consistently with the preservation of the motion of the earth about the sun, according to its present laws. Suppose our sun should approach a star within the present distance of Neptune that planet could no longer remain a member of the solar system, and the motions of the other planets would be disturbed in a degree which no one has ever contemplated as probable since the existence of the solar system. But such a star, supposing it to be no larger than the sun, and to emit the same quantity of heat, would not send to the earth much more than one thousandth part of the heat which she derives from the sun, and would therefore produce only a very small change in terrestrial temperature. Variable Splendor of Stars There is still another astronomical suggestion respecting the possible causes of secular variations in the terrestrial climates which deserves notice. It has long been known that certain stars are liable to great and periodical fluctuations in splendor, and Sir J. Herschel has lately ascertained January 1840, that a large and brilliant star called Alpha Orionis sustained, in the course of six weeks, a loss of nearly half its light. This phenomenon, he remarks, cannot fail to awaken attention, and revive those speculations which were first put forth by my father Sir W. Herschel, respecting the possibility of a change in the lustre of our sun itself. If there really be a community of nature between the sun and fixed stars, every proof that we obtain of the extensive prevalence of such periodical changes in those remote bodies adds to the probability of finding something of the kind nearer home. Referring then to the possible bearing of such facts on ancient revolutions, in terrestrial climates, he says that, it is a matter of observed fact that many stars have undergone in past ages, within the records of astronomical history, very extensive changes in apparent luster, without a change of distance adequate to producing such an effect. If our sun were even intrinsically much brighter than at present, the mean temperature of the surface of our globe would, of course, be proportionally greater. I speak not now of periodical, but of secular changes. But the argument is complicated with the consideration of the possibly imperfect transparency of the celestial spaces, and with the cause of that imperfect transparency, which may be due to material non-luminous particles diffused irregularly in patches analogous to nebulae, but of greater extent, to cosmical clouds in short, of whose existence we have, I think, some indication in the singular and apparently capricious phenomena of temporary stars, 
and perhaps in the recent extraordinary sudden increase and hardly less sudden diminution of eta argus more recently 1852 schwabe has observed that the spots on the sun alternately increase and decrease in the course of every ten years and captain sabine has pointed out that this variable obscuration coincides in time both as to its maximum and minimum with changes in all those terrestrial magnetic variations which are caused by the sun hence he infers that the period of alteration in the spots is a solar magnetic period assuming such to be the case the variable light of some stars may indicate a similar phenomenon or they may be stellar magnetic periods differing only in the degree of obscuration and its duration and as hitherto we have perceived no fluctuation in the heat received by the earth from the sun coincident with the solar magnetic period so the fluctuations in the brilliancy of the stars may not perhaps be attended with any perceptible alterations in their power of radiating heat but before we can speculate with advantage in this new and interesting field of inquiry we require more facts and observations supposed gradual diminution of the earth's primitive heat the gradual diminution of the supposed primitive heat of the globe has been resorted to by many geologists as the principal cause of alterations of climate the matter of our planet is imagined in accordance with the conjectures of leibniz to have been originally in an intensely heated state and to have been parting ever since with portions of its heat and at the same time contracting its dimensions there are undoubtedly good grounds for inferring from recent observation and experiment that the temperature of the earth increases as we descend from the surface to that slight depth to which man can penetrate but there are no positive proofs of a secular decrease of internal heat accompanied by contraction on the contrary laplace has shown by reference to astronomical observations made in the time of hipparchus that in the last two thousand years at least there has been no sensible contraction of the globe by cooling for had this been the case even to an extremely small amount the day would have been shortened whereas its length has certainly not diminished during that period by one three hundredth of a second baron fourier after making a curious series of experiments on the cooling of incandescent bodies considers it to be proved mathematically that the actual distribution of heat in the earth's envelope is precisely that which would have taken place if the globe had been formed in a medium of a very high temperature and had afterwards been constantly cooled he contends that although no contraction can be demonstrated to have taken place within the historical period the operation being slow and the time of observation limited yet it is no less certain that heat is annually passing out by radiation from the interior of the globe into the planetary spaces he even undertook to demonstrate that the quantity of heat thus transmitted into space in the course of every century through every square meter of the earth's surface would suffice to melt a column of ice having a square meter for its base and being three meters or nine feet ten inches high it is at the same time denied that there is any assignable mode in which the heat thus lost by radiation can be again restored to the earth and consequently the interior of our planet must from the moment of its creation have been subject to refrigeration and is destined together with the sun and stars forever to grow colder but i shall point out in the sequel chapter thirty one many objections to these views and to the theory of the intense heat of the earth's central nucleus and shall then inquire how far the observed augmentation of temperature as we descend below the surface may be referable to other causes unconnected with the supposed pristine fluidity of the entire globe end of chapter eight part two Chapter 9, Part 1 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Chapter 9, Part 1 Theory of the Progressive Development of Organic Life at Successive Geological Periods Theory of the Progressive Development of Organic Life Evidence in its support inconclusive Vertebrated animals and plants of the most perfect organization in strata of very high antiquity Differences between the organic remains of successive formations Comparative modern origin of the human race The popular doctrine of successive development not established by the admission that man is of modern origin Introduction of man to what extent a change in the system Progressive development of organic life. In the preceding chapters, I have considered whether revolutions in the general climate of the globe afford any just ground of opposition to the doctrine that the former changes of the earth, which are treated of in geology, belong to one uninterrupted series of physical events governed by ordinary causes. Against this doctrine, some popular arguments have been derived from the great vicissitudes of the organic creation in times past. I shall therefore proceed to the discussion of such objections, which have been thus formally advanced by the late Sir Humphrey David. It is impossible, he affirms, to defend the position that the present order of things is the ancient and constant order of nature, only modified by existing laws. In those strata which are deepest and which must consequently be supposed to be the earliest deposited, forms even of vegetable life are rare. Shells and vegetable remains are found in the next order. The bones of fishes and oviparous reptiles exist in the following class. The remains of birds with those of the same genera mentioned before in the next order. Those of quadrupeds of extinct species in a still more recent class. And it is only in the loose and slightly consolidated strata of gravel and sand and which are usually called diluvian formations, that the remains of animals such as now people the globe are found with others belonging to extinct species. But in none of those formations, whether called secondary, tertiary or diluvian, have the remains of man or any of his works been discovered. And whoever dwells upon this subject must be convinced that the present order of things and the comparatively recent existence of man as the master of the globe is as certain as the destruction of a former and a different order and the extinction of a number of living forms which have no types in being. In the oldest secondary strata there are no remains of such animals as now belong to the surface, and in the rocks which may be regarded as more recently deposited, those remains occur but rarely and with abundance of extinct species. There seems as it were a gradual approach to the present system of things and the succession of destructions and creations preparatory to the existence of man. In the above passage, the author deduces two important conclusions from geological data. First, that in the successive groups of strata, from the oldest to the most recent, there is a progressive development of organic life from the simplest to the most complicated forms. Secondly, that man is of comparatively recent origin and those conclusions he regards as inconsistent with the doctrine that the present order of things is the ancient and constant order of nature only modified by existent laws. With respect then to the first of those propositions, we may ask whether the theory of the progressive development of animal and vegetable life and their successive advancement from a simple to a more perfect state has any secure foundation in fact. 
No geologists who are in possession of all the data now established respecting fossil remains will for a moment contend for the doctrine in all its detail as laid down by the distinguished philosopher to whose opinions we have referred. But naturalists who are not unacquainted with recent discoveries continue to defend it in a modified form. They say that in the first period of the world, by which they mean the earliest of which we have yet brought to light any memorials, the vegetation was characterized by a predominance of cryptogamic plants, while the animals which coexisted were almost entirely confined to zoophytes, testacea and a few fish. Plants of a less simple structure, conifery and cycadi, flourished largely in the next epoch, when oviparous reptiles began also to abound. Lastly, the terrestrial flora became most diversified and most perfect when the highest orders of animals, the mammalia and birds, were called into existence. Now, in the first place, it may be observed that many naturalists are guilty of no small inconsistency in endeavoring to connect the phenomena of the earliest vegetation with the nascent condition of organic life and at the same time to deduce from the numerical predominance of certain forms the greater heat of uniformity of the ancient climate. The arguments in favor of the later conclusions are without any force unless we can assume that the rules followed by author of nature in the creation and distribution of organic beings were the same formally as now and that as certain families of animals and plants are now most abundant in or exclusively confined to regions where there is a certain temperature, a certain degree of humidity, a certain intensity of life and other conditions. So also analogous phenomena were exhibited at every former era. If the postulate be denied and the prevalence of particular families be declared to depend on a certain order of precedence in the introduction of different classes into the earth, and if it be maintained that the standard of organization was raised successively, we must then ascribe the numerical preponderance in the earlier ages of plants or simpler structure not to the heat or other climatal conditions, but to those different laws which regulate organic life in newly created worlds. Before we can infer a warm and uniform temperature in high latitudes from the presence of 250 species of ferns, some of them arborescent accompanied by Lycopodiaceae of large size and Arachuri, we must be permitted to assume that at all times, past, present and future, a heated and moist atmosphere pervading the northern hemisphere has a tendency to produce in the vegetation a predominance of analogous forms. It should moreover be borne in mind, when we are considering the question of development from a botanical point of view, the naturalists are by no means agreed as to the existence of ascending scale of organization in the vegetable world corresponding to that which is very generally recognized in animals. From the sponge to man, in the language of Du Blanvil, there may be a progressive chain of being although often broken and imperfect. But if we seek to classify plants according to a linear arrangement, ascending gradually from the lichen to the lily or the rose, we encounter incomparably greater difficulties. Yet the doctrine of a more highly developed organization in the plants created at successive periods presupposes the admission of such a graduated scale. We have as yet obtained but scant information respecting the state of terrestrial flora at periods antecedent to the coal. In the Carboniferous epoch about 500 species of fossil plants are enumerated by Adolf Brongniart, which we may safely regard as mere fragment of an ancient flora. Since in Europe alone there are now no less than 11,000 living species. 
I have already hinted that the plants which produced coal were not drifted from a distance, but that nearly all of them grew on the spots where they became fossil. They appear to have belonged, as before explained, page 150, to a peculiar class of stations, to low-level and swampy regions in the deltas of large rivers, slightly elevated above the level of the sea. From the study, therefore, of such vegetation we can derive but little insight into the nature of the contemporaneous upland flora, still less of the plants of the mountainous or alpine country. And if so, we are unable to account for the apparent monotony of the vegetation, although its uniform character was doubtless in part owing to a greater uniformity of climate than prevailing throughout the globe. Some of the commonest trees of this period, such as the sigillaria, which united the structure of ferns and of cycadi, departed very widely from all known living types. The coniferae and ferns, on the contrary, were very closely allied to living genera. It is remarkable that none of the exogens of Lindley, dicotyledons angiosperms of Brongniart, which comprise the four-fifths of the living flora of the globe and include all the forest trees of Europe except the fir tribe, have yet been discovered in the coal measures, and a very small number, 15 species only, of monocotyledons. If several of those last are true plants, an opinion to which Messrs. Lindley, Anger, Corda and other botanists of not incline, the question whether any of the most highly organized plants are to be met with an ancient strata is at once answered in an affirmative. But the determination of those palms being doubtful, we have as yet in the coal no positive proofs either of the existence of the most perfect or of the most simple forms of flowering or flowerless vegetation. We have no fungi, lichens, hepatici or mosses, yet this later class may have been as fully represented then as now. In the flora of the secondary eras, all botanists agree that palms existed, although in Europe plants of the family of Zemia and Cycas together with coniferae predominated, and must have given a peculiar aspect to the flora. As only 200 or 300 species of plants are known in all the rocks ranging from the Trias to the Oolite inclusive, our data are too scanty as yet to affirm whether the vegetation of this second epoch was or was not on the whole of a simpler organization than that of our own times. In the lower Cretaceous formation near aix la chapelle the leaves of a great many dicotyledonous trees have lately been discovered by Dr. Dubuet, establishing the important fact of coexistence of a large number of angiosperms with cycadi, and with that rich reptilian fauna comprising the ichthyosaur, lysiosaur and pterodactyl which some had supposed to indicate a state of atmosphere unfavorable to dicotyledonous vegetation. The number of plants hitherto obtained from tertiary strata of different ages is very limited, but is rapidly increasing. They are referable to a much greater variety of families and classes than an equal number of fossil species taken from secondary or primary rocks, the angiosperms bearing the same proportion to the gymnosperms and acrogens as in the present flora of the globe. This greater variety may doubt plus be partly ascribed to the greater diversity of stations in which the plants grew, as we have in this case an opportunity rarely enjoyed in studying the secondary fossils of investigating inland or lacustrine deposits accumulated at different heights above the sea, and containing the memorials of plants washed down from adjoining mountains.
In regard then to the strata from Cretaceous to the uppermost tertiary inclusive, we may affirm that we find in them all the principal classes of living plants and during this vast lapse of time four or five complete changes in the vegetation occurred. Yet no step whatever was made in advance to any of those periods by the addition of more highly organized species. If we next turn to the fossils of the animal kingdom, we may inquire whether when they are arranged by the geologists in a chronological series, they imply that beings of more highly developed structure and greater intelligence enter upon the earth at successive epochs, those of the simplest organization being the first created and those more highly organized being the last. Our knowledge of the Silurian fauna is at present derived entirely from rocks of marine origin, no fresh water strata of such high antiquity having yet been met with. The fossils, however, of those ancient rocks at once reduce the theory of progressive development to within very narrow limits, for already they comprise a very full representation of the radiata, mollusca and articulata proper to the sea. Thus, in the great division of radiata, we find asteroid and helianzoid zoophytes besides crinoid and cystidian echinoderms. In the mollusca, between 200 and 300 species of cephalopoda are enumerated. In the articulata, we have the crustaceans represented by more than 200 species of trilobites besides other genera of the same class. The remains of fish are as yet confined to the upper part of the Silurian series, but some of those belong to placoid fish, which occupy a high grade in the scale of organization. Some naturalists have assumed that the earliest fauna was exclusively marine, because we have not yet found a single Silurian helix insect, bird, terrestrial reptile or mummifier. But when we carry back our investigation to a period so remote from the present, we ought not to be surprised if the only accessible strata should be limited to deposits formed far from land, because the ocean probably occupied then as now the greater part of of the Earth's surface. After so many entire geographical revolutions, the chances are nearly 3 to 1 in favor of our finding that such small portions of the existing continents and islands as exposed Silurian strata to view should coincide in position with the ancient ocean rather than the land. We must not therefore too hastily infer from the absence of fossil bones of mammalia in the older rocks that the highest class of vertebrated animals did not exist in remoter ages. There are regions at present in the Indian and Pacific Oceans coextensive in area with the continents of Europe and North America, where we might dredge the bottom and draw up thousands of shells and corals without obtaining one bone of a land quadruped. Suppose our mariners were to report the that on sounding in the Indian Ocean, near some coral reefs and at some distance from the land, they drew up on hooks attached to their line portions of leopard, elephant or taper, should we not be skeptical as to the accuracy of their statements? And if we had not doubt of their veracity, might we not suspect them to be unskillful naturalists? Or if the fact were unquestioned, should we not be disposed to believe that some vessel had been wrecked on the spot. The casualties must always be rare by which land quadrupeds are swept by rivers far out into the open sea, and still rarer the contingency of such a floating body not being devoured by sharks or other predaceous fish, such as were those of which we find the teeth preserved in some of the carboniferous strata. But if the carcass should escape and should happen to sink where sediment was in the act of accumulating, and if the numerous causes of subsequent disintegration should not efface all the traces of the body included for countless ages in solid rock, is it not contrary to all calculation of chances that we should not hit upon the exact spot, that 
mere point in the bed of an ancient ocean where the precious relic was entombed. Can we expect for a moment when we have only succeeded amidst several thousand fragments of corals and shells in finding a few bones of aquatic or amphibious animals that we should meet with a single skeleton of an inhabitant of the land? Clarence in his dream saw in the slimy bottom of the deep a thousand fearful wrecks, a thousand men that fishes gnawed upon, wedges of gold, great anchors, heaps of pearl. Had he also beheld amid the dead bones that lay scattered by the carcasses of lions, deer and the other wild tenants of the forest and the plain, the fiction would have been deemed unworthy of the genius of Shakespeare. So daring disregard of probability and violation of analogy would have been condemned as unpardonable, even where the poet was painting those incongruous images which present themselves to a disturbed imagination during the visions of the night. Until lately it was supposed that the old red sandstone or Devonian rocks contained no vertebrate remains except those of fish, but in 1950 the footprints of a Chelonian and in 1951 the skeleton of reptile allied both to the Batrachians and lizards were found in the sandstone of that age near Elgin in Scotland. Up to the year 1844 it was laid down as a received dogma in many works of high authority in geology that reptiles were not created until after the close of the Carboniferous Epoch. In the course of the year, however, Hermann von Mayer announced the discovery in the coal measures of Rhenish Bavaria of a reptile called by him Apation related to the salamanders. And in the 1847 three species of Another genus called Archeosaurus by Goldfuss were obtained from the coal of Salzburg between Treves and Strasbourg. The footprints of a large quadruped, probably Batrachian, had also been observed by Dr. King in the Carboniferous rocks of Pennsylvania in 1844. The first example of the bones of a reptile in the coal of North America was detected so lately as September 1852 by Mr. G. W. Dawson and myself in Nova Scotia. Those remains referred by Messrs. Weyman and Owen to a perennibranchiate Batrachian were met with in the interior of an erect fossil tree, apparently a sagillaria. They seem clearly to have been introduced together with the sediment into the tree during its submergence and after it had decayed and was standing as a hollow cylinder of a bark, this bark being now converted into coal. When Agassiz in his great work on fossil fish described 152 species of ichthyolites from the coal, he found them to consist of 94 placoids belonging to the families of shark and ray and 58 ganoids. One family of the later he called suroid fish, including the megalithis and holopticus often of great size and all predaceous. Although true fish and not intermediate between that class and reptiles, they seem to have been more highly organized than any living fish, reminding us of the skeletons of saurians by the close suture of their cranial bones, their large conical teeth striated longitudinally and the articulation of the spinous processes with the vertebra. Among living species they are most nearly allied to the lepidosteus or bony pike of the North American rivers. Before the recent progress of discovery above alluded to had shown the fallacy of such ideas, it was imagined by some geologists that this ichthyotic type was the more highly developed because it took the lead at the head of nature before the class of reptiles had been created. The confident assumption indulged in till the year 1844 that reptiles were first introduced into the earth in the Permian period shows the danger of taking for granted that the date of the creation of any family of animals or plants in past time coincides with the age of the oldest stratified rock in which the geology 
biologist has detected its remains. Nevertheless, after repeated disappointments, we find some naturalists as much disposed as ever to rely on such negative evidence, and to feel now as sure that reptiles were not introduced into the earth till after the Silurian epoch as they were in 1844, that they appeared for the first time at an era subsequent to the Carboniferous. Scanty as is the information hitherto obtained in regard to the articulator of the coal formation, we have at least ascertained that some insects winked their way through the ancient forests. In the iron stone of Colbrook Dale, two species of Coleoptera of the Linian genus Curculio have been met with, and a Neuropterus insect resembling a Corydalis together with another of the same order related to Pasmida. As an example of Insectivorous Arachnida, I may mention a scorpion of the Bohemian Coal, figured by Count Sternberg, in which even the eyes, skin and minute hairs were preserved. We need not despair, therefore, of obtaining eventually fossil representatives of all the principal orders of hexapods and arachnida in Carboniferous strata. End of chapter 9, part 1All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Chapter 9, Part 2 Next in chronological order above the coal comes the allied magnesian limestone or Permian group and the second reformations from the Trias to the Chalk inclusive. Those rocks comprise the monuments of a long series of ages in which reptiles of every variety of size, form and structure peopled the earth, so that the whole period and especially that of the Lias and Oolite has been sometimes called the age of reptiles. As there are now mammalia entirely confined to the land, others which like the bat and vampire fly in the air, others again of amphibious habits frequenting rivers like the hippopotamus, otter and beaver, others exclusively aquatic and marine like the seal, whale or narwhal. So in the early ages under consideration there were terrestrial wing and aquatic reptiles. There were iguanodons walking on the land, pterodactyls winging their way through the air, monitors and crocodiles in the rivers, and ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs in the ocean. It appears also that some of those ancient saurians approximated more nearly in their organization to the type of living mammalia than do any of the reptiles now existing. In the vast range of strata above alluded to, comprising the Permian, the Upper New Red Sandstone and Muschelkalk, the Lias, Oolite, Wilden, Greensand and Chalk, scarcely any well-authenticated instances of the occurrence of fossil birds in Europe are on record, and only two or three of fossil mammalia. In regard to the absence of birds, they are usually wanting for reasons afterwards to be explained, see chapter 47, in the deposits of all ages, even in the tertiary periods where we know that birds as well as land quadrupeds abounded. Some at least of the fossil remains formerly referred to this class in the Wilden, a great freshwater deposits below the chalk, have been recently shown by Mr. Owen to belong to pterodactyls. But in North America still more ancient indications of existence of the Fizzer tribe have been detected. The fossil foot marks of a great variety of species of various sizes, some larger than the ostrich, others smaller than the plower haven't been observed. Those bipeds have left marks of their footsteps on strata of an age decidedly intermediate between the lias and the coal. Figure 8 shows Silocosirium priosti, Valencianus amphicirium owen, lower jaw from the slate of Stonesfield near Oxford. 
The examples of mammalia above alluded to are confined to the trias and the oolite. In the former, the evidence is as yet limited to two small molar teeth, described by Professor Plininger in 1847 under the generic name of Microlestis. They were found near Stuttgart and possess the double fangs so characteristic of mammalia. The other fossil remains of the same class were derived from one of the inferior members of the oolitic series in Oxfordshire and afford more and full satisfactory evidence consisting of the lower jaws of three species of small quadrupeds about the size of a mole. Cuvier, when he saw one of them during the visit to Oxford in 1818, referred it to the marsupial order, stating, however, that it differed from all known carnivora in having ten molar teeth in a row. Professor Owen afterwards pointed out that the jaw belonged to an extinct genus, having considerable affinity to a newly discovered Australian mammifier, the Myrmecobius of Waterhouse, which has nine molar teeth in the lower jaw. Figure 9. Figure 9 shows Myrmecobius fasciatus Waterhouse recent from Swan River, lower jaw of the natural size. A more perfect specimen enabled Mr. Owen in 84 to prove that the inflection of the angular process of the lower jaw was not sufficiently marked to entitle the osteologist to infer that this quadruped was marsupial, as the process is not bent inward in a greater degree than in the mole or hedgehog. Hence, the genus Amphicerium, of which there are two species from Stonesfield, must be referred to to the ordinary or placental type of insectivorous mammals, although it approximates in some points of structure of the Myrmecobius and allied marsupials of Australia. The other contemporary genus called Pascolocerium agrees much more nearly in osteological character and precisely in the number of the teeth with the opossums and is believed to have been truly marsupial. Figure 10. Figure 10 signed natural size shows Fascolocerium buclandi Owen Sin Didelphi Buclandi brought lower jaw from Stonesfield. First the jaw magnified twice in length, second, the second molar tooth magnified six times. The occurrence of those most ancient memorials of the mammiferous type in so low a member of the oolitic series, while no other representatives of the same class, if we accept the microlestis, have yet been found in any other of the inferior or superior secondary strata, is a striking fact and should serve as a warning to us against hasty generalizations founded solely on negative evidence. So important an exception to a general rule may be perfectly consistent with the conclusion that a small number of only a mammalia inhabited European latitudes when our secondary rocks were formed. But it seems fatal to the theory of progressive development or to the notion that the order of precedence in the creation of animals considered chronologically has precisely coincided with the order in which they would be ranked according to perfection or complexity of structure. It was for many years suggested that the marsupial order to which the fossil animals of Stonesfield were supposed exclusively to belong constitutes the lowest grade in the class Mammalia, and that this order of which the brain is of more simple form evinces an inferior degree of intelligence. If, therefore, in the Oolitic period the marsupial tribes were the only warm-blooded quadrupeds which had as yet appeared upon our planet, the fact it was said confirmed the theory which teaches that the creation of the more simple forms in each division of the animal kingdom preceded that of the more complex. But on how slender a support, even if the facts had continued to hold true, did such important conclusions hang, and Australian continent so far as it has been hitherto explored, contains no indigenous quadrupeds save those of the marsupial order, with the exception.
exception of a few small rodents, while some neighboring islands to the north and even southern Africa in the same latitude as Australia abound in mammalia of every tribe except the marsupial. We are entirely unable to explain on what physiological or other laws this singular diversity in the habitations of living mammalia depends, but nothing is more clear than that the causes which stamp so peculiar a character on two different provinces of wide extent are wholly independent of time or the age or maturity of the planet. The strata of the Wilden, although of a later date than the Oolite or Stonesfield, and although filled with the remains of large reptiles, both terrestrial and aquatic, have not yielded as yet a single marsupial bone. Were we to assume on such scanty data that no warm-blooded quadrupeds were then to be found throughout the northern hemisphere, there would still remain a curious subject of of speculation, whether the entire suppression of one important class of vertebra, such as the mammiferous and the great development of another, such as the reptilian, implies a departure from fixed and uniform rules governing the fluctuation of the animal world. Such rules, for example, as appear for one century to another to determine the growth of certain tribes of plants and animals in Arctic and of other tribes in tropical regions. In Australia, New Zealand and many other parts of the Southern Hemisphere, where the indigenous land quadrupeds are comparatively few and of small dimensions, the reptiles do not predominate in number or size. The deposits formed at the mouth of an Australian river within the tropics might contain the bones of only a few small marsupial animals, which, like those of Stonesfield, might thereafter be discovered with difficulty by geologists. But there would at the same time be no megalosauri and other fossil remains showing that large Surians were plentiful on the land and in the waters at a time when mammalia were scarce. This example therefore would afford a very imperfect parallel to the state of the animal kingdom supposed to have prevailed during the secondary periods when a high temperature pervaded European latitudes. It may nevertheless be advantageous to point to some existing anomalies in the geographical development of distinct classes of vertebra which may be comparable to former conditions of the animal creation brought to light by geology. Thus, in the Arctic regions at present reptiles are small and sometimes wholly wanting, where birds, large land quadrupeds and cetacea abound. We meet with birds, wolves, foxes, musk oxen and deer, walruses, seals, whales and narwhals in regions of ice and snow, where the smallest snakes, efts and frogs are rarely if ever seen. A still more anomalous state of things presents itself in the southern hemisphere, even in the temperate zone between the latitudes 52 and 56 degrees south, as for example in Tierra del Fiego, as well as in the woody regions immediately north of the Straits of Magellan and in the Falkland Islands, no reptiles of any kind are met with, not even a snake, lizard or frog. But in those same countries we find the guanaco, a kind of llama, a deer, the puma, a large species of fox, many small rodentia besides the seal and otter, together with porpoise, whale and other cetacea. On what grand laws in the animal physiology those remarkable phenomena depend cannot in the present state of science be conjectured. Not could we predict whether any opposite condition of the atmosphere in respect to heat, moisture and other circumstances would bring about a state of animal life which might be called the converse 
of the above described, namely a state in which reptiles of every size and order might abound and mammalia disappear. The nearest approximation to such a fauna is found in the Galapagos archipelago. Those islands situated under the equator and nearly 600 miles west of the coast of Peru have been called the land of reptiles. So great is the number of snakes, large tortoises and lizards which they support. Among the lizards, the first living species proper to the ocean has been discovered. Yet, although some of those islands are from 3 to 4 thousand feet high and one of them 75 miles long, they contain, with the exception of small mouse, no indigenous mammifer. Even here, however, it is true that in the neighboring sea there are seals and several kinds of cetacea. It may be unreasonable to look for a near analogy between the fauna now existing in any part of the globe and that which we can show to have prevailed when our secondary strata were deposited, because we must always recollect that a climate like that now experienced at the equator, coexisting with the unequal days and nights of European latitudes, was a state of things to which there is now no counterpart on the globe. Consequently, the type of animal and vegetable existence required for such a climate might be expected to deviate almost as widely from that now established as do the flora and fauna of our tropical differ from those of our arctic regions in the tertiary strata. The tertiary formations were deposited when the physical geography of the northern hemisphere had been entirely altered. Large inland lakes had become numerous as in central France and other countries. There were gulfs of the sea into which considerable rivers emptied themselves and where strata like those of the Paris Basin were accumulated. There were also formations in progress in shallow seas not far from shore such as are indicated by portions of the Fallons on the Lawyer and the English Crag. The proximity the four of large tracts of dry land to the sea and lakes then existing may in great measure explain why the remains of land animals so rare in the older strata are not uncommon in those more modern deposits. Yet even those have sometimes proved entirely destitute of mammiferous relics for years after they had become celebrated for the abundance of their fossil testacea fish and reptiles. Thus, the Calque Glossier, a marine limestone of the district round Paris, had afforded to collectors more than 1100 species of shells, besides many zoophytes, echinodermata and the teeth of fish before the bones of one or two land quadrupeds were met with in the same rock. The strata called London and plastic clay in England have been studied for more more than half a century and about 400 species of shells, 50 or more of fish, besides several kinds of Chelonian and Saurian reptiles, were known before a single mammifer was detected. At length, in the year 1839, there were found in this formation the remains of a monkey and a possum a bat and a species of the instinct genus Hyrocosirium, allied to the peccary or hawk tribe. If we examine the strata above the London clay in England, we first meet with mammiferous remains in the Isle of Wight, in beds also belonging to the Eocene epoch, such as remains of the Paleocerium, Anoplocerium, and other extinct quadrupeds, agreeing very closely with those first found by Cuvier near Paris in strata of the same age and of similar freshwater origin. In France, we meet with another 
zoofauna, both conchological and mammalian in the Miocene phalons of the lawyer, above which in the ascending series in Great Britain we arrived in the coralline crack of Suffolk, a marine formation which has yielded three or four hundred species of shells very different from the Eocene testacea and of which a large proportion, although a minority of the whole number, are recent besides many corals, echini, foraminifera and fish, but as yet no relic decidedly mammalian except the ear bone or a whale. In the shelly sand, provincially termed red crack in Suffolk, which immediately succeeds the coralline, constituting a newer number of the same tertiary group, about 250 species of shells have been recognized, of which a still larger proportion are recent. They are associated with numerous teeth of fish, but no sign of a warm-blooded quadruped had been detected until 1830 when the teeth of leopard, a bear, a hawk and a species of ruminant were found at Newburn in Suffolk, and since that time several other genera of mammalia have been met with in the same formation or in the red crack. Of a still newer date is the Norwich crack, a fluvial marine deposit of the Pleiocene epoch, containing a mixture of marine, fluvial tile and land shells, of which 90% or more are recent. Those beds since the time of their first investigation have yielded a supply of mammalian bones of the genera mastodon, elephant, rhinoceros, pig, horse, deer, ox and others, the bodies of which may have been washed down into the sea by rivers draining land, of which contiguity is indicated by the occasional presence of terrestrial and freshwater shells. Our acquaintance with the newer Pleiocene mammalia in Europe, South America and Australia is derived chiefly from cavern deposits, a fact which we ought never to forget if we desire to appreciate the superior facilities we enjoy for studying the more modern and compared to the more ancient terrestrial faunas. We know nothing of the fossil bones which must have been enclosed in the stalagmite or caverns in the older Pliocene or in the Miocene or Eocene seen epochs, much less can we derive any information respecting the inhabitants of the land from a similar source when we carry back our inquiries to the Wilden or Carboniferous epochs. We are as well assured that land and rivers then existed as that they exist now, but it is evident that even a slight geographical revolution accompanied by the submergence and denudation of land would reduce to an extreme improbability the chance of our hitting on those minute points of space where caves may once have occurred in limestone rocks. Fossil Quadrumena until within a few years, 1836-1837, not a single bone of any quadruminous animal, such as the orange, ape, baboon and monkey, had been discovered in a fossil state, although so much progress had been made in bringing to light the extinct mammalia of successive tertiary eras, both carnivorous and herbivorous. The total absence of those anthropomorphous tribes among the records of a former world had led some to believe that the type of organization most nearly resembling the human came so late in the order of creation as to be scarcely, if at all, anterior to that of man. That such generalization was premature, I endeavored to point out in the first edition of this work, in which I stated that the bones of quadrupeds hitherto met with in the tertiary deposits were chiefly those which frequent marshes, rivers or the borders of lakes 
as the elephant, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, tapir, hawk, deer and ox, while species which live in trees are extremely rare in a fossil state. I also hinted that we had as yet no data for determining how great a number of one kind we ought to find before we have a right to expect a single individual of the other. Lastly, I observed that the climate of the more modern or post eocene tertiary periods in England was not tropical, and that in regard to the London clay, of which the crocodiles, turtles and fossil fruits implied a climate hot enough for the quadrumena. We had as yet made too little progress in ascertaining what were the Eocene pachydermata of England to entitle us to expect to have discovered any quadrumena of the same date. Since those remarks were first written in 1829, a great number of extinct species have have been added to our collection of tertiary mammalia from Great Britain and other parts of the world. At length, between the years 1836 and 1839, a few remains of quadrumena were found in France and England, India and Brazil. Those of India belonging to more than one extinct species of monkey were first discovered near Sutledge in latitude 30 degree north. In strata, of which the age is not yet determined. The Brazilian fossil brought from the basin of the Rio das Velhas, about latitude 18 degrees south, is referable to a form now peculiar in America, allied to the genus Calistrix, the species being extinct. The skull and other bones met with in the south of France belong to a gibbon or one of the tailless apes which stand next in the scale of organization to the orn. It occurred at Sansan, about 50 miles west of Toulouse, in latitude 43 degrees 40 minutes north, in freshwater strata, probably of the Miocene or Middle Tertiary period. Lastly, the English quadrumena first met with occurred in a more ancient stratum than the rest, and at point more remote from equator. It belongs to the genus Macacus, is an extinct species and was found in Suffolk at latitude 52 degrees in the London clay, the fossil of which such as crocodiles, turtles, shells of the genus Nautilus and many curious fruits had already led geologists to the conclusion that the climate of that era, the Eocene, was warm and nearly tropical. Some years later, in 1846, the jaw of another British species of fossil monkey, Macacus pleocinus, was announced by Mr. Owen as having been met with in the newer Pleocene strata, on the banks of Thames at Grace in Essex, accompanying the remains of hippopotamus elephant and other quadrupeds, and associated with freshwater and land shells, most of which are now inhabitants of the British Isles. When we consider the small area of the Earth's surface hitherto explored geologically and the new discoveries brought to light daily even in the environs of great European capitals, we must feel that it would be rash to assume that the lower Eocene deposits mark the era of of the first creation of quadrumena. It would, however, be still more unphilosophical to infer, as some writers have done, from a single extinct species of this family obtained in latitude far from the tropics, that the Eocene quadrumena did not attain as high a grade of organization as they do in our own times. What would the naturalist know of the apes and orangs, now contemporary with men, if our our investigations were restricted to such northern latitudes as those where alone the geologist has hitherto found all the fossil quadrumena of Europe. End of the chapter 9, part 2. Chapter 9, part 3 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samuel Christian Stanley Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Chapter 9, Part 3 Cetacea The absence of cetacea from rocks older than the Eocene has been frequently adduced as lending countenance to the theory of the very late appearance of the highest class of vertebrata on the earth. Professor Sedgwick possesses in the Cambridge Museum a mass of ankylosed cervical vertebrae of a whale, which he found in drift clay near Ely, and which he has no doubt was washed out of the Kimmeridge clay, an upper member of the oolite. According to Professor Owen, it exhibits well-marked specific characters, distinguishing it from all other known recent or fossil cetacea. Dr. Letty, of Philadelphia, has lately described two species of cetacea of a new genus, which he has called Priscodelphinus from the green sand of New Jersey, which corresponds in age with the English chalk or the Cretaceous strata above the galt. The specimens consist of dorsal and cervical vertebrae, even in the Eocene strata of Europe, the discovery of cetaceans has never kept pace with that of land quadrupeds. The only instance cited in Great Britain is a species of monodon, from the London clay, of doubtful authenticity as to its geological position. On the other hand, the gigantic zeuglodon of North America occurs abundantly in the Middle Eocene strata of Georgia and Alabama, from which as yet no bones of land quadrupeds have been obtained. In the present imperfect state, then, of our information, we can scarcely say more than that the cetacea seem to have been scarce in the secondary and primary periods. It is quite conceivable that when aquatic saurians, some of them carnivorous, like the Ichiosaurus, were swarming in the sea, and when there were large herbivorous reptiles, like the Iguanodon, on the land, the class of reptiles may, to a certain extent, have superseded the cetacea and discharged their functions in the animal economy. That mammalia had been created long before the epoch of the Kimmeridge clay is shown by the microlestes of the trias before alluded to, and by the stones field quadrupeds from the inferior oolite. And we are bound to remember Whenever we infer the poverty of the flora or fauna of any given period of the past, from the small number of fossils occurring in ancient rocks, that it has been evidently no part of the plan of nature to hand down to us a complete or systematic record of the former history of the animate world, we may have failed to discover a single shell, marine or freshwater, or a single coral, or bone in certain sandstones, such as that of the valley of the Connecticut, where the footprints of bipeds and quadrupeds abound. But such failure may have arisen, not because the population of the land or sea was scanty at that era, but because in general the preservation of any relics of the animals or plants of former times is the exception to a general rule. Time so enormous as that contemplated by the geologist, may multiply exceptional cases till they seem to constitute the rule, and so impose on the imagination as to lead us to infer the non-existence of creatures of which no monuments happen to remain. Professor Forbes has remarked that few geologists are aware how large a proportion of all known species of fossils are founded on single specimens while a still greater number are founded on a few individuals discovered in one spot. This holds true not only in regard to animals and plants inhabiting the land, the lake, and the river, but even to a surprising number of the marine mollusca, articulata, and radiata. Our knowledge, therefore, of the living creation of any given period of the past may be said to depend in a great degree on what we commonly call chance, and the casual discovery of some new localities rich in peculiar fossils, 
may modify or entirely overthrow all our previous generalizations. Upon the whole, then, we derive this result from a general review of the fossils of the successive tertiary strata, namely, that since the Eocene period, there have been several great changes in the land quadrupeds inhabiting Europe, probably not less than five complete revolutions, during which there has been no step whatever made in advance, no elevation in the scale of being, so that had man been created at the commencement of the Eocene era, he would not have constituted a greater innovation on the state of the animal creation previously established than now. When we believe him to have begun to exist at the close of the Pliocene, the views, therefore, which I proposed in the first edition of this work, January 1830, in opposition to the theory of progressive development, do not seem to me to require material modification, notwithstanding the large additions since made to our knowledge of fossil remains. These views may be thus briefly stated. From the earliest period at which plants and animals can be proved to have existed, there have been a continual change going on in the position of land and sea, accompanied by great fluctuations of climate. To these ever-varying geographical and climatal conditions, the state of the animate world has been unceasingly adapted. No satisfactory proof has yet been discovered of the gradual passage of the earth from a chaotic to a more habitable state, nor of any law of progressive development governing the extinction and renovation of species, and causing the fauna and flora to pass from an embryonic to a more perfect condition, from a single to a more complex organization. The principle of adaptation to which I have alluded appears to have been analogous to that which now peoples the Arctic, temperate, and tropical regions contemporaneously with distinct assemblages of species and genera, or which, independently of mere temperature, gives rise to a predominance of the marsupial or didelphous tribe of quadrupeds in Australia, of the placental or monodelphous tribe in Asia and Europe or which causes a profusion of reptiles without mammalia in the Galapagos archipelago, and of mammalia without reptiles in Greenland. Recent Origin of Man If, then, the popular theory of the successive development of the animal and vegetable world, from the simplest to the most perfect forms, rests on a very insecure foundation, it may be asked, whether the recent origin of man lends any support to the same doctrine, or how far the influence of man may be considered as such a deviation from the analogy of the order of things previously established, as to weaken our confidence in the uniformity of the course of nature. Antecedently to investigation, we might reasonably have anticipated that the vestiges of man would have been traced back at least as far as those modern strata in which all the testacea and a certain number of the mammalia are of existing species. For of all the mammalia, the human species is the most cosmopolite and perhaps more capable than any other of surviving considerable vicissitudes in climate and in the physical geography of the globe. No inhabitant of the land exposes himself to so many dangers on the waters as man, whether in a savage or a civilized state. And there is no animal, therefore, whose skeleton is so liable to become embedded in lacustrine or submarine deposits. Nor can it be said that his remains are more perishable than those of other animals. For in ancient fields of battle, as Cuvier has observed, the bones of men have suffered as little decomposition as those of horses, which were buried in the same grave. But even if the more solid parts of our species had disappeared, the impression of their form would have remained engraven on the rocks, as have the traces of the tenderest leaves of plants, and the soft integuments of many animals, works of art, moreover, composed of the most indestructible materials, would have outlasted almost all the organic contents of sedimentary rocks, edifices, 
and even entire cities have, within the times of history, been buried under volcanic ejections, submerged beneath the sea, or engulfed by earthquakes. And had these catastrophes been repeated throughout an indefinite lapse of ages, the high antiquity of man would have been inscribed in far more legible characters on the framework of the globe than are the forms of the ancient vegetation which once covered the islands of the northern ocean, or of those gigantic reptiles which at still later periods peopled the seas and rivers of the northern hemisphere. Dr. Pritchard has argued that the human race have not always existed on the surface of the earth, because, quote, the strata of which our continents are composed were once a part of the ocean's bed. Mankind had a beginning, since we can look back to the period when the surface on which they lived began to exist. End quote. This proof, however, is insufficient, for many thousands of human beings now dwell in various quarters of the globe where marine species lived within the times of history, and, on the other hand, the sea now prevails permanently over large districts once inhabited by thousands of human beings. Nor can this interchange of sea and land ever cease while the present causes are in existence. Terrestrial species, therefore, might be older than the continents which they inhabit, and aquatic species of higher antiquity than the lakes and seas which they now people. But so far as our interpretation of physical movements has yet gone, we have every reason to infer that the human race is extremely modern, even when compared to the larger number of species now our contemporaries on the earth, and we may, therefore, ask whether his creation can be considered as one step in a supposed progressive system by which the organic world has advanced slowly from a more simple to a more complex and perfect state. If we concede, for a moment, the truth of the proposition, that the sponge, the cephalopod, the fish, the reptile, the bird, and the mammifer have followed each other in regular chronological order, the creation of each class being separated from the other by vast intervals of time, should we be able to recognize, in man's entrance upon the earth, the last term of one, in the same series of progressive developments? In reply to this question, it should first be observed that the superiority of man depends not on those faculties and attributes which he shares in common with the inferior animals, but on his reason, by which he is distinguished from them. When it is said that the human race is of far higher dignity than were any pre-existing beings on the earth, it is the intellectual and moral attributes of our race, rather than the physical which are considered. And it is by no means clear that the organization of man is such as would confer a decided preeminence upon him if, in place of his reasoning powers, he was merely provided with such instincts as are possessed by the lower animals. If this be admitted, it would not follow even if there were sufficient geological evidence in favor of the theory of progressive development, that the creation of man was the last link in the same chain. For the sudden passage from an irrational to a rational animal is a phenomenon of a distinct kind from the passage from the more simple to the more perfect forms of animal organization and instinct. To pretend that such a step, or rather leap, can be part of a regular series of changes in the animal world, is to strain analogy beyond all reasonable bounds. Introduction of Man To What Extent a Change in the System But setting aside the question of progressive development, another, and a far more difficult one, may arise out of the admission that man is comparatively of modern origin. Is not the interference of the human species, it may be asked, such a deviation from the antecedent course of physical events that the knowledge of such a fact tends to destroy all our confidence in the uniformity of the order of nature, both in regard to time past and future? If such an innovation could take place after the earth had been exclusively inhabited for thousands of ages by inferior animals, 
why should not other changes as extraordinary and unprecedented happen from time to time? If one new cause was permitted to supervene, differing in kind and energy from any before in operation, why may not others have come into action at different epochs? Or what security have we that they may not arise hereafter? And if such be the case, how can the experience of one period, even though we are acquainted with all the possible effects of the thin existing causes, be a standard to which we can refer all natural phenomena of other periods? Now these objections would be unanswerable if adduced against one who was contending for the absolute uniformity throughout all time of the succession of sublunary events. If, for example, it was disposed to indulge in the philosophical reveries of some Egyptian and Greek sects, who represented all the changes both of the moral and material world as repeated at distant intervals, so as to follow each other in their former connection of place and time. For they compared the course of events on our globe to astronomical cycles, and not only did they consider all sublunary affairs to be under the influence of the celestial bodies, but they taught that on the earth, as well as in the heavens, the same identical phenomena recurred again and again in a perpetual vicissitude. The same individual men were doomed to be reborn, and to perform the same actions as before. The same arts were to be invented, and the same cities built and destroyed. The Argonautic expedition was destined to sail again with the same heroes, and Achilles with his Myrmidons to renew the combat before the walls of Troy. Alter erit tum Tythis, et altera quae vehat argo dilectos eroas. Erunt etiam altera bela, arque eterum ad trojam magnus mititer Achilles. The geologist, however, may condemn these tenets as absurd, without running into the opposite extreme, and denying that the order of nature has, from the earliest periods, been uniform in the same sense in which we believe it to be uniform at present, and expect it to remain so in future. We have no reason to suppose that when man first became master of a small part of the globe, a greater change took place in its physical condition than is now experienced when districts, never before inhabited, become successfully occupied by new settlers. When a powerful European colony lands on the shores of Australia and introduces at once those arts which it has required many centuries to mature, when it imports a multitude of plants and large animals from the opposite extremity of the earth and begins rapidly to extirpate many of the indigenous species, a mightier revolution is effected in a brief period than the first entrance of a savage horde, or their continued occupation of the country for many centuries can possibly be imagined to have produced. If there be no impropriety in assuming that the system is uniform, when disturbances so unprecedented occur in certain localities, we can with much greater confidence apply the same language to those primeval ages when the aggregate number and power of the human race, or the rate of their advancement in civilization, must be supposed to have been far inferior. In reasoning on the state of the globe immediately before our species was called into existence, we must be guided by the same rules of induction as when we speculate on the state of America in the interval that elapsed between the introduction of man into Asia the supposed cradle of our race, and the arrival of the first adventurers on the shores of the new world. In that interval, we imagine the state of things to have gone on according to the order now observed in regions unoccupied by man. Even now, the waters of lakes, seas, and the great ocean, which teem with life, may be said to have no immediate relation to the human race to be portions of the terrestrial system of which man has never taken, nor ever can take possession, so that the greater part of the inhabited surface of the planet may still remain as insensible to our presence as before any isle or continent was appointed to be our residence.
if the barren soil around Sydney had at once become fertile upon the landing of our first settlers, if, like the happy isles whereof the poets have given such glowing descriptions, those sandy tracts had begun to yield spontaneously an annual supply of grain, we might then, indeed, have fancied alterations still more remarkable in the economy of nature to have attended the first coming of our species into the planet. Or if, when a volcanic island like Ischia was, for the first time, brought under cultivation by the enterprise and industry of a Greek colony, the internal fire had become dormant, and the earthquake had remitted its destructive violence. There would have been some ground for speculating on the debilitation of the subterranean forces when the earth was first placed under the dominion of man. But after a long interval of rest, the volcano bursts forth again with renewed energy, annihilates one half of the inhabitants, and compels the remainder to emigrate. The course of nature remains evidently unchanged, and, in like manner, we may suppose a general condition of the globe immediately before and after the period when our species first began to exist, to have been the same, with the exception only of man's presence. The modifications in the system of which man is the instrument do not, perhaps, constitute so great a deviation from previous analogy as we usually imagine. We often, for example, form an exaggerated estimate of the extent of our power in extirbating some of the inferior animals, and causing others to multiply, a power which is circumscribed within certain limits, and which, in all likelihood, is by no means exclusively exerted by our species. The growth of human population cannot take place without diminishing the numbers, or causing the entire destruction of many animals. The larger beasts of prey, in particular, give way before us. But other quadrupeds of smaller size, and innumerable birds, insects, and plants, which are inimical to our interests, increase in spite of us, some attacking our food, others our raiment and persons, and others interfering with our agricultural and horticultural labors. We behold the rich harvest which we have raised by the sweat of our brow, devoured by myriads of insects, and are often as incapable of arresting their depredations as of staying the shock of an earthquake or the course of a stream of lava. A great philosopher has observed that we can command nature only by obeying her laws, and this principle is true even in regard to the astonishing changes which are superinduced in the qualities of certain animals and plants by domestication and garden culture. I shall point out in the third book that we can only effect such surprising alterations by assisting the development of certain instincts, or by availing ourselves of that mysterious law of their organization by which individual peculiarities are transmissible from one generation to another. It is probable from these and many other considerations that as we enlarge our knowledge of the system, we shall become more and more convinced that the alterations caused by the interference of man deviate far less from the analogy of those affected by other animals than is usually supposed. We are often misled, when we institute such comparisons, by our knowledge of the wide distinction between the instincts of animals and the reasoning power of man and we are apt hastily to infer that the effects of a rational and irrational species, considered merely as physical agents, will differ almost as much as the faculties by which their actions are directed. It is not, however, intended that a real departure from the antecedent course of physical events cannot be traced in the introduction of man if that latitude of action which enables the brutes to accommodate themselves in some measure to accidental circumstances could be imagined to have been at any former period so great, that the operations of instinct were as much diversified as are those of human reason, it might, perhaps, be contended that the agency of man 
did not constitute an anomalous deviation from the previously established order of things. It might have been said that the Earth's becoming at a particular period the residence of human beings was an era in the moral, not in the physical world, that our study and contemplation of the Earth and the laws which govern its animate productions ought no more to be considered in the light of a disturbance or deviation from the system than the discovery of the satellites of Jupiter should be regarded as a physical event affecting those heavenly bodies. Their influence in advancing the progress of science among men and in aiding navigation and commerce was accompanied by no reciprocal action of the human mind upon the economy of nature in those distant planets. And so the earth might be conceived to have become, at a certain period, a place of moral discipline and intellectual improvement to man, without the slightest arrangement of a previously existing order of change in its animate and inanimate productions. The distinctness, however, of the human from all other species, considered merely as an efficient cause in the physical world, is real. For we stand in a relation to contemporary species of animals and plants widely different from that which other irrational animals can ever be supposed to have held to each other. We modify their instincts, relative numbers, and geographical distribution in a manner superior in degree and, in some respects, very different in kind from that in which any other species can affect the rest. Besides, the progressive movement of each successive generation of men causes the human species to differ more from itself in power at two distant periods than any one species of the higher order of animals differs from another. The establishment, therefore, by geological evidence, of the first intervention of such a peculiar and unprecedented agency, long after other parts of the animate and inanimate world existed, affords grounds for concluding that the experience during thousands of ages of all the events which may happen on this globe would not enable a philosopher to speculate with confidence concerning future contingencies. If, then, an intelligent being after observing the order of events for an indefinite series of ages, had witnessed at last so wonderful an innovation as this, to what extent would his belief in the regularity of the system be weakened? Would he cease to assume that there was permanency in the laws of nature? Would he no longer be guided in his speculations by the strictest rules of induction? To these questions it may be answered that, had he previously presumed to dogmatize respecting the absolute uniformity of the order of nature, he would undoubtedly be checked by witnessing this new and unexpected event, and would form a more just estimate of the limited range of his own knowledge, and the unbounded extent of the scheme of the universe. But he would soon perceive that no one of the fixed and constant laws of the animate or inanimate world was subverted by human agency, and that the modifications now introduced for the first time were the accompaniments of new and extraordinary circumstances, and those not of a physical but of a moral nature. The deviation permitted would also appear to be as slight as was consistent with the accomplishment of the new moral ends proposed, and to be in a great degree temporary in its nature, so that, Whenever the power of the new agent was withheld, even for a brief period, a relapse would take place to the ancient state of things, the domesticated animal, for example, recovering in a few generations its wild instinct, and the garden flower and fruit tree reverting to the likeness of the parent stock. Now, if it would be reasonable to draw such inferences with respect to the future, we cannot but apply the same rules of induction to the past. We have no right to anticipate any modifications in the results of existing causes in time to come, which are not conformable to analogy, unless they be produced by the progressive development of human power, or perhaps by some other new relations which may hereafter spring up between the moral and material worlds. 
In the same manner, when we speculate on the vicissitudes of the animate and inanimate creation in former ages, we ought not to look for any anomalous results. Unless where man has interfered, or unless clear indications appear of some other moral source of temporary derangement. End of chapter 9, part 3、Chapter、10 of Principles Geology For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyle. Chapter 10 Supposed Intensity of Aqueous Forces at Remote Periods. Intensity of Aqueous Causes. Slow Accumulation of Strata Proved by Fossils. Rate of Denudation. Can only keep pace with deposition. Erratics and effects of ice. Deluges and the causes to which they are referred. Supposed universality of ancient deposits. Intensity of aqueous causes. The great problem considered in the preceding chapters, namely, whether the former changes of the earth made known to us by geology. Resemble in kind and degree those now in daily progress may still be contemplated from several other points of view. We may inquire, for example, whether there are any grounds for the belief entertained by many that the intensity both of aqueous and of igneous forces in remote ages far exceeded that which we witness in our own time. First, then, As to aqueous causes. It has been shown in our history of the science that Woodward did not hesitate in 1695 to teach that the entire mass of fossiliferous strata contained in the earth's crust had been deposited in a few months, and consequently, as their mechanical and derivative origin was already admitted, The reduction of rocky masses into mud, sand, and pebbles, the transportation of the same to a distance, and their accumulation elsewhere in regular strata were all assumed to have taken place with a rapidity unparalleled in modern times. This doctrine was modified by degrees in proportion as different classes of organic remains, such as shells, corals, and fossil plants, had been studied with attention. Analogy led every naturalist to assume that each full grown individual of the animal or vegetable kingdom had required a certain number of months or years for the attainment of maturity. And the perpetuation of its species by generation. And thus the first approach was made to the conception of a common standard of time, without which there are no means whatever of measuring the comparative rate at which any succession of events has taken place at two distinct periods. This standard consisted of the average duration of the lives of individuals. Of the same genera or families in the animal and vegetable kingdoms, and the multitude of fossils dispersed through successive strata implied the continuance of the same species for many generations. At length, the idea that species themselves had had a limited duration arose out of the observed fact. That sets of strata of different ages contain fossils of distinct species. Finally, finally, the opinion became general that in the course of ages one assemblage of animals and plants had disappeared after another again and again, and new tribes had started into life to replace them. Denudation. In addition to the proofs derived from organic remains, the forms of stratification led also, on a fuller investigation, 
to the belief that sedimentary rocks had been slowly deposited but it was still supposed that denudation or the power of running water and the waves and currents of the ocean to strip off superior strata and lay bare the rocks below had formerly operated with an energy wholly unequalled in our times these opinions were both illogical and inconsistent because deposition and denudation are parts of the same process and what is true of the one must be true of the other their speed must be always limited by the same causes and the conveyance of solid matter to a particular region can only keep pace with its removal from another so that the aggregate of sedimentary strata in the earth's crust can never exceed in volume the amount of solid matter which has been ground down and washed away by running water how vast then must be the spaces which this abstraction of matter has left vacant how far exceeding in dimensions all the valleys however numerous and the hollows however vast which we can prove to have been cleared out by aqueous erosion the evidences of the work of denudation are defective because it is the nature of every destroying cause to obliterate the signs of its own agency but the amount of reproduction in the form of sedimentary strata must always afford a true measure of the minimum of denudation which the earth's surface has undergone erratics the next phenomenon to which the advocates of the excessive power of running water in times past have appealed is the enormous size of the blocks called erratic which lie scattered over the northern parts of europe and north america unquestionably a large proportion of these blocks have been transported far from their original position for between them and the parent rocks we now find not unfrequently deep seas and valleys intervening or hills more than a thousand feet high to explain the present situation of such travelled fragments a deluge of mud has been imagined by some to have come from the north bearing along with it sand gravel and stony fragments some of them hundreds of tons in weight this flood in its transient passage over the continents dispersed the boulders irregularly over hill valley and plain or forced them along over a surface of hard rock so as to polish it and leave it indented with parallel scratches and grooves such markings as are still visible in the rocks of scandinavia scotland canada and many other countries there can be no doubt that the myriads of angular and rounded blocks above alluded to cannot have been borne along by ordinary rivers or marine currents so great is their volume and weight and so clear are the signs in many places of time having been occupied in their successive deposition for they are often distributed at various depths through heaps of regularly stratified sand and gravel no waves of the sea raised by earthquakes nor the bursting of lakes dammed up for a time by landslips or by avalanches of snow can account for the observed facts but i shall endeavour to show in the next book chapter fifteen that a combination of existing causes may have conveyed erratics into their present situations the causes which will be referred to are first the carrying power of ice combined with that of running water and second the upward movement of the bed of the sea converting it gradually into land without entering at present into any details respecting these causes i may mention that the transportation of blocks by ice is now simultaneously in progress in the cold and temperate latitudes both of the northern and southern hemisphere as for example on the coasts of canada and gulf of st lawrence and also in chile patagonia and the island of south georgia 
in those regions the uneven bed of the ocean is becoming strewed over with ice-drifted fragments which have either stranded on shoals or been dropped in deep water by melting bergs the entanglement of boulders in drift ice will also be shown to occur annually in north america and these stones when firmly frozen into ice wander year after year from labrador to the st lawrence and reach points of the western hemisphere farther south than any part of great britain the general absence of erratics in the warmer parts of the equatorial regions of asia africa and america confirms the same views as to the polishing and grooving of hard rocks it has lately been ascertained that glaciers give rise to these effects when pushing forward sand pebbles and rocky fragments and causing them to grate along the bottom nor can there be any reasonable doubt that icebergs when they run aground on the floor of the ocean must imprint similar marks upon it it is unnecessary therefore to refer to deluges or even to speculate on the former existence of a climate more severe than that now prevailing in the western hemisphere to explain the geographical distribution of most of the european erratics deluges as deluges have been often alluded to i shall say something of the causes which may be supposed to give rise to these grand movements of water in addition to those already alluded to geologists who believe that mountain chains have been thrown up suddenly at many successive epochs imagine that the waters of the ocean may be raised by these convulsions and then break in terrific waves upon the land sweeping over whole continents hollowing out valleys and transporting sand gravel and erratics to great distances the sudden rise of the alps or andes it is said may have produced a flood even subsequently to the time when the earth became the residence of man but it seems strange that none of the writers who have indulged their imaginations in conjectures of this kind should have ascribed a deluge to the sudden conversion of part of the unfathomable ocean into a shoal rather than to the rise of mountain chains in the latter case the mountains themselves could do no more than displace a certain quantity of atmospheric air whereas the instantaneous formation of the shoal would displace a vast body of water which being heaved up to a great height might roll over and permanently submerge a large portion of a continent if we restrict ourselves to combinations of causes at present known it would seem that the two principal sources of extraordinary inundations are first the escape of the waters of a large lake raised far above the sea and secondly the pouring down of a marine current into lands depressed below the mean level of the ocean as an example of the first of these cases we may take lake superior which is more than four hundred geographical miles in length and about one hundred fifty in breadth having an average depth of from five hundred to nine hundred feet the surface of this vast body of fresh water is no less than six hundred feet above the level of the ocean the lowest part of the barrier which separates the lake on its southwest side from those streams which flow into the headwaters of the mississippi being about six hundred feet high if therefore a series of subsidences should lower any part of this barrier six hundred feet any subsequent rending or depression even of a few yards at a time would allow the sudden escape of vast floods of water into a hydrographical basin of enormous extent if the event happened in the dry season when the ordinary channels of the mississippi and its tributaries are in a great degree empty the inundation might not be considerable but if in the flood season a region capable of supporting 
a population of many millions might be suddenly submerged but even this event would be insufficient to cause a violent rush of water and to produce those effects usually called diluvial for the difference of level of six hundred feet between lake superior and the gulf of mexico when distributed over a distance of eighteen hundred miles would give an average fall of only four inches per mile the second case before adverted to is where there are large tracts of dry land beneath the mean level of the ocean it seems after much controversy to be at length a settled point that the caspian is really eighty-three feet six inches lower than the black sea as the caspian covers an area about equal to that of spain and as its shores are in general low and flat there must be many thousand square miles of country less than eighty-three feet above the level of that inland sea and consequently depressed below the black sea and mediterranean this area includes the site of the populous city of astrakhan and other towns into this region the ocean would pour its waters if the land now intervening between the sea of azov and the caspian should subside yet even if this event should occur it is most probable that the submergence of the whole region would not be accomplished simultaneously but by a series of minor floods the sinking of the barrier being gradual supposed universality of ancient deposits the next fallacy which has helped to perpetuate the doctrine that the operations of water were on a different and grander scale in ancient times is founded on the indefinite areas over which homogeneous deposits were supposed to extend no modern sedimentary strata it is said equally identical in mineral character and fossil contents can be traced continuously from one quarter of the globe to another but the first propagators of these opinions were very slightly acquainted with the inconstancy in mineral composition of the ancient formations and equally so of the wide spaces over which the same kind of sediment is now actually distributed by rivers and currents in the course of centuries the persistency of character in the older series was exaggerated its extreme variability in the newer was assumed without proof in the chapter which treats of river deltas and the dispersion of sediment by currents and in the description of reefs of coral now growing over areas many hundred miles in length i shall have opportunities of convincing the reader of the danger of hasty generalizations on this head in regard to the imagined universality of particular rocks of ancient date it was almost unavoidable that this notion when once embraced should be perpetuated for the same kinds of rocks have occasionally been reproduced at successive epochs and when once the agreement or disagreement in mineral character alone was relied on as the test of age it followed that similar rocks if found even at the antipode were referred to the same era until the contrary could be shown now it is usually impossible to combat such an assumption on geological grounds so long as we are imperfectly acquainted with the order of superposition and the organic remains of these same formations thus for example a group of red marl and red sandstone containing salt and gypsum being interposed in england between the leas and the coal all other red marls and sandstones associated some of them with salt and others with gypsum and occurring not only in different parts of europe but in north america peru india the salt deserts of asia those of africa in a word in every quarter of the globe were referred to one and the same period the burden of proof was not supposed to rest with those who insisted on the identity in age of all these groups their identity in mineral composition was thought sufficient 
it was in vain to urge as an objection the improbability of the hypothesis which implies that all the moving waters on the globe were once simultaneously charged with sediment of a red colour but the rashness of pretending to identify in age all the red sandstones and marls in question has at length been sufficiently exposed by the discovery that even in europe they belong decidedly to many different epochs it is already ascertained that the red sandstone and red marl containing the rock salt of cardona in catalonia is newer than the oolitic if not more modern than the cretaceous period it is also known that certain red marls and variegated sandstones in auvergne which are undistinguishable in mineral composition from the new red sandstone of english geologists belong nevertheless to the eocene period and lastly the gypseous red marl of aix in provence formerly supposed to be a marine secondary group is now acknowledged to be a tertiary freshwater formation in nova scotia one great deposit of red marl sandstone and gypsum precisely resembling in mineral character the new red of england occurs as a member of the carboniferous group and in the united states near the falls of niagara a similar formation constitutes a subdivision of the silurian series nor was the nomenclature commonly adopted in geology without its influence in perpetuating the erroneous doctrine of universal formations such names for example as chalk green sand oolite red marl coal and others were given to some of the principal fossiliferous groups in consequence of mineral peculiarities which happened to characterize them in the countries where they were first studied when geologists had at length shown by means of fossils and the order of superposition that other strata entirely dissimilar in color texture and composition were of contemporaneous date it was thought convenient still to retain the old names that these were often inappropriate was admitted but the student was taught to understand them in no other than a chronological sense so that the chalk might not be a white cretaceous rock but a hard dolomitic limestone as in the alps or a brown sandstone or green marl as in new jersey u s in like manner the green sand it was said might in some places be represented by red sandstone red marl salt and gypsum as in the north of spain so the oolitic texture was declared to be rather an exception than otherwise to the general rule in rocks of the oolitic period and it often became necessary to affirm that no particle of carbonaceous matter could be detected in districts where the true coal series abounded in spite of every precaution the habitual use of this language could scarcely fail to instil into the mind of the pupil an idea that chalk coal salt red marl or the oolitic structure were far more widely characteristic of the rocks of a given age than was really the case there is still another cause of deception disposing us to ascribe a more limited range to the newer sedimentary formations as compared to the older namely the very general concealment of the newer strata beneath the waters of lakes and seas and the wide exposure above waters of the more ancient the chalk for example now seen stretching for thousands of miles over different parts of europe has become visible to us by the effect not of one but of many distinct series of subterranean movements time has been required and a succession of geological periods to raise it above the waves in so many regions and if calcareous rocks of the middle and upper tertiary periods have been formed as homogeneous in mineral composition throughout equally extensive regions it may require convulsions as numerous as all those 
which have occurred since the origin of the chalk to bring them up within the sphere of human observation hence the rocks of more modern periods may appear partial as compared to those of remoter eras not because of any original inferiority in their extent but because there has not been sufficient time since their origin for the development of a great series of elevatory movements in regard however to one of the most important characteristics of sedimentary rocks their organic remains many naturalists of high authority have maintained that the same species of fossils are more uniformly distributed through formations of high antiquity than in those of more modern date and that distinct zoological and botanical provinces as they are called which form so striking a feature in the living creation were not established at remote eras thus the plants of the coal the shells the trilobites of the silurian rocks and the ammonites of the oolite have been supposed to have a wider geographical range than any living species of plants crustaceans or mollusks this opinion seems in certain cases to be well founded especially in relation to the plants of the carboniferous epoch owing probably to the more uniform temperature of the globe at a time when the position of sea and land was less favorable to variations in climate according to principles already explained in the seventh and eighth chapters but a recent comparison of the fossils of north american rocks with those of corresponding ages in the european series has proved that the terrestrial vegetation of the carboniferous epoch is an exception to the general rule and that the fauna and flora of the earth at successive periods from the oldest silurian to the newest tertiary was as diversified as now the shells corals and other classes of organic remains demonstrate the fact that the earth might then have been divided into separate zoological provinces in a manner analogous to that observed in the geographical distribution of species now living end of chapter ten chapter eleven part one of principles of geology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter 11, Part 1. On the Supposed Former Intensity of the Igneous Forces. Volcanic Action at Successive Geological Periods. Plutonic Rocks of Different Ages gradual development of subterranean movements faults doctrine of the sudden upheaval of parallel mountain chains objections to the proof of the suddenness of the upheaval and the contemporaneousness of parallel chains trains of active volcanoes not parallel as large tracts of land are rising or sinking slowly so narrow zones of land may be pushed up gradually to great heights bending of strata by lateral pressure adequacy of the volcanic power to effect this without paroxysmal convulsions when reasoning on the intensity of volcanic action at former periods as well as on the power of moving water already treated of geologists have ever been prone to represent nature as having been prodigal of violence and parsimonious of time now although it is less easy to determine the relative ages of the volcanic than of the fossiliferous formations it is undeniable that igneous rocks have been produced at all geological periods or as often as we find distinct deposits marked by peculiar animal and vegetable remains it can be shown that rocks commonly called trappian have been injected into fissures and ejected at the surface 
both before and during the deposition of the carboniferous series and at the time when the magnesian limestone and when the upper new red sandstone were formed or when the leas oolite green sand chalk and the several tertiary groups newer than the chalk originated in succession nor is this all distinct volcanic products may be referred to the subordinate divisions of each period such as the carboniferous as in the county of fife in scotland where certain masses of contemporaneous trap are associated with the lower others with the upper coal measures and if one of these masses is more minutely examined we find it to consist of the products of a great many successive outbursts by which scoriae and lava were again and again emitted and afterwards consolidated then fissured and finally traversed by melted matter constituting what are called dikes as we enlarge therefore our knowledge of the ancient rocks formed by subterranean heat we find ourselves compelled to regard them as the aggregate effects of innumerable eruptions each of which may have been comparable in violence to those now experienced in volcanic regions it may indeed be said that we have as yet no data for estimating the relative volume of matter simultaneously in a state of fusion at two given periods as if we were to compare the columnar basalt of staffa and its environs with the lava poured out in iceland in seventeen eighty three but for this very reason it would be rash and unphilosophical to assume an excess of ancient as contrasted with modern outpourings of melted matter at particular periods of time it would be still more presumptuous to take for granted that the more deep-seated effects of subterranean heat surpassed at remote eras the corresponding effects of internal heat in our own times certain porphyries and granites and all the rocks commonly called plutonic are now generally supposed to have resulted from the slow cooling of materials fused and solidified under great pressure and we cannot doubt that beneath existing volcanoes there are large spaces filled with melted stone which must for centuries remain in an incandescent state and then cool and become hard and crystalline when the subterranean heat shall be exhausted that lakes of lava are continuous for hundreds of miles beneath the chilean andes seems established by observations made in the year eighteen thirty five now wherever the fluid contents of such reservoirs are poured out successively from craters in the open air or at the bottom of the sea the matter so ejected may afford evidence by its arrangement of having originated at different periods but if the subterranean residue after the withdrawal of the heat be converted into crystalline or plutonic rock the entire mass may seem to have been formed at once however countless the ages required for its fusion and subsequent refrigeration as the idea that all the granite in the earth's crust was produced simultaneously and in a primitive state of the planet has now been universally abandoned so the suggestion above adverted to may put us on our guard against too readily adopting another opinion namely that each large mass of granite was generated in a brief period of time modern writers indeed of authority seem more and more agreed that in the case of granitic rocks the passage from a liquid or pasty to a solid and crystalline state must have been an extremely gradual process the doctrine so much insisted upon formerly that crystalline rocks such as granite gneiss mica schist quartzite and others were produced in the greatest abundance in the earlier ages of the planet and that their formation has ceased altogether in our own times will be controverted in the next chapter 
gradual development of subterranean movements the extreme violence of the subterranean forces in remote ages has been often inferred from the facts that the older rocks are more fractured and dislocated than the newer but what other result could we have anticipated if the quantity of movement had been always equal in equal periods of time time must in that case multiply the derangement of strata in the ratio of their antiquity indeed the numerous exceptions to the above rule which we find in nature present at first sight the only objection to the hypothesis of uniformity for the more ancient formations remain in many places horizontal while in others much newer strata are curved and vertical this apparent anomaly however will be seen in the next chapter to depend on the irregular manner in which the volcanic and subterranean agency affect different parts of the earth in succession being often renewed again and again in certain areas while others remain during the whole time at rest that the more impressive effects of subterranean power such as the upheaval of mountain chains may have been due to multiplied convulsions of moderate intensity rather than to a few paroxysmal explosions will appear the less improbable when the gradual and intermittent development of volcanic eruptions in times past is once established it is now very generally conceded that these eruptions have their source in the same causes as those which give rise to the permanent elevation and sinking of land the admission therefore that one of the two volcanic or subterranean processes has gone on gradually draws with it the conclusion that the effects of the other have been elaborated by successive and gradual efforts faults the same reasoning is applicable to great faults or those striking instances of the upthrow or downthrow of large masses of rock which have been thought by some to imply tremendous catastrophes wholly foreign to the ordinary course of nature thus we have in england faults in which the vertical displacement is between six hundred and three thousand feet and the horizontal extent thirty miles or more the width of the fissures since filled up with rubbish varying from ten to fifty feet but when we inquire into the proofs of the mass having risen or fallen suddenly on the one side of these great rents several hundreds or thousands of feet above or below the rock with which it was once continuous on the other side we find the evidence defective there are grooves it is said and scratches on the rubbed and polished walls which have often one common direction favoring the theory that the movement was accomplished by a single stroke and not by a series of interrupted movements but in fact the strea are not always parallel in such cases but often irregular and sometimes the stones and earth which are in the middle of the fault or fissure have been polished and striated by friction in different directions showing that there have been slidings subsequent to the first introduction of the fragmentary matter nor should we forget that the last movement must always tend to obliterate the signs of previous trituration so that neither its instantaneousness nor the uniformity of its direction can be inferred from the parallelism of the stria that have been last produced when rocks have been once fractured and freedom of motion communicated to detached portions of them these will naturally continue to yield in the same direction if the process of upheaval or of undermining be repeated again and again the incumbent mass will always give way along the lines of least resistance or where it was formerly rent asunder probably the effects of reiterated movement whether upward or downward in a fault may be undistinguishable from those of a single and instantaneous rise or subsidence and the same may be said of the rising or falling of continental masses such as sweden or greenland which we know to take place slowly and insensibly doctrine of the sudden upheaval of parallel mountain chains the doctrine of the suddenness of many former revolutions 
in the physical geography of the globe has been thought by some to derive additional confirmation from a theory respecting the origin of mountain chains advanced in eighteen thirty three by a distinguished geologist m elia de beaumont in several essays on this subject the last published in eighteen fifty two he has attempted to establish two points first that a variety of independent chains of mountains have been thrown up suddenly at particular periods and secondly that the contemporaneous chains thus thrown up preserve a parallelism the one to the other these opinions and others by which they are accompanied are so adverse to the method of interpreting the history of geological changes which i have recommended in this work that i am desirous of explaining the grounds of my descent a course which i feel myself the more called upon to adopt as the generalizations alluded to are those of a skilful writer and an original observer of great talent and experience i shall begin therefore by giving a brief summary of the principal propositions laid down in the works above referred to first m de beaumont supposes that in the history of the earth there have been long periods of comparative repose during which the deposition of sedimentary matter has gone on in regular continuity and there have also been short periods of paroxysmal violence during which that continuity was broken secondly at each of these periods of violence or revolution in the state of the earth's surface a great number of mountain chains have been formed suddenly thirdly the chains thrown up by a particular revolution have one uniform direction being parallel to each other within a few degrees of the compass even when situated in remote regions whilst the chains thrown up at different periods have for the most part different directions fourthly each revolution or great convulsion has fallen in with the date of another geological phenomenon namely the passage from one independent sedimentary formation to another characterized by a considerable difference in organic types fifthly there has been a recurrence of these paroxysmal movements from the remotest geological periods and they may still be reproduced and the repose in which we live may hereafter be broken by the sudden upthrow of another system of parallel chains of mountains sixthly the origin of these chains depends not on partial volcanic action or a reiteration of ordinary earthquakes but on the secular refrigeration of the entire planet for the whole globe with the exception of a thin envelope much thinner in proportion than the shell to an egg is a fused mass kept fluid by heat but constantly cooling and contracting its dimensions the external crust does not gradually collapse and accommodate itself century after century to the shrunken nucleus subsiding as often as there is a slight failure of support but it is sustained throughout whole geological periods so as to become partially separated from the nucleus until at last it gives way suddenly cracking and falling in along determinate lines of fracture during such a crisis the rocks are subjected to great lateral pressure the unyielding ones are crushed and the pliant strata bent and are forced to pack themselves more closely into a smaller space having no longer the same room to spread themselves out horizontally at the same time a large portion of the mass is squeezed upwards because it is in the upward direction only that the excess in size of the envelope as compared to the contracted nucleus can find relief this excess produces one or more of those folds or wrinkles in the earth's crust which we call mountain chains lastly some chains are comparatively modern such as the alps which were partly upheaved after the middle tertiary period the elevation of the andes was much more recent and was accompanied by the simultaneous outburst for the first time of two hundred seventy of the principal volcanoes now active the agitation of the waters of the ocean caused by this convulsion probably occasioned that transient 
and general deluge which is noticed in the traditions of so many nations several of the topics enumerated in the above summary such as the cause of interruptions in the sedimentary series will be discussed in the thirteenth chapter and i shall now confine myself to what i conceive to be the insufficiency of the proofs adduced in favor of the suddenness of the upthrow and the contemporaneousness of the origin of the parallel chains referred to at the same time i may remark that the great body of facts collected together by m de beaumont will always form a most valuable addition to our knowledge tending as they do to confirm the doctrine that different mountain chains have been formed in succession and as werner first pointed out that there are certain determinate lines of direction or strike in the strata of various countries the following may serve as an analysis of the evidence on which the theory above stated depends we observe says m de beaumont when we attentively examine nearly all mountain chains that the most recent rocks extend horizontally up to the foot of such chains as we should expect would be the case if they were deposited in seas or lakes of which these mountains have partly formed the shores whilst the other sedimentary beds tilted up and more or less contorted on the flanks of the mountains rise in certain points even to their highest crests there are therefore in and adjacent to each chain two classes of sedimentary rocks the ancient and inclined beds and the newer or horizontal it is evident that the first appearance of the chain itself was an event intermediate between the period when the beds now upraised were deposited and the period when the strata were produced horizontally at its feet thus the chain a assumed its present position after the deposition of the strata b which have undergone great movements and before the deposition of the group c in which the strata have not suffered derangement if we then discover another chain b in which we find not only the formation b but the group c also disturbed and thrown on its edges we may infer that the latter chain is of subsequent date to a for b must have been elevated after the deposition of c and before that of the group d whereas a had originated before the strata c were formed it is then argued that in order to ascertain whether other mountain ranges are of contemporaneous date with a and b or are referable to distinct periods we have only to inquire whether the inclined and undisturbed sets of strata in each range correspond with or differ from those in the typical chain a and b now all this reasoning is perfectly correct so long as the period of time required for the deposition of the strata b and c is not made identical in duration with the period of time during which the animals and plants found fossil in b and c may have flourished for the latter that is to say the duration of certain groups of species may have greatly exceeded and probably did greatly exceed the former or the time required for the accumulation of certain local deposits such as b and c figures eleven and twelve in order moreover to render the reasoning correct due latitude must be given to the term contemporaneous for this term must be understood to allude not to a moment of time but to the interval whether brief or protracted which elapsed between two events namely between the accumulation of the inclined and that of the horizontal strata but unfortunately no attempt has been made in the treatises under review to avoid this manifest source of confusion and hence the very terms of each proposition are equivocal and the possible length of some of the intervals is so vast that to affirm that all the chains raised in such intervals were contemporaneous is an abuse of language in order to illustrate this argument i shall select the pyrenees as an example originally m e de beaumont spoke of this range of mountains as having been uplifted suddenly 
a un sol jet but he has since conceded that in this chain in spite of the general unity and simplicity of its structure six if not seven systems of dislocation of different dates can be recognized in reference however to the latest and by far the most important of these convulsions the chain is said to have attained its present elevation at a certain epoch in the earth's history namely between the depositation of the chalk or rocks of about that age and that of certain tertiary formations as old as the plastic clay for the chalk is seen in vertical curved and distorted beds on the flanks of the chain as the beds b figure eleven while the tertiary formations rest upon them in horizontal strata at its base as c ibid the proof then of the extreme suddenness of the convulsion is supposed to be the shortness of the time which intervened between the formation of the chalk and the origin of certain tertiary strata even if the interval were deducible within these limits it might comprise an indefinite lapse of time in strictness of reasoning however the author cannot exclude the cretaceous or tertiary periods from the possible duration of the interval during which the elevation may have taken place for in the first place it cannot be assumed that the movement of upheaval took place after the close of the cretaceous period we can merely say that it occurred after the deposition of certain strata of that period secondly although it were true that the event happened before the formation of all the tertiary strata now at the base of the pyrenees it would by no means follow that it preceded the whole tertiary epoch the age of the strata both of the inclined and horizontal series may have been accurately determined by m de beaumont and still the upheaving of the pyrenees may have been going on before the animals of the chalk period such as are found fossil in england had ceased to exist or when the maestricht beds were in progress or during the indefinite ages which may have elapsed between the extinction of the maestricht animals and the introduction of the eocene tribes or during the eocene epoch or the rise may have been going on throughout one or several or all of these periods it would be a purely gratuitous assumption to say that the inclined cretaceous strata b figure eleven on the flanks of the pyrenees were the very last which were deposited during the cretaceous period or that as soon as they were upheaved all or nearly all the species of animals and plants now found fossil in them were suddenly exterminated yet unless this can be affirmed we cannot say that the pyrenees were not upheaved during the cretaceous period consequently another range of mountains at the base of which cretaceous rocks may lie in horizontal stratification may have been elevated like the chain a figure twelve during some part of the same great period End of chapter eleven part one Chapter Eleven, Part Two of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter Eleven, Part Two. There are mountains in Sicily two or three thousand feet high the tops of which are composed of limestone in which a large proportion of the fossil shells agree specifically with those now inhabiting the mediterranean however as in many other countries the deposits now in progress in the sea must enclose shells and other fossils specifically identical with those of the rocks constituting the contiguous land so there are islands in the pacific where a mass of dead coral has emerged to a considerable altitude while other portions of the mass remain beneath the sea still increasing by the growth of living zoophytes and shells the chalk of the pyrenees therefore may at a remote period have been raised to an elevation of several thousand feet while the species found fossil in the same chalk still continued to be represented 
in the fauna of the neighboring ocean in a word we cannot assume that the origin of a new range of mountains caused the cretaceous period to cease and served as the prelude to a new order of things in the animate creation to illustrate the grave objections above advanced against the theory considered in the present chapter let us suppose that in some country three styles of architecture had prevailed in succession each for a period of one thousand years first the greek then the roman and then the gothic and that a tremendous earthquake was known to have occurred in the same district during one of the three periods a convulsion of such violence as to have leveled to the ground all the buildings then standing if an antiquary desirous of discovering the date of the catastrophe should first arrive at a city where several greek temples were lying in ruins and half engulfed in the earth while many gothic edifices were standing uninjured could he determine on these data the era of the shock could he even exclude any one of the three periods and decide that it must have happened during one of the other two certainly not he could merely affirm that it happened at some period after the introduction of the greek style and before the gothic had fallen into disuse should he pretend to define the date of the convulsion with greater precision and decide that the earthquake must have occurred after the greek and before the gothic period that is to say when the roman style was in use the fallacy in his reasoning would be too palpable to escape detection for a moment yet such is the nature of the erroneous induction which i am now exposing for as in the example above proposed the erection of a particular edifice is perfectly distinct from the period of architecture in which it may have been raised so is the deposition of chalk or any other set of strata from the geological epochs characterized by certain fossils to which they may belong it is almost superfluous to enter into any farther analysis of the theory of parallelism because the whole force of the argument depends on the accuracy of the data by which the contemporaneous or non-contemporaneous date of the elevation of two independent chains can be demonstrated in every case this evidence as stated by m de beaumont is equivocal because he has not included in the possible interval of time between the deposition of the deranged and the horizontal formations part of the periods to which each of those classes of formations are referable even if all the geological facts therefore adduced by the author were true and unquestionable yet the conclusion that certain chains were or were not simultaneously upraised is by no means a legitimate consequence in the third volume of my first edition of the principles which appeared in april eighteen thirty three i controverted the views of m de beaumont then just published in the same terms as i have now restated them at that time i took for granted that the chronological date of the newest rocks entering into the disturbed series of the pyrenees had been correctly ascertained it now appears however that some of the most modern of those disturbed strata belong to the pneumolytic formation which are regarded by the majority of geologists as eocene or older tertiary an opinion not assented to by m e de beaumont and which i cannot discuss here without being led into too long a digression perhaps a more striking illustration of the difficulties we encounter when we attempt to apply the theory under consideration even to the best known european countries is afforded by what is called the system of the longmans this small chain situated in shropshire is the third of the typical systems to which m e de beaumont compares other mountain ranges corresponding in strike and structure the date assigned to its upheaval is after the unfossiliferous greywack or cambrian strata and before the silurian but sir r i murchison had shown in eighteen thirty eight in his silurian system and the british government surveyors since that time in their sections about eighteen forty five 
that the longmans and other chains of similar composition in north wales are post silurian in all of them fossiliferous beds of the lower silurian formation or landalo flags are highly inclined and often vertical in one limited region the caradoc sandstone a member of the lower silurian rests unconformably on the denuded edges of the inferior or landalo member of the same group whilst in some cases both of these sets of strata are upturned when therefore so grave an error is detected in regard to the age of a typical chain we are entitled to inquire with surprise by what means nine other parallel chains in france germany and sweden assumed to be anti-silurian have been made to agree precisely in date with the longmans if they are correctly represented as having been all deposited before the deposition of the silurian strata they cannot be contemporaneous with the longmans and they only prove how little reliance can be placed on parallelism as a test of simultaneousness of upheaval but in truth it is impossible for reasons already given to demonstrate that each of those nine chains coincide in date with one another any more than with the longmans the reader will see in the sequel chapter thirty one that mr hopkins has inferred from astronomical calculations that the solid crust of the earth cannot be less than eight hundred or one thousand miles thick and may be more even if it be solid to the depth of one hundred miles such a thickness would be inconsistent with m e de beaumont's hypothesis which requires a shell not more than thirty miles thick or even less mr hopkins admits that the exterior of the planet though solid as a whole may contain within it vast lakes or seas of lava if so the gradual fusion of rocks and the expansive power of heat exerted for ages as well as the subsequent contraction of the same during slow refrigeration may perhaps account for the origin of mountain chains for these as dolomieu has remarked are far less important proportionally speaking than the inequalities on the surface of an eggshell which to the eye appears smooth a centripetal force affecting the whole planet as it cools seems a mightier cause than is required to produce wrinkles of such insignificant size in pursuing his investigations m e de beaumont has of late greatly multiplied the number of successive periods of instantaneous upheaval admitting at the same time that occasionally new lines of upthrow have taken the direction of older ones these admissions render his views much more in harmony with the principles advocated in this work but they impair the practical utility of parallelism considered as a chronological test for no rule is laid down for limiting the interval whether in time or space which may separate two parallel lines of upheaval of different dates among the various propositions above laid down page one sixty four it will be seen that the sudden rise of the andes is spoken of as a modern event but mr darwin has brought together ample data in proof of the local persistency of volcanic action throughout a long succession of geological periods beginning with times antecedent to the deposition of the oolitic and cretaceous formations of chile and continued to the historical epoch it appears that some of the parallel ridges which compose the cordilleras instead of being contemporaneous were successively and slowly upheaved at widely different epochs the whole range after twice subsiding some thousands of feet was brought up again by a slow movement in mass during the era of the eocene tertiary formations after which the whole sank down once more several hundred feet to be again uplifted to its present level by a slow and often interrupted movement in a portion of this latter period the pampian mud was formed in which the megatherium mylodon and other extinct quadrupeds are buried this mud contains in it 
recent species of shells, some of them proper to brackish water, and is believed by Mr. Darwin to be an estuary or delta deposit. M. A. de Orbigny, however, has advanced an hypothesis referred by M. E. de Beaumont that the agitation and displacement of the waters of the ocean caused by the elevation of the Andes gave rise to a deluge of which this Pampian mud, which rises sometimes to the height of 12,000 feet, is the result and monument. In studying many chains of mountains, we find that the strike or line of outcrop of continuous sets of strata and the general direction of the chain may be far from rectilinear. Curves forming angles of 20 degrees or 30 degrees may be found in the same range as in the Alleghenies. Just as trains of active volcanoes and the zones throughout which modern earthquakes occur are often linear, without running in straight lines, nor are all of these, though contemporaneous or belonging to our own epoch, by any means parallel, but some at right angles, the one to the other. Slow Upheaval and Subsidence Recent observations have disclosed to us the wonderful fact that not only the west coast of South America, but also other large areas, some of them several thousand miles in circumference, such as Scandinavia, and certain archipelagos in the Pacific, are slowly and insensibly rising, while other regions, such as Greenland, and parts of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, in which atolls or circular coral islands abound, are as gradually sinking. That all the existing continents and submarine abysses may have originated in movements of this kind, continued throughout incalculable periods of time, is undeniable, and the denudation which the dry land appears everywhere to have suffered favors the idea that it was raised from the deep by a succession of upward movements prolonged throughout indefinite periods, for the action of waves and currents on land slowly emerging from the deep affords the only power by which we can conceive so many deep valleys and wide spaces to have been denuded as those which are unquestionably the effects of running water. But perhaps it may be said that there is no analogy between the slow upheaval of broad plains or tablelands and the manner in which we must presume all mountain chains with their inclined strata to have originated. It seems, however, that the Andes have been rising century after century at the rate of several feet, while the pampas on the east have been raised only a few inches in the same time. Crossing from the Atlantic to the Pacific, in a line passing through Mendoza, Mr. Darwin traversed a plain eight hundred miles broad, the eastern part of which has emerged from beneath the sea at a very modern period. The slope from the Atlantic is at first very gentle, then greater, until the traveler finds, on reaching Mendoza, that he has gained, almost insensibly, a height of four thousand feet. The mountainous district then begins suddenly, and its breadth from Mendoza to the shores of the Pacific is 120 miles, the average height of the principal chain being from 15,000 to 16,000 feet, without including some prominent peaks, which ascend much higher. Now all we require to explain the origin of the principal inequalities of level here described is to imagine, first, a zone of more violent movement to the west of Mendoza, and secondly, to the east of that place, an upheaving force which died away gradually as it approached the Atlantic. In short, we are only called upon to conceive that the region of the Andes was pushed up four feet in the same period in which the Pampas, near Mendoza, rose one foot, and the plains near the shores of the Atlantic one inch. In Europe we have learnt that the land at the North Cape ascends about five feet in a century, while farther to the south the movements diminish in quantity first to a foot, and then at Stockholm to three inches in a century, while at other points still farther south there is no movement. But in what manner, it is asked, can we account for the great lateral pressure which has been exerted not only in the Andes, Alps, and other chains, 
but also on the strata of many low and nearly level countries do not the folding and fracture of the beds the anticlinal and synclinal ridges and troughs as they are called and the vertical and even sometimes the inverted position of the beds imply an abruptness and intensity in the disturbing force wholly different in kind and energy to that which now rends the rocks during ordinary earthquakes i shall treat more fully in the sequel end of chapter thirty two of the probable subterranean sources whether of upward or downward movement and of great lateral pressure but it may be well briefly to state in this place that in our own times as for example in chile in eighteen twenty two the volcanic force has overcome the resistance and permanently uplifted a country of such vast extent that the weight and volume of the andes must be insignificant in comparison even if we indulge the most moderate conjectures as to the thickness of the earth's crust above the volcanic foci to assume that any set of strata with which we are acquainted are made up of such cohesive and unyielding materials as to be able to resist a power of such stupendous energy if its direction instead of being vertical happened to be oblique or horizontal would be extremely rash but if they could yield to a sideway thrust even in a slight degree they would become squeezed and folded to any amount if subjected for a sufficient number of times to the repeated action of the same force we can scarcely doubt that a mass of rock several miles thick was uplifted in chile in eighteen twenty two and eighteen thirty five and that a much greater volume of solid matter is upheaved wherever the rise of the land is very gradual as in scandinavia the development of heat being probably in that region at a greater distance from the surface if continents rocked shaken and fissured like the western region of south america are very gently elevated like norway and sweden do not acquire in a few days or hours an additional height of several thousand feet this can arise from no lack of mechanical force in the subterranean moving cause but simply because the antagonist power or the strength toughness and density of the earth's crust is insufficient to resist so long as to allow the volcanic energy an indefinite time to accumulate instead of the explosive charge augmenting in quantity for countless ages it finds relief continuously or by a succession of shocks of moderate violence so as never to burst or blow up the covering of incumbent rock in one grand paroxysmal convulsion even in its most energetic efforts it displays an intermittent and mitigated intensity being never permitted to lay a whole continent in ruins hence the numerous eruptions of lava from the same vent or chain of vents and the recurrence of similar earthquakes for thousands of years along certain areas or zones of country hence the numerous monuments of the successive ejection and injection of melted matter in ancient geological epochs and the fissures formed in distinct ages and often widened and filled at different eras among the causes of lateral pressure the expansion by heat of large masses of solid stone intervening between others which have a different degree of expansibility or which happen not to have their temperature raised at the same time may play an important part but as we know that rocks have so often sunk down thousands of feet below their original level we can hardly doubt that much of the bending of pliant strata and the packing of the same into smaller spaces has frequently been occasioned by subsidence whether the failure of support be produced by the melting of porous rocks which when fluid and subjected to great pressure may occupy less room than before or which by passing from a pasty to a crystalline condition may as in the case of granite according to the experiments of deville suffer a contraction of ten per cent or whether the sinking be due to the subtraction of lava driven elsewhere to some volcanic orifice 
and there forced outwards or whether it be brought on by the shrinking of solid and stony masses during refrigeration or by the condensation of gases or any other imaginable cause we have no reason to incline to the idea that the consequent geological changes are brought about so suddenly as that large parts of continents are swallowed up at once in unfathomable subterranean abysses if cavities be formed they will be enlarged gradually and as gradually filled we read indeed accounts of engulfed cities and areas of limited extent which have sunk down many yards at once but we have as yet no authentic records of the sudden disappearance of mountains or the submergence or emergence of great islands on the other hand the creeps in coal mines demonstrate that gravitation begins to act as soon as a moderate quantity of material is removed even at a great depth the roof sinks in or the floor of the mine rises and the bent strata often assume as regularly a curved and crumpled arrangement as that observed on a grander scale in mountain chains the absence indeed of chaotic disorder and the regularity of the placations in geological formations of high antiquity although not infrequently adduced to prove the unity and instantaneousness of the disturbing force might with far greater propriety be brought forward as an argument in favor of the successive application of some irresistible but moderated force such as that which can elevate or depress a continent in conclusion i may observe that one of the soundest objections to the theory of the sudden upthrow or downthrow of mountain chains is this that it provides us with too much force of one kind namely that of subterranean movement while it deprives us of another kind of mechanical force namely that exerted by the waves and currents of the ocean which the geologist requires for the denudation of land during its slow upheaval or depression it may be safely affirmed that the quantity of igneous and aqueous action of volcanic eruption and denudation of subterranean movement and sedimentary deposition not only of past ages but of one geological epoch or even the fraction of an epoch has exceeded immeasurably all the fluctuations of the inorganic world which have been witnessed by man but we have still to inquire whether the time to which each chapter or page or paragraph of the earth's autobiography relates was not equally immense when contrasted with a brief era of three thousand or five thousand years the real point on which the whole controversy turns is the relative amount of work done by mechanical force in given quantities of time past and present before we can determine the relative intensity of the force employed we must have some fixed standard by which to measure the time expended in its development at two distinct periods it is not the magnitude of the effects however gigantic their proportions which can inform us in the slightest degree whether the operation was sudden or gradual insensible or paroxysmal it must be shown that a slow process could never in any series of ages give rise to the same results the advocate of paroxysmal energy might assume a uniform and fixed rate of variation in times past and present for the animate world that is to say for the dying out and coming in of species and then endeavor to prove that the changes of the inanimate world have not gone on in a corresponding ratio but the adoption of such a standard of comparison would lead i suspect to a theory by no means favorable to the pristine intensity of natural causes that the present state of the organic world is not stationary can be fairly inferred from the fact that some species are known to have become extinct in the course even of the last three centuries and that the exterminating causes always in activity both on the land and in the waters are very numerous also because man himself is an extremely modern creation and we may therefore reasonably suppose that some of the mammalia now contemporary with man 
as well as a variety of species of inferior classes may have been recently introduced into the earth to supply the places of plants and animals which have from time to time disappeared but granting that some such secular variation in the zoological and botanical worlds is going on and is by no means wholly inappreciable to the naturalist still it is certainly far less manifest than the revolution always in progress in the inorganic world every year some volcanic eruptions take place and a rude estimate might be made of the number of cubic feet of lava and scoria poured out or cast out of various craters the amount of mud and sand deposited in deltas and the advance of new land upon the sea or the annual retreat of wasting sea cliffs are changes the minimum amount of which might be roughly estimated the quantity of land raised above or depressed below the level of the sea might also be computed and the change arising from such movements in a century might be conjectured suppose the average rise of the land in some parts of scandinavia to be as much as five feet in a hundred years the present sea coast might be uplifted seven hundred feet in fourteen thousand years but we should have no reason to anticipate from any zoological data hitherto acquired that the molluscus fauna of the northern seas would in that lapse of years undergo any sensible amount of variation we discover sea beaches in norway seven hundred feet high in which the shells are identical with those now inhabiting the german ocean for the rise of land in scandinavia however insensible to the inhabitants has evidently been rapid when compared to the rate of contemporaneous change in the testaceous fauna of the german ocean were we to wait therefore until the mollusca shall have undergone as much fluctuation as they underwent between the period of the leas and the upper oolite formations or between the oolite and chalk nay even between any two of eight subdivisions of the eocene series what stupendous revolutions in physical geography ought we not to expect and how many mountain chains might not be produced by the repetition of shocks of moderate violence or by movements not even perceptible by man or if we turn from the mollusca to the vegetable kingdom and ask the botanist how many earthquakes and volcanic eruptions might be expected and how much the relative level of land and sea might be altered or how far the principal deltas will encroach upon the ocean or the sea cliffs recede from the present shores before the species of european forest trees will die out he would reply that such alterations in the inanimate world might be multiplied indefinitely before he should have reason to anticipate by reference to any known data that the existing species of trees in our forests would disappear and give place to others in a word the movement of the inorganic world is obvious and palpable and might be likened to the minute hand of a clock the progress of which can be seen and heard whereas the fluctuations of the living creation are nearly invisible and resemble the motion of the hour hand of a timepiece it is only by watching it attentively for some time and comparing its relative position after an interval that we can prove the reality of its motion End of chapter eleven part two chapter twelve of principles of geology this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Chapter 12 Difference in Texture of the Older and Newer Rocks Consolidation of Fossiliferous Strata Some Deposits Originally Solid Transition and Slaty Texture Crystalline character of plutonic and metamorphic rocks. Theory of their origin. Essentially subterranean. No proofs that they were produced more abundantly at remote periods. Another argument in favor 
of the dissimilarity of the causes operating at remote and recent eras has been derived by many geologists from the more compact stony and crystalline texture of the older as compared with the newer rocks consolidation of strata this subject may be considered first in reference to the fossiliferous strata and secondly in reference to those crystalline and stratified rocks which contain no organic remains such as gneiss and mica schist there can be no doubt that the former of these classes or the fossiliferous are generally more compact and stony in proportion as they are more ancient it is also certain that a great part of them were originally in a soft and incoherent state and that they have been since consolidated thus we find occasionally that shingle and sand have been agglutinated firmly together by a ferruginous or siliceous cement or that lime in solution has been introduced so as to bind together materials previously incoherent organic remains have sometimes suffered a singular transformation as for example where shells corals and wood are silicified their calcareous or ligneous matter having been replaced by nearly pure silica the constituents of some beds have probably set and become hard for the first time when they emerged from beneath the water but on the other hand we observe in certain formations now in progress particularly in coral reefs and in deposits from the waters of mineral springs both calcareous and siliceous that the texture of rocks may sometimes be stony from the first this circumstance may account for exceptions to the general rule not unfrequently met with where solid strata are superimposed on others of a plastic and incoherent nature as in the neighborhood of paris where the tertiary formations consisting often of compact limestone and siliceous grit are more stony than the subjacent chalk it will be readily understood that the various solidifying causes including those above enumerated together with the pressure of incumbent rocks and the influence of subterranean heat most all of them require time in order to exert their full power if in the course of ages they modify the aspect and internal structure of stratified deposits they will give rise to a general distinctness of character in the older as contrasted with the newer formations but this distinctness will not be the consequence of any original diversity they will be unlike just as the wood in the older trees of a forest usually differs in texture and hardness from that of younger individuals of the same species transition texture in the original classification of Werner, the highly crystalline rocks such as granite and gneiss which contain no organic remains were called a primary and the fossiliferous strata secondary while to another class of an age intermediate between the primary and the secondary he gave the name of transition they were termed transition because they partook in some degree in their mineral composition of the nature of the most crystalline rocks such as gneiss and mica schist while they resembled the fossiliferous series in containing occasionally organic remains and exhibiting evident signs of a mechanical origin it was at first imagined that the rocks having this intermediate texture had been all deposited subsequently to the series called primary and before all the more earthy and fossiliferous formations but when the relative position and organic remains of these transition rocks were better understood it was perceived that they did not all belong to one period on the contrary the same mineral characters were found in strata of very different ages and some formations occurring in the alps which several of the ablest scholars of werner had determined to be transition were ultimately ascertained by means of their fossil contents and position 
to be members of the Cretaceous and even of the Numulitic or Eocene period. These strata had in fact acquired the transition texture from the influence of causes which since their deposition had modified their internal arrangement. Texture and Origin of Plutonic and Metamorphic Rocks Among the most singular of the changes superinduced on rocks, we have occasionally to include the slaty texture, the divisional planes of which sometimes intersect the true planes of stratification, and even pass directly through embedded fossils. If then the crystalline, the slaty, and other modes of arrangement once deemed characteristic of certain periods in the history of the earth, have in reality been assumed by fossiliferous rocks of different ages and at different times, we are prepared to inquire whether the same may not be true of the most highly crystalline state, such as that of gneiss, mica schist, and statuary marble that the peculiar characteristics of such rocks are really due to a variety of modifying causes, has long been suspected by many geologists, and the doctrine has gained ground of late, although a considerable difference of opinion still prevails. According to the original Neptunian theory, all the crystalline formations were precipitated from a universal menstruum, or chaotic fluid, antecedently to the creation of animals and plants, the unstratified granite having been first thrown down so as to serve as a floor or foundation on which gneiss nice and other stratified rocks might repose. Afterwards, when the igneous origin of granite was no longer disputed, many conceived that a thermal ocean enveloped the globe, at a time when the first formed crust of granite was cooling but when it still retained much of its heat. The hot waters of this ocean held in solution the ingredients of gneiss, mica schist, hornblende schist, clay slate, and marble, rocks which were precipitated, one after the other, in a crystalline form. No fossils could be enclosed in them. The high temperature of the fluid and the quantity of mineral matter which it held in solution, rendering it unfit for the support of organic beings. It would be inconsistent with the plan of this work to enter here into a detailed account of what I have elsewhere termed the metamorphic theory, but I may state that it is now demonstrable in some countries that fossiliferous formations, some of them of the age of the Silurian strata, as near Christiana in Norway, others belonging to the Oolitic period, as around Carrara in Italy, have been converted partially into gneiss, mica schist, and statuary marble. The transmutation has been effected apparently by the influence of subterranean heat, acting under great pressure, or by chemical and electrical causes operating in a manner not yet understood, and which have been termed plutonic action, as expressing, in one word, all the modifying causes which may be brought into play at great depths, and under conditions never exemplified at the surface. To this plutonic action, the fusion of granite itself in the bowels of the earth, as well as the superinducement of the metamorphic texture into sedimentary strata, must be attributed and in accordance with these views, the age of each metamorphic formation may be said to be twofold, for we have first to consider the period when it originated, an aqueous deposit, in the form of mud, sand, marl, or limestone. Secondly, the date at which it acquired a crystalline texture. The same strata, therefore, may, according to this view, be very ancient, in reference to the time of their deposition, and very modern in regard to the period of their assuming the metamorphic character. No proofs that these crystalline rocks were produced more abundantly at remote periods. Several modern writers, 
without denying the truth of the plutonic or metamorphic theory, still contend that the crystalline and non-fossiliferous formations, whether stratified or unstratified, such as gneiss and granite, are essentially ancient as a class of rocks. They were generated, say they, most abundantly in the primeval state of the globe since which time the quantity produced has been always on the decrease, until it became very inconsiderable in the Oolitic and Cretaceous periods, and quite evanescent before the commencement of the tertiary epoch. Now the justness of these views depends almost entirely on the question whether granite, gneiss, and other rocks of the same order ever originated at the surface, or whether according to the opinions above adopted, they are essentially subterranean in their origin, and therefore entitled to the appellation of hypogene. If they were formed superficially in their present state, and as copiously in the modern as in the more ancient periods, we ought to see a greater abundance of tertiary and secondary than of primary granite and gneiss. But if we adopt the hypogene theory before explained, the rapid diminution in volume among the visible rocks in the Earth's crust, in proportion, as we investigate the formations of a newer date, is quite intelligible. If a melted mass of matter be now cooling very slowly, at the depth of several miles beneath the crater of an active volcano, it must remain invisible until great revolutions in the Earth's crust have been brought about. So also, if stratified rocks have been subjected to plutonic action, and after having been baked or reduced to semi-fusion, are now cooling and crystallizing far underground, it will probably require the lapse of many periods before they will be forced up to the surface and exposed to view even at a single point. To effect this purpose, there may be need of as great a development of subterranean movement as that which in the Alps, Andes, and Himalaya has raised marine strata containing ammonites to the height of 8,000, 14,000, and 16,000 feet. By parity of reasoning, we can hardly expect that any hypogene rocks of the tertiary periods will have been brought within the reach of human observation, seeing that the emergence of such rocks must always be so long posterior to the date of their origin, and still less can formations of this class become generally visible until so much time has elapsed as to confer on them a high relative antiquity. Extensive denudation must also combine with upheaval before they can be displayed at the surface throughout wide areas. All geologists who reflect on subterranean movements now going on, and the eruptions of active volcanoes, are convinced that great changes are now continually in progress in the interior of the Earth's crust far out of sight. They must be conscious, therefore, that the inaccessibility of the regions in which these alterations are taking place compels them to remain in ignorance of a great part of the working of existing causes, so that they can only form vague conjectures in regard to the nature of the products, which volcanic heat may elaborate under great pressure. But when they find in mountain chains of high antiquity that what was once the interior of the earth's crust has since been forced outwards and exposed to view, they will naturally expect in the examination of those mountainous regions to have an opportunity of gratifying their curiosity by obtaining a sight not only of the superficial strata of remote eras, but also of the contemporaneous nether-formed rocks. Having recognized, therefore, in such mountain chains some ancient rocks of aqueous and volcanic origin, corresponding in character to superficial formations of modern date, they will regard any other class of ancient rocks, such as granite and gneiss, as the residual phenomena of which they are in search. These latter rocks 
will not answer the expectations previously formed of their probable nature and texture, unless they wear a foreign and mysterious aspect, and have in some places been fused or altered by subterranean heat. In a word, unless they differ wholly from the fossiliferous strata deposited at the surface, or from the lava and scoriae thrown out by volcanoes in the open air. It is the total distinctness, therefore, of crystalline formations, such as granite, hornblende, schist, and the rest, from every substance of which the origin is familiar to us, that constitutes their claim to be regarded as the effects of causes now in action in the subterranean regions. They belong not to an order of things which has passed away. They are not the monuments of a primeval period, bearing inscribed upon them in obsolete characters the words and phrases of a dead language, but they teach us that part of the living language of nature, which we cannot learn by our daily intercourse with what passes on the habitable surface. End of chapter 12、Chapter 13, In the series of past changes in the animate and inanimate world. Supposed alternate periods of repose and disorder. Observed facts in which this doctrine has originated. These may be explained by supposing a uniform and uninterrupted series of changes. Threefold consideration of this subject. First, in reference to the living creation, extinction of species, and origin of new animals and plants. Secondly, in reference to the changes produced in the Earth's crust by the continuance of subterranean movements in certain areas, and their transference after long periods to new areas. Thirdly, in reference to the laws which govern the formation of fossiliferous strata. And the shifting of the areas of sedimentary deposition. On the combined influence of all these modes and causes of change, in producing breaks and chasms in the chain of records. Concluding remarks on the identity of the ancient and present system of terrestrial changes. Origin of the doctrine of alternate periods of repose and disorder. It has been truly observed that when we arrange the fossiliferous formations in chronological order, they constitute a broken and defective series of monuments. We pass without any intermediate gradations from systems of strata which are horizontal to other systems which are highly inclined, from rocks of peculiar mineral composition to others which have a character wholly distinct. From one assemblage of organic remains to another, in which frequently all the species and most of the genera are different. These violations of continuity are so common as to constitute the rule rather than the exception, and they have been considered by many geologists as conclusive in favor of sudden revolutions in the inanimate and animate world. According to the speculations of some writers, there have been in the past history of the planet alternate periods of tranquility and convulsion, the former enduring for ages and resembling that state of things now experienced by man, the other brief, transient, and paroxysmal, giving rise to new mountains, seas, and valleys. Annihilating one set of organic beings and ushering in the creation of another. It will be the object of the present chapter to demonstrate that these theoretical views are not borne out by a fair interpretation of geological monuments. It is true that in the solid framework of the globe we have a chronological chain of natural records. 
and that many links in this chain are wanting. But a careful consideration of all the phenomena will lead to the opinion that the series was originally defective, that it has been rendered still more so by time, that a great part of what remains is inaccessible to man, and even of that fraction which is accessible, nine-tenths are to this day unexplored. How the facts may be explained by assuming a uniform series of changes. The readiest way, perhaps, of persuading the reader that we may dispense with great and sudden revolutions in the geological order of events is by showing him how a regular and uninterrupted series of changes in the animate and inanimate world may give rise to such breaks in the sequence and such unconformability of stratified rocks are as usually thought to imply convulsions and catastrophes. It is scarcely necessary to state that the order of events thus assumed to occur, for the sake of illustration, must be in harmony with all the conclusions legitimately drawn by geologists from the structure of the earth, and must be equally in accordance with the changes observed by man to be now going on in the living as well as in the inorganic creation. It may be necessary in the present state of science to supply some part of the assumed course of nature hypothetically, but if so, this must be done without any violation of probability, and always consistently with the analogy of what is known both of the past and present economy of our system although the discussion of so comprehensive a subject must carry the beginner far beyond his depth. It will also, it is hoped, stimulate his curiosity, and prepare him to read some elementary treatise on geology with advantage, and teach him the bearing on that science of the changes now in progress on the earth. At the same time, it may enable him the better to understand the intimate connection between the second and third books of this work, the former of which is occupied with the changes in the inorganic, the latter with those of the organic creation. In pursuance, then, of the plan above proposed, I shall consider in this chapter, first, what may be the course of fluctuation in the animate world, secondly, the mode in which contemporaneous subterranean movements affect the earth's crust, and thirdly, the laws which regulate the deposition of sediment. Uniformity of change considered first in reference to the living creation. First in regard to the vicissitudes of the living creation, all are agreed that the sedimentary strata found in the earth's crust are divisible into a variety of groups more or less dissimilar in their organic remains and mineral composition. The conclusion universally drawn from the study and comparison of these fossiliferous groups is this, that at successive periods, distinct tribes of animals and plants have inhabited the land and waters, and that the organic types of the newer formations are more analogous to species now existing than those of more ancient rocks. If we then turn to the present state of the animate creation and inquire whether it has now become fixed and stationary, we discover that, on the contrary, it is in a state of continual flux, that there are many causes in action which tend to the extinction of species, and which are conclusive against the doctrine of their unlimited durability. But natural history has been successfully cultivated for so short a period that a few examples only of local, and perhaps but one or two of absolute extirpation, can as yet be proved, and these only where the interference of man has become conspicuous. It will nevertheless appear evident from the facts and arguments detailed in the third book, from the 37th to the 42nd chapters, inclusive, that man is not the only exterminating agent, and that, independently of his intervention, the annihilation of species is promoted 
by the multiplication and gradual diffusion of every animal or plant. It will also appear that every alteration in the physical geography and climate of the globe cannot fail to have the same tendency. If we proceed still farther and inquire whether new species are substituted from time to time for those which die out, and whether there are certain laws appointed by the author of nature to regulate such new creations, we find that the period of human observation is as yet too short to afford data for determining so weighty a question. All that can be done is to show that the successive introduction of new species may be a constant part of the economy of the terrestrial system, without our having any right to expect that we should be in possession of direct proof of the fact. The appearance again and again of new species may easily have escaped detection, since the numbers of known animals and plants have augmented so rapidly within the memory of persons now living as to have doubled in some classes and quadrupled in others. It will also be remarked in the sequel Book 3, Chapter 43, that it must always be more easy if species proceeded originally from single stocks to prove that one which formerly abounded in a given district has ceased to be than that another has been called into being for the first time. If, therefore, there be as yet only one or two unequivocal instances of extinction, namely those of the dodo and solitaire, see chapter 41, it is scarcely reasonable as yet to hope that we should be cognizant of a single instance of the first appearance of a new species. Recent origin of man and gradual approach in the tertiary fossils of successive periods from an extinct to the recent fauna. The geologist, however, if required to advance some fact which may lend countenance to the opinion that in the most modern times, that is to say, after the greater part of the existing fauna and flora were established on the earth, there has still been a new species superadded, may point to man himself as furnishing the required illustration. For a man must be regarded by the geologist as a creature of yesterday, not merely in reference to the past history of the organic world, but also in a relation to that particular state of the animate creation of which he forms a part. The comparatively modern introduction of the human race is proved by the absence of the remains of man and his works, not only from all strata containing a certain proportion of fossil shells of extinct species, but even from a large part of the newest strata in which all the fossil individuals are referable to species still living. To enable the reader to appreciate the full force of this evidence, I shall give a slight sketch of the information obtained from the new strata respecting fluctuations in the animate world, in times immediately antecedent to the appearance of man. In tracing the series of fossiliferous formations from the more ancient to the more modern, the first deposits in which we meet with assemblages of organic remains, having a near analogy to the fauna of certain parts of the globe in our own time, are those commonly called tertiary. Even in the Eocene, or oldest subdivision, of these tertiary formations, some few of the testacea belong to existing species, although almost all of them, and apparently all the associated vertebrata, are now extinct. These Eocene strata are succeeded by a great number of more modern deposits, which depart gradually in the character of their fossils from the Eocene type, and approach more and more to that of the living creation. In the present state of science, it is chiefly by the aid of shells that we are enabled to arrive at these results. For all classes, the testacea are the most generally diffused in a fossil state, and may be called the metals principally employed by nature 
in recording the chronology of past events. In the Miocene deposits, which are next in succession to the Eocene, we begin to find a considerable number, although still a minority, of recent species intermixed with some fossils common to the preceding epoch. We then arrive at the Pliocene strata, in which species now contemporary with man begin to preponderate, and in the newest of which nine-tenths of the fossils agree with species still inhabiting the neighboring sea. In this passing, from the older to the newer members of the tertiary system, we meet with many chasms, but none which separate entirely, by a broad line of demarcation, one state of the organic world from another. There are no signs of an abrupt termination of one fauna and flora, and the starting into life of new and wholly distinct forms. Although we are far from being able to demonstrate geologically an insensible transition from the Eocene to the Miocene, or even from the latter to the recent fauna, yet the more we enlarge and perfect our general survey, the more nearly do we approximate to such a continuous series, and the more gradually we are conducted from times when many of the genera and nearly all the species were extinct to those in which scarcely a single species flourished, which we do not know to exist at present. Dr. A. Filippi, indeed, after an elaborate comparison of the fossil tertiary shells of Sicily, with those now living in the Mediterranean, announces as the result of his examination that there are strata in that island which attest a very gradual passage from a period when only thirteen in a hundred of the shells were like the species now living in the sea, to an era when the recent species had attained a proportion of ninety-five in a hundred. There is, therefore, evidence, he says, in Sicily, of this revolution in the animate world having been effected, without the intervention of any convulsion or abrupt changes, certain species having from time to time died out, and others having been introduced, until at length the existing fauna was elaborated. It had often been objected that the evidence of fossil species occurring in two consecutive formations was confined to the testacea or zoophytes, the characters of which are less marked and decisive than those afforded by the vertebrate animals. But Mr. Owen has lately insisted on the important fact that not a few of the quadrupeds which now inhabit our island, and among others the horse, the ass, the hog, the smaller wild ox, the goat, the red deer, the roe, the beaver, and many of the diminutive rodents, are the same as those which once coexisted with the mammoth, the great northern hippopotamus, two kinds of rhinoceros, and other mammalia long since extinct. A part, he observes, and not the whole of the modern tertiary fauna has perished, and hence we may conclude that the cause of their destruction has not been a violent and universal catastrophe from which none could escape. Had we discovered evidence that man had come into the earth at a period as early as that when a large number of the fossil quadrupeds now living and almost all the recent species of the land, freshwater, and marine shells were in existence, we should have been compelled to ascribe a much higher antiquity to our species than even the boldest speculations of the ethnologist require. For no small part of the great physical revolution depicted on the map of Europe, plate three, before described, took place very gradually after the recent testacea abounded almost to the exclusion of the extinct. Thus, for example, in the deposits called the Northern Drift, or the glacial formation of Europe and North America, the fossil marine shells can easily be identified with species either now inhabiting the neighboring sea or living in the seas of higher latitudes. Yet they exhibit no memorials of the human race or of articles fabricated by the hand of man. Some of the newest of these strata 
passing by the name of raised beaches occur at moderate elevations on the coast of england scotland and ireland other examples are met with on a more extended scale in scandinavia as at the height of two hundred feet at udavala in sweden and at twice the elevation near christiana in norway also at an attitude of six or seven hundred feet in places further north they consist of beds of sand and clay filling hollows in a district of granite and gneiss and they must closely resemble the accumulations of shelly matter now in progress at the bottom of the norwegian fjords the rate at which the land is now rising in scandinavia is far too irregular in different places to afford a safe standard for estimating the minimum of time required for the upheaval of the fundamental granite and its marine shelly covering to the height of so many hundred feet but according to the greatest average of five or six feet in a century the period required would be very considerable and nearly the whole of it as well as the antecedent epoch of submergence seems to have preceded the introduction of man into these parts of the earth there are other post-tertiary formations of fluviatile origin in the centre of europe in which the absence of human remains is perhaps still more striking because when formed they must have been surrounded by dry land i allude to the silt or loess of the basin of the rhine which must have gradually filled up the great valley of that river since the time when its waters and the contiguous lands were inhabited by the existing species of freshwater and terrestrial mollusks showers of ashes thrown out by some of the last eruptions of the eiffel volcanoes fell during the deposition of this fluviatile silt and were interstratified with it but these volcanoes became exhausted the valley was re-excavated through the silt and again reduced to its present form before the period of human history the study therefore of this shelly silt reveals to us the history of a long series of events which occurred after the testacea now living inhabited the land and rivers of europe and the whole terminated without any signs of the coming of man into that part of the globe to cite a still more remarkable example we observe in sicily a lofty tableland and hills sometimes rising to the height of three thousand feet capped with a limestone in which from seventy to eighty five per cent of the fossil testacea are specifically identical with those now inhabiting the mediterranean these calcareous and other argillaceous strata of the same age are intersected by deep valleys which have been gradually formed by denudation but have not varied materially in width or depth since sicily was first colonized by the greeks the limestone moreover which is of so late a date in geological chronology was quarried for building those ancient temples of girgenti and syracuse of which the ruins carry us back to a remote era in human history if we are lost in conjectures when speculating on the ages required to lift up these formations to the height of several thousand feet above the sea, how much more remote must be the era when the same rocks were gradually formed beneath the waters? To conclude, it appears that, in going back from the recent to the Eocene period, we are carried by many successive steps from the fauna, now contemporary with man, to an assemblage of fossil species wholly different from those now living. In this retrospect, we have not yet succeeded in tracing back a perfect transition from the recent to the extinct fauna, but there are usually so many species in common to the groups which stand next in succession as to show that there is no great chasm, no signs of a crisis when one class of organic beings were annihilated to give place suddenly to another. This analogy, therefore, 
derived from a period of the Earth's history, which can be best compared with the present state of things, and more thoroughly investigated than any other, leads to the conclusion that the extinction and creation of species has been and is the result of a slow and gradual change in the organic world. End of section 26. Chapter 13, Part 2 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter 13, Part 2. Uniformity of Change Considered Secondly in Reference to Subterranean Movements. To pass on to another of the three topics before proposed for discussion, the reader will find in the account given in the second book of the earthquakes recorded in history that certain countries have from time immemorial been rudely shaken again and again, while others, comprising by far the largest part of the globe, have remained to all appearance motionless. In the regions of convulsion, rocks have been rent asunder, the surface has been forced up into ridges, chasms have opened, or the ground throughout large spaces has been permanently lifted up above or let down below its former level. In the regions of tranquility, some areas have remained at rest, but others have been ascertained by a comparison of measurements made at different periods, to have risen by an insensible motion, as in Sweden, or to have subsided very slowly, as in Greenland, that these same movements, whether ascending or descending, have continued for ages in the same direction, has been established by geological evidence. Thus we find both on the east and west coast of Sweden, that ground which formerly constituted the bottom of the Baltic and of the ocean has been lifted up to an elevation of several hundred feet above high water mark. The rise within the historical period has not amounted to many yards, but the greater extent of antecedent upheaval is proved by the occurrence in inland spots several hundred feet high of deposits filled with fossil shells of species now living either in the ocean or the Baltic. To detect proofs of slow and gradual subsidence must in general be more difficult, but the theory which accounts for the form of circular coral reefs and lagoon islands, and which will be explained in the last chapter of the third book, will satisfy the reader that there are spaces on the globe several thousand miles in circumference, throughout which the downward movement has predominated for ages. And yet, the land has never in a single instance gone down suddenly for several hundred feet at once. Yet, geology demonstrates that the persistency of subterranean movements in one direction has not been perpetual throughout all past time. There have been great oscillations of level, by which a surface of dry land has been submerged to a depth of several thousand feet, and then, at a period long subsequent, raised again and made to emerge. Nor have the regions now motionless been always at rest, and some of those which are at present the theaters of reiterated earthquakes have formerly enjoyed a long continuance of tranquility. But although disturbances have ceased after having long prevailed, or have recommenced after a suspension for ages, there has been no universal disruption of the earth's crust or desolation of the surface since times the most remote. The non-occurrence of such a general convulsion is proved by the perfect horizontally, now retained by some of the most ancient fossiliferous strata throughout wide areas. Inferences derived from unconformable strata. That the subterranean forces have visited different parts of the globe at successive periods 
is inferred chiefly from the unconformability of strata belonging to groups of different ages. Thus, for example, on the border of Wales and Shropshire, we find the slaty beds of the ancient Silurian system curved and vertical, while the beds of the overlying Carboniferous shale and sandstone are horizontal. All are agreed that in such a case the older set of strata had suffered great dislocation before the deposition of the newer or Carboniferous beds, and that these last have never since been convulsed by any movements of excessive violence. But the strata of the inferior group suffered only a local derangement, and rocks of the same age are by no means found everywhere in a curved or vertical position. In various parts of Europe, and particularly near Lake Vener in the south of Sweden, and in many parts of Russia, beds of the same Silurian system maintain the most perfect horizontality, and a similar observation may be made respecting limestones and shales of the like antiquity in the Great Lake District of Canada and the United States. They are still as flat and horizontal as when first formed. Yet since their origin, not only have most of the actual mountain chains been uplifted, but the very rocks of which those mountains are composed have been formed. It would be easy to multiply instances of similar unconformability in formations of other ages, but a few more will suffice. The coal measures before alluded to as horizontal on the borders of Wales are vertical in the Mendip Hills in Somersetshire, where the overlying beds of the new red sandstone are horizontal. Again in the worlds of Yorkshire, the last mentioned sandstone supports on its curved and inclined beds the horizontal chalk. The chalk again is vertical on the flanks of the Pyrenees and the tertiary strata repose unconformably upon it. Consistency of local disturbances with general uniformity. As almost every country supplies illustrations of the same phenomena, they who advocate the doctrine of altered periods of disorder and repose may appeal to the facts above described as proving that every district has been by turns convulsed by earthquakes and then respited for ages from convulsions. But so it might with equal truth be affirmed that every part of Europe has been visited alternately by winter and summer, although it has always been winter and always summer in some part of the planet neither of these seasons has ever reigned simultaneously over the entire globe. They have been always shifting about from place to place, but the vicissitudes which recur thus annually in a single spot are never allowed to interfere with the invariable uniformity of seasons throughout the whole planet. So, in regard to subterranean movements, the theory of the perpetual uniformity of the force which they exert on the Earth's crust is quite consistent with the admission of their alternate development and suspension for indefinite periods within limited geographical areas. Uniformity of change considered thirdly in reference to sedimentary deposition. It now remains to speak of the laws governing the deposition of new strata, if we survey the surface of the globe, we immediately perceive that it is divisible into areas of deposition and non-deposition, or in other words, at any given time, there are spaces which are the recipients, others which are not the recipients of sedimentary matter. No new strata, for example, are thrown down on dry land, which remains the same from year to year whereas in many parts of the bottom of seas and lakes, mud, sand, and pebbles are annually spread out by rivers and currents. There are also great masses of limestone growing in some seas, or in mid-ocean, chiefly composed of corals and shells. No sediment deposited on dry land. As to the dry land, 
so far from being the receptacle of fresh ascensions of matter, it is exposed almost everywhere to waste away. Forests may be as dense and lofty as those of Brazil, and may swarm with quadrupeds, birds, and insects. Yet, at the end of ten thousand years, one layer of black mold, a few inches thick, may be the sole representative of those myriads of trees, leaves, flowers, and fruits, those innumerable bones and skeletons of birds, quadrupeds, and reptiles, which tenanted the fertile region. Should this land be at length submerged, the waves of the sea may wash away in a few hours a scanty covering of mold, and it may merely impart a darker shade of color to the next stratum of marl sand, or other matter newly thrown down. So also, at the bottom of the ocean, where no sediment is accumulating, seaweed zoophytes, fish, and even shells may multiply for ages and decompose, leaving no vestige of their form or substance behind. Their decay in water, although more slow, is as certain and eventually as complete as in the open air. Nor can they be perpetuated for indefinite periods in a fossil state, unless embedded in some matrix which is impervious to water, or which at least does not allow a free percolation of that fluid, impregnated, as it usually is, with a slight quantity of carbonic or other acid. Such a free percolation may be prevented either by the mineral nature of the matrix itself or by the superposition of an impermeable stratum. But if unimpeded, the fossil shell or bone will be dissolved and removed particle after particle and thus entirely effaced unless petrifaction or the substitution of mineral for organic matter happen to take place that there has been land as well as sea at all former geological periods. We know from the fact that fossil trees and terrestrial plants are embedded in rocks of every age, occasionally lacustrine and fluviatile shells, insects or the bones of amphibious or land reptiles point to the same conclusion. The existence of dry land at all periods of the past implies, as before mentioned, the partial deposition of sediment or its limitation to certain areas, and the next point to which I shall call the reader's attention is the shifting of these areas from one region to another. First, then, variations in the site of sedimentary deposition are brought about independently of subterranean movements. There is always a slight change from year to year or from century to century. The sediment of the Rhone, for example, thrown into the Lake of Geneva, is now conveyed to a spot a mile and a half distant from that where it accumulated in the 10th century, and six miles from the point where the delta began originally to form. We may look forward to the period when this lake will be filled up, and then the distribution of the transported matter will be suddenly altered, for the mud and sand brought down from the Alps will thenceforth, instead of being deposited near Geneva, be carried nearly 200 miles southward, where the Rhone enters the Mediterranean. In the deltas of large rivers, such as those of the Ganges and Indus, the mud is first carried down for many centuries through one arm, and on this being stopped up, it is discharged by another and may then enter the sea at a point fifty or one hundred miles distance from its first receptacle. The direction of marine currents is also liable to be changed by various accidents, as by the heaping up of new sandbanks, or the wearing away of cliffs and promontories. But secondly, all these causes of fluctuation in the sedimentary areas are entirely subordinate to those great upward or downward movements of land which have been already described as prevailing over large tracts of the globe. By such elevation or subsidence, certain spaces are gradually submerged or made gradually to emerge. In the one case, sedimentary deposition may be suddenly renewed after having been suspended for ages, 
and the other as suddenly made to cease after having continued for an indefinite period. Causes of Variation in Mineral Character of Successive Sedimentary Groups If deposition be renewed after a long interval, the new strata will usually differ greatly from the sedimentary rocks previously formed in the same place, and especially if the older rocks have suffered derangement, which implies a change in the physical geography of the district since the previous conveyance of sediment to the same spot. It may happen, however, that even when the inferior group is horizontal and conformable to the upper strata, these last may still differ entirely in mineral character, because since the origin of the older formation, the geography of some distant country has been altered. In that country, rocks before concealed may have become exposed by denudation. Volcanoes may have burst out and covered the surface with scoriae and lava, or new lakes may have been formed by subsidence, and other fluctuations may have occurred by which the materials brought down from thence by rivers to the sea have acquired a distinct mineral character. It is well known that the stream of the Mississippi is charged with sediment of a different color from that of the Arkansas and Red Rivers, which are tinged with red mud, derived from rocks of porphyry in the far west. The waters of the Uruguay, says Darwin, draining a granitic country, are clear and black as those of the Parana Red. The mud with which the Indus is loaded, says Burns, is of a clayey hue. That of the Chenab, on the other hand, is reddish. That of the Sutledge is more pale. The same causes which make these several rivers, sometimes situated at no great distance to one from the other, to differ greatly in the character of their sediment, will make the waters draining the same country at different epochs, especially before and after great revolutions in physical geography, to be entirely dissimilar. It is scarcely necessary to add that marine currents will be affected in an analogous manner, in consequence of the formation of new shoals, the emergence of new islands, the subsidence of others, the gradual waste of neighboring coasts, the growth of new deltas, the increase of coral reefs, and other changes. Why successive sedimentary groups contain distinct fossils? If in the next place we assume, for reasons before stated, a continual extinction of species and introduction of others into the globe, it will then follow that the fossils of strata formed at two distant periods on the same spot will differ even more certainly than the mineral composition of the same. For rocks of the same kind have sometimes been reproduced in the same district after a long interval of time, whereas there are no facts leading to the opinion that species which have once died out have ever been reproduced. The submergence, then, of land must be often attended by the commencement of a new class of sedimentary deposits, characterized by a new set of fossil animals and plants, while the reconversion of the bed of the sea into land may arrest at once and for an indefinite time the formation of geological monuments. Should the land again sink, strata will again be formed but one or many entire revolutions in animal or vegetable life may have been completed in the interval. Conditions requisite for the original completeness of a fossiliferous series. If we infer, for reasons before explained, that fluctuations in the animate world are brought about by the slow and successive removal and creation of species, we shall be convinced that a rare combination of circumstances alone can give rise to such a series of strata as will bear testimony to a gradual passage from one state of organic life to another. To produce such strata, nothing less will be requisite than the fortunate coincidence of the following conditions. First, a never-failing supply of sediment 
in the same region throughout a period of vast duration. Secondly, the fitness of the deposit in every part for the permanent preservation of embedded fossils, and thirdly, a gradual subsidence to prevent the sea or lake from being filled up and converted into land. It will appear in the chapter on coral reefs that in certain parts of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, most of these conditions, if not all, are complied with and the constant growth of coral, keeping pace with the sinking of the bottom of the sea, seems to have gone on so slowly, for such indefinite periods, that the signs of a gradual change in organic life might probably be detected in that quarter of the globe if we could explore its submarine geology. Instead of the growth of coralline limestone, let us suppose in some other place the continuous deposition of fluviatile mud and sand, such as the Ganges and Brahmaputra, have poured for thousands of years into the Bay of Bengal. Part of this bay, although of considerable depth, might at length be filled up before an appreciable amount of change was effected in the fish, mollusca, and other inhabitants of the sea and neighboring land. But if the bottom be lowered by sinking at the same rate that it is raised by fluviatile mud, the bay can never be turned into dry land. In that case, one new layer of matter may be superimposed upon another, for a thickness of many thousand feet, and the fossils of the inferior beds may differ greatly from those entombed in the uppermost yet every intermediate gradation may be indicated in the passage from an older to a newer assemblage of species. Granting, however, that such an unbroken sequence of monuments may thus be elaborated in certain parts of the sea, and that the strata happen to be all of them well adapted to preserve the included fossils from decomposition, how many accidents must still concur before these submarine formations will be laid open to our investigation. The whole deposit must first be raised several thousand feet in order to bring into view the very foundation, and during the process of exposure the superior beds must not be entirely swept away by denudation. In the first place, the chances are, as three to one, against the mere emergence of the mass above the waters, because three-fourths of the globe are covered by the ocean. But if it be upheaved, and made to constitute part of the dry land, it must also, before it can be available for our instruction, become part of that area already surveyed by geologists. And this area comprehends perhaps less than a tenth of the whole world. In this small fraction of land already explored, and still very imperfectly known, we are required to find a set of strata originally of limited extent and probably much lessened by subsequent denudation. Yet it is precisely because we do not encounter at every step the evidence of such gradations from one state of the organic world to another, that so many geologists embrace the doctrine of great and sudden revolutions in the history of the animate world. Not content with simply availing themselves for the convenience of classification of those gaps and chasms, which here and there interrupt the continuity of the chronological series, as at present known, they deduce from the frequency of these breaks in the chain of records an irregular mode of succession in the events themselves, both in the organic and inorganic world. But besides that some links of the chain which once existed are now clearly lost and others concealed from view, we have good reason to suspect that it was never complete originally. It may undoubtedly be said that strata have been always forming somewhere, and therefore at every moment of past time, nature has added a page to her archives. But in reference to this subject, it should be remembered that we can never hope to compile a consecutive history by gathering together monuments which were originally detached and scattered over the globe, 
for as the species of organic beings contemporaneously inhabiting remote regions are distinct the fossils of the first of several periods which may have preserved in any one country as in america for example will have no connection with those of a second period found in india and will therefore no more enable us to trace the signs of a gradual change in the living creation than a fragment of chinese history will fill up a blank in the political annals of europe the absence of any deposits of importance containing recent shells in chile or anywhere on the western coast of south america naturally led mr darwin to the conclusion that where the bed of the sea is either stationary or rising circumstances are far less favorable than where the level is sinking to the accumulation of conchiferous strata of sufficient thickness and extension to resist the average vast amount of denudation an examination of the superficial clay sand and gravel of the most modern date in norway and sweden where the land is also rising would incline us to admit a similar proposition yet in these cases there has been a supply of sediment from the waste of the coast in the interior especially in patagonia and chile nevertheless wherever the bottom of the sea has been continually elevated the total thickness of sedimentary matter accumulating at depths suited to the habitation of most of the species of shells can never be great nor can the deposits be thickly covered by superincumbent matter so as to be consolidated by pressure. When they are upheaved, therefore, the waves on the beach will bear down and disperse the loose materials, whereas if the bed of the sea subsides slowly, a mass of strata containing abundance of such species as live at moderate depths may increase in thickness to any amount and may extend over a broad area as the water gradually encroaches on the land. If then, at particular periods, as in the Miocene epoch, for example, both in Europe and North America, contemporaneous shelly deposits have originated and have been preserved at very distant points, it may arise from the prevalence at that period of simultaneous subsidence throughout very wide areas. The absence, in the same quarters of the globe, of strata marking the ages which immediately succeeded may be accounted for by supposing that the level of the bed of the sea and the adjoining land was stationary or was undergoing slow upheaval. How far some of the great violations of continuity, which now exist in the chronological table of fossiliferous rocks, will hereafter be removed or lessened, must at present be mere matter of conjecture. The hiatus, which exists in Great Britain between the fossils of the Lias and those of the Magnesian limestone, is supplied in Germany by the rich fauna and flora of the Muschelkalk Kuiper and Bunter Sandstein, which we know to be of a date precisely intermediate those three formations being interposed in Germany between others which agree perfectly in their organic remains with our lias and magnesium limestone until lately the fossils of the coal measures were separated from those of the antecedent silurian group by a very abrupt and decided line of demarcation but recent discoveries have brought to light in devonshire belgium the eiffel and westphalia the remains of a fauna of an intervening period this connecting link is furnished by the fossil shells, fish, and corals of the Devonian, or Old Red Sandstone group, and some species of this newly intercalcated fauna are found to be common to it, and the subjacent Silurian rocks, while other species belong to it in common with the coal measures. We also have, in like manner, had some success of late years in diminishing the hiatus which still separates the Cretaceous and Eocene periods in Europe. Still, we must expect, for reasons before stated, that some such chasms will forever continue to occur in some parts of our sedimentary series. End of section 27
Chapter 13, Part 3 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter 13, Part 3. Consistency of the Theory of Gradual Change with the Existence of Great Breaks in the Series. To return to the general argument pursued in this chapter, it is assumed for reasons above explained that a slow change of species is in simultaneous operation everywhere, throughout the habitable surface of sea and land, whereas the fossilization of plants and animals is confined to those areas where new strata are produced. These areas, as we have seen, are always shifting their position, so that the fossilizing process by means of which the commemoration of the particular state of the organic world at any given time is effected may be said to move about, visiting and revisiting different tracts in succession. To make still more clear the supposed working of this machinery, I shall compare it to a somewhat analogous case that might be imagined to occur in the history of human affairs. Let the mortality of the population of a large country represent the successive extinction of species, and the births of new individuals the introduction of new species. While these fluctuations are gradually taking place everywhere, Suppose commissioners to be appointed to visit each province of the country in succession, taking an exact account of the number, names, and individual peculiarities of all the inhabitants, and leaving in each district a register containing a record of this information. If, after the completion of one census, another is immediately made on the same plan, and then another, there will at last be a series of statistical documents in each province. When those belonging to any one province are arranged in chronological order, the contents of such as stand next to each other will differ according to the length of the intervals of time between the taking of each census. If, for example, there are sixty provinces, and all the registers are made in a single year and renewed annually, the number of births and deaths will be so small in proportion to the whole of the inhabitants during the interval between the compiling of the two consecutive documents that the individuals described in such documents will be nearly identical. Whereas, if the survey of each of the sixty provinces occupies all the commissioners for a whole year so that they are unable to revisit the same place until the expiration of sixty years, there will then be an almost entire discordance between the persons enumerated in two consecutive registers in the same province. There are undoubtedly other causes besides the mere quantity of time which may augment or diminish the amount of discrepancy. Thus, at some periods, a pestilential disease may have lessened the average duration of human life, or a variety of circumstances may have caused the births to be unusually numerous and the population to multiply or a province may be suddenly colonized by persons migrating from surrounding districts. These exceptions may be compared to the accelerated rate of fluctuation in the fauna and flora of a particular region in which the climate and physical geography may be undergoing an extraordinary degree of alteration. But I must remind the reader that the case above proposed has no pretensions to be regarded as an exact parallel to the geological phenomena which I desire to illustrate, for the commissioners are supposed to visit the different provinces in rotation, whereas the commemorating process by which organic remains become fossilized, although they are always shifting from one area to the other, are yet very irregular in their movements. They may abandon 
and revisit many spaces again and again before they once approach another district and besides this source of irregularity it may often happen that while the depositing process is suspended denudation may take place which may be compared to the occasional destruction by fire or other causes of some of the statistical documents before mentioned it is evident that where such accidents occur the want of continuity in the series may become indefinitely great and that the monuments which follow next in succession will by no means be equidistant from each other in point of time if this train of reasoning be admitted the occasional distinctness of the fossil remains in formations immediately in contact would be a necessary consequence of the existing laws of sedimentary deposition and subterranean movement accompanied by a constant mortality and renovation of species as all the conclusions above insisted on are directly opposed to opinions still popular i shall add another comparison in the hope of preventing any possible misapprehension of the argument suppose we had discovered two buried cities at the foot of vesuvius immediately superimposed upon each other with a great mass of tuff and lava intervening just as portiche and resina if now covered with ashes would overlie herculaneum an antiquary might possibly be entitled to infer from the inscriptions on public edifices that the inhabitants of the inferior and older city were greeks and those of the modern towns italians but he would reason very hastily if he also concluded from these data that there had been a sudden change from the greek to the italian language in campania but if he afterwards found three buried cities one after the other the intermediate one being roman while as in the former example the lowest was greek and the uppermost italian he would then perceive the fallacy of his former opinion and would begin to suspect that the catastrophes by which the cities were inhumed might have no relation whatever to the fluctuations in the language of the inhabitants and that as the roman tongue had evidently intervened between the greek and italian so many other dialects may have been spoken in succession and the passage from the greek to the italian may have been very gradual some terms growing obsolete while others were introduced from time to time if this antiquary could have shown that the volcanic paroxysms of vesuvius were so governed as that cities should be buried one above the other just as often as any variation occurred in the language of the inhabitants then indeed the abrupt passage from a greek to a roman and from a roman to an italian city would afford proof of fluctuations no less sudden in the language of the people so in geology if we could assume that it is part of the plan of nature to preserve in every region of the globe an unbroken series of monuments to commemorate the vicissitudes of the organic creation, we might infer the sudden extirpation of species and the simultaneous introduction of others, as often as two formations in contact are found to include dissimilar organic fossils. But we must shut our eyes to the whole economy of the existing causes aqueous igneous and organic if we fail to perceive that such is not the plan of nature concluding remarks on the identity of the ancient and present system of terrestrial changes i shall now conclude the discussion of a question with which we have been occupied since the beginning of the fifth chapter namely whether there has been any interruption from the remotest periods of one uniform system of change in the animate and inanimate world we were induced to enter into that inquiry by reflecting how much the progress of opinion in geology had been influenced by the assumption that the analogy was slight in kind and still more slight in degree between the causes which produced the former revolutions of the globe and those now in everyday operation 
it appeared clear that the earlier geologists had not only a scanty acquaintance with existing changes, but were singularly unconscious of the amount of their ignorance. With the presumption naturally inspired by this unconsciousness, they had no hesitation in deciding at once that time could never enable the existing powers of nature to work out changes of great magnitude, still less such important revolutions as those which are brought to light by geology. They therefore felt themselves at liberty to indulge their imaginations in guessing at what might be, rather than inquiring what is. In other words, they employed themselves in conjecturing what might have been the course of nature at a remote period, rather than investigating of what was the course of nature in their own times. It appeared to them more philosophical to speculate on the possibilities of the past than patiently to explore the realities of the present and having invented theories under the influence of such maxims they were consistently unwilling to test their validity by the criterion of their accordance with the ordinary operations of nature on the contrary the claims of each new hypothesis to credibility appeared enhanced by the great contrast, in kind or intensity, of the causes referred to and those now in operation. Never was there a dogma more calculated to foster indolence and to blunt the keen edge of curiosity than this assumption of the discordance between the ancient and existing causes of change it produced a state of mind unfavorable in the highest degree to the candid reception of the evidence of those minute but incessant alterations which every part of the earth's surface is undergoing and by which the condition of its living inhabitants is continually made to vary the student instead of being encouraged with the hope of interpreting the enigmas presented to him in the earth's structure, instead of being prompted to undertake laborious inquiries into the natural history of the organic world and the complicated effects of the igneous and aqueous causes now in operation, was taught to despond from the first. Geology, it was affirmed, could never rise to the rank of an exact science. The greater number of phenomena must forever remain inexplicable, or only be partially elucidated by ingenious conjectures. Even the mystery which invested the subject was said to constitute one of its principal charms affording, as it did, full scope to the fancy to indulge in a boundless field of speculation. The course directly opposed to this method of philosophizing consists in an earnest and patient inquiry how far geological appearances are reconcilable with the effect of changes now in progress, or which may be in progress, in regions inaccessible to us, and of which the reality is attested by volcanoes and subterranean movements. It also endeavors to estimate the aggregate result of ordinary operations multiplied by time, and cherishes a sanguine hope that the resources to be derived from observation and experiment, or from the study of nature, such as she now is, are very far from being exhausted. For this reason, all theories are rejected which involve the assumption of sudden and violent catastrophes, and revolutions of the whole earth and its inhabitants, theories which are restrained by no reference to existing analogies, and in which a desire is manifested to cut rather than patiently to untie the Gordian knot. We have now at least the advantage of knowing from experience that an opposite method had always put geologists on the road that leads to truth, suggesting views which, although imperfect at first, have been found capable of improvement until at last adopted by universal consent, while the method of speculating on a former distinct state of things and causes has led invariably to a multitude of contradictory systems, which have been overthrown one after the other, have been found incapable of modification, and which have often required 
to be precisely reversed. The remainder of this work will be devoted to an investigation of the changes now going on in the crust of the earth and its inhabitants. The importance which the student will attach to such researches will mainly depend in the degree of confidence which he feels in the principles above expounded. If he firmly believes in the resemblance or identity of the ancient and present system of terrestrial changes, he will regard every fact collected respecting the cause in diurnal action as affording him a key to the interpretation of some mystery in the past. Events which have occurred at the most distant periods in the animate and inanimate world will be acknowledged to throw light on each other and the deficiency of our information respecting some of the most obscure parts of the present creation will be removed for as by studying the external configuration of the existing land and its inhabitants we may restore in imagination the appearance of the ancient continents which have passed away so we may obtain from the deposits of ancient seas and lakes an insight into the nature of the subaqueous processes, now in operation, and of many forms of organic life, which, though now existing, are veiled from sight. Rocks are produced by subterranean fire in former ages, at great depths in the bowels of the earth. Present us, when upraised by gradual movements and exposed to the light of heaven, with an image of those changes which the deep-seated volcano may now occasion in the nether regions. Thus also we are mere sojourners on the surface of the planet, chained to a mere point in space, enduring but for a moment of time the human mind is not only enabled to number worlds beyond the unassisted ken of mortal eye, but to trace the events of indefinite ages before the creation of our race, and is not even withheld from penetrating into the dark secrets of the ocean, or the interior of the solid globe, free like the spirit which the poet described as animating the universe. Ire per omnis teresque, tractusque, maris, columcu profundum. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14, Part 1 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Chapter 14 Book 2. Changes in the Inorganic World Aqueous Causes Chapter 14 Division of the subject into changes of the organic and inorganic world. Inorganic causes of change divided into aqueous and igneous. Aqueous causes first considered. Fall of rain. Recent rain prints in mud. Destroying and transporting power of running water. Newly formed valleys in Georgia. Sinuosities of rivers. Two streams when united do not occupy a bed of double surface inundations in Scotland, floods caused by landslips in the White Mountains, bursting of a lake in Switzerland, devastations caused by the Ennio at Tivoli, excavations in the lavas of Etna by Sicilian rivers, gorge of the Simeto, gradual rescission of the cataract of Niagara. Division of the Subject Geology was defined to be the science which investigates the former changes that have taken place in the organic as well as in the inorganic kingdoms of nature. As vicissitudes in the inorganic world are most apparent, and as on them all fluctuations in the animate creation must in a great measure depend, 
they may claim our first consideration. The great agents of change in the inorganic world may be divided into two principal classes, the aqueous and the igneous. To the aqueous belong rain, rivers, torrents, springs, currents, and tides. To the igneous, volcanoes and earthquakes. Both these classes are instruments of decay as well as of reproduction, but they may also be regarded as antagonist forces. For the aqueous agents are incessantly laboring to reduce the inequalities of the Earth's surface to a level, while the igneous are equally active in restoring the unevenness of the external crust, partly by heaping up new matter in certain localities, and partly by depressing one portion and forcing out another of the Earth's envelope. It is difficult, in a scientific arrangement, to give an accurate view of the combined effects of so many forces in simultaneous operation. Because when we consider them separately, we cannot easily estimate either the extent of their efficacy or the kind of results which they produce. We are in danger, therefore, when we attempt to examine the influence exerted singly by each of overlooking the modifications which they produce on one another. And these are so complicated that sometimes the igneous and aqueous forces cooperate to produce a joint effect to which neither of them unaided by the other could give rise, as when repeated earthquakes unite with running water to widen a valley, or when a thermal spring rises up from a great depth and conveys the mineral ingredients with which it is impregnated from the interior of the earth to the surface. Sometimes the organic combine with the inorganic causes, as when a reef composed of shells and corals protects one line of coast from the destroying power of tides or currents, and turns them against some other point. Or when drift timber, floated into a lake, fills a hollow to which the stream would not have had sufficient velocity to convey earthy sediment. It is necessary, however, to divide our observations on these various causes, and to classify them systematically, endeavoring as much as possible to keep in view that the effects in nature are mixed and not simple, as they may appear in an artificial arrangement. In treating in the first place of the aqueous causes, we may consider them under two divisions. First, those which are connected with the circulation of water from the land to the sea, under which are included all the phenomena of rain, rivers, glaciers, and springs. Secondly, those which arise from the movements of water in lakes, seas, and the ocean, wherein are comprised the phenomena of waves, tides, and currents. In turning our attention to the former division, we find that the effects of rivers may be subdivided into, first, those of a destroying and transporting, and secondly, those of a renovating nature. In the former are included the erosion of rocks and the transportation of matter to lower levels. In the renovating class, the formation of deltas by the influx of sediment and the shallowing of seas. But these processes are so intimately related to each other that it will not always be possible to consider them under their separate heads. Fall of Rain it is well known that the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb aqueous vapor and hold it in suspension increases with every increment of temperature. This capacity is also found to augment in a higher ratio than the augmentation of the heat. Hence, as was first suggested by the geologist Dr. Hutton, when two volumes of air of different temperatures, both saturated with moisture, mingle together, Clouds and rain are produced, for a mean degree of heat having resulted from the union of the two moist airs, the excess of vapor previously held in suspension by the warmer of the two is given out, and if it be in sufficient abundance, is precipitated in the form of rain. 
as the temperature of the atmosphere diminishes gradually from the equator towards the pole, the evaporation of water and the quantity of rain diminish also. According to Humboldt's computation, the average annual depth of rain at the equator is 96 inches, while at latitude 45 degrees, it is only 29 inches, and in latitude 60 degrees, not more than 17 inches. But there are so many disturbing causes that the actual discharge in any given locality may deviate very widely from this rule. In England, for example, where the average fall at London is 24 and a half inches, as ascertained at the Greenwich Observatory, there is such irregularity in some districts that while at Whitehaven, in Cumberland, there fell in 1849 32 inches, the quantity of rain in Borrowdale, near Keswick, only 15 miles to the westward, was no less than 142 inches. In like manner, in India, Colonel Sykes found by observations made in 1847 and 1848 that at places situated between 17 degrees and 18 degrees northern latitude on a line drawn across the western gouts in the Deccan, the fall of rain varied from 21 to 219 inches. The annual average in Bengal is probably below 80 inches, yet Dr. G. Hooker witnessed at Churapunji in the year 1850 a fall of 30 inches in 24 hours, and in the same place during residence of six months, from June to November, 530 inches. This occurred in the south face of the Cassia, or Garo Mountains, in eastern Bengal. See map, chapter 18. Where the depth during the whole of the same year probably exceeded 600 inches, so extraordinary a discharge of water, which, as we shall presently see, is very local, may be thus accounted for. Warm, southerly winds blowing over the Bay of Bengal and becoming laden with vapor during their passage reach the low-level delta of the Ganges and Brahmaputra, where the ordinary heat exceeds that of the sea, and where evaporation is constantly going on from countless marshes and the arms of the great rivers. A mingling of two masses of damp air of different temperatures probably causes the fall of 70 or 80 inches of rain, which takes place on the plains. The monsoon, having crossed the delta, impinges on the Cassia Mountains, which rise abruptly from the plain, to a mean elevation of between 4,000 and 5,000 feet. Here the wind not only encounters the cold air of the mountains, but, what is far more effective as a refrigerating cause, the aerial current is made to flow upwards and to ascend to a height of several thousand feet above the sea. Both the air and the vapor contained in it, being thus relieved of much atmospheric pressure, expand suddenly and are cooled by rarefaction. The vapor is condensed, and about 500 inches of rain are thrown down annually, nearly 20 times as much as falls in Great Britain in a year, and almost all of it poured down in six months. The channel of every torrent and river is swollen at this season, and much sandstone horizontally stratified, and other rocks are reduced to sand and gravel by the flooded streams. So great is the superficial waste, or denudation, that what would otherwise be a rich and luxuriantly wooded region is converted into a wild and barren moorland. After the current of warm air has been thus drained of a large portion of its moisture, it still continues its northerly course to the opposite flank of the Cassia Range, only 20 miles farther north, and here the fall of rain is reduced to 70 inches in the year. The same wind then blows northwards across the valley of the Brahmaputra, and at length arrives so dry and exhausted at the Bhutan Himalaya, latitude 28 degrees north, that those mountains, up to the height of 5,000 feet, are naked and sterile, 
and all their outer valleys arid and dusty. The aerial current, still continuing its northerly course and ascending to a higher region, becomes further cooled, condensation again ensues, and Bhutan, above 5,000 feet, is densely clothed with vegetation. In another part of India, immediately to the westward, similar phenomena are repeated. The same warm and humid winds, copiously charged with aqueous vapor from the Bay of Bengal, hold their course due north for 300 miles across the flat and hot plains of the Ganges, till they encounter the lofty Sikkim Mountains. See map, chapter 18. On the southern flank of these, they discharge such a deluge of rain that the rivers in the rainy season rise 12 feet in as many hours. Numerous landslips, some of them extending three or four thousand feet across the face of the mountains, composed of granite, gneiss, and slate, descend into the beds of streams and dam them up for a time, causing temporary lakes which soon burst their barriers. Day and night, says Dr. Hooker, we hear the crashing of falling trees and the sound of boulders thrown violently against each other in the beds of torrents. By such wear and tear, rocky fragments swept down from the hills are in part converted into sand and fine mud, and the turbid Ganges, during its annual inundation, derives more of its sediment from this source than from the waste of the fine clay of the alluvial plains below. On the verge of the tropics, a greater quantity of rain falls annually than at the equator. When Yet parts even of the tropical latitudes are entirely destitute of rain. Peru, for example, which owes its vegetation solely to rivers and nightly dews. In that country, easterly winds prevail, blowing from the Pacific, and these being intercepted by the Andes and cooled as they rise, are made to part with all their moisture before reaching the low region to the leeward. The desert zone of North Africa between latitude 15 degrees and 30 degrees north is another instance of a rainless region. Five or six consecutive years may pass in Upper Egypt, Nubia, or Dongola, or in the desert of Sahara without rain. From the facts above mentioned, the reader will infer that in the course of successive geological periods, there will be great variations in the quantity of rain falling in one and the same region. At one time, there may be none of whatever during the whole year. At another, a fall of 100 or 500 inches. And these two last averages may occur on the two opposite flanks of a mountain chain, not more than 20 miles wide. While, therefore, the valleys in one district are widened and deepened annually, they may remain stationary in another the superficial soil being protected from waste by a dense covering of vegetation. This diversity depends on many geographical circumstances, but principally on the height of the land above the sea, the direction of the prevailing winds, and the relative position, at the time being, of the plains, hills, and the ocean, conditions all of which are liable in the course of ages to undergo a complete revolution recent rain prints. When examining in 1842 the extensive mud flats of Nova Scotia, which are exposed at low tide on the borders of the Bay of Fundy, I observed not only the footprints of birds which had recently passed over the mud, but also very distinct impressions of raindrops. A peculiar combination of circumstances renders these mud flats admirably fitted to receive and retain any markings which may happen to be made on their surface. The sediment with which the waters are charged is extremely fine, being derived from the destruction of cliffs of red sandstone and shale, and as the tides rise 50 feet and upwards, large areas are laid dry for nearly a fortnight between the spring and neap tides. In this interval, the mud is baked in summer by a hot sun, so that it solidifies and becomes traversed by cracks caused by shrinkage. 
Portion of the hardened mud between these cracks may then be taken up and removed without injury. On examining the edges of each slab, we observe numerous layers formed by successive tides, each layer being unusually very thin, sometimes only one-tenth of an inch thick. When a shower of rain falls, the highest portion of the mud-covered flat is usually too hard to receive any impressions, while that recently uncovered by the tide near the water's edge is too soft. Between these areas, a zone occurs, almost as smooth and even as a looking glass, on which every drop forms a cavity of circular or oval form. And if the shower be transient, these pits retain their shape permanently, being dried by the sun, and being then too firm to be effaced by the action of the succeeding tide, which deposits upon them a new layer of mud. Hence, we often find, in splitting open a slab an inch or more thick, on the upper surface of which the marks of recent rain occur, that an inferior layer, deposited during some previous ride of the tide, exhibits on its underside perfect casts of rain prints, which stand out in relief, the molds of the same being seen on the layer below. But in some cases, especially in the more sandy layers, the markings have been somewhat blunted by the tide, and by several rain prints, having been joined into one, by a repetition of drops falling on the same spot, in which case the casts present a very irregular and blistered appearance. The finest examples which I have seen of these rain prints were sent to me by Dr. Webster from Kentville on the borders of the Bay of Mines in Nova Scotia. They were made by a heavy shower which fell on the 21st of July, 1849, when the rise and fall of the tides were at their maximum. The impressions, see figure 13, consist of cup-shaped or hemispherical cavities, the average size of which is from one-eighth to one-tenth of an inch across, but the largest are fully half an inch in diameter and one-tenth of an inch deep. The depth is chiefly below the general surface or plane of stratification, but the walls of the cavity consist partly of a prominent rim of sandy mud formed of the matter which has been forcibly expelled from the pit. All the cavities having an oval form are deeper at one end, where they have also a higher rim, and all the deep ends have the same direction, showing towards which quarter the wind was blowing. Two or more drops are sometimes seen to have interfered with each other, in which case it is usually possible to determine which drop fell last, its rim being unbroken. On some of the specimens, the winding tubular tracks of worms are seen, which have been bored just beneath the surface. See figure 13, left side. They occasionally pass under the middle of a rain mark, having been formed subsequently. Sometimes the worms have dived beneath the surface and then reappeared. All of these appearances, both of rain prints and worm tracks, are of great geological interest, as their exact counterparts are seen in rocks of various ages, even in formations of very high antiquity. Small cavities, often corresponding in size to those produced by rain, are also caused by air bubbles rising up through sand or mud, but these differ in character from rain prints, being usually deeper than they are wide, and having their sides steeper. These, indeed, are occasionally vertical or overarching, the opening at the top being narrower than the pit below. In their mode, also, of mutual interference, they are unlike rain prints. In consequence of the effects of mountains in cooling currents of moist air, and causing the condensation of aqueous vapor in the manner above described, it follows that in every country, as a general rule, the more elevated regions become perpetual reservoirs of water, which descends and irrigates the lower valleys and plains. The largest quantity of water is first carried to the highest region, and then made to descend by steep declivities towards the sea, 
so that it acquires superior velocity and removes more soil than it would do if the rain had been distributed over the plains and mountains equally, in proportion to their relative areas. The water is also made by these means to pass over the greatest distances before it can regain the sea. It has already been observed that in higher latitudes, where the atmosphere being colder is capable of holding less water in suspension, a diminished fall of rain takes place. Thus, at St. Petersburg, the amount is only 16 inches, and at Uliaborg, in the Gulf of Bothnia, northern latitude, 65 degrees, only 13 and a half inches, or less than half the average of England, and even this small quantity descends more slowly in the temperate zone, and is spread more equally over the year than in tropical climates. But in reference to geological changes, Frost in the colder latitude acts as a compensating power in the disintegration of rocks and the transportation of stones to lower levels. Water, when converted into ice, augments in bulk more than one-twentieth of its volume, and owing to this property it widens the minute crevices or joints of rocks into which it penetrates. Ice also in various ways, as will be shown in the next chapter, gives buoyancy to mud and sand, even to huge blocks of stone, enabling rivers of moderate size and velocity to carry them a great distance. The mechanical force exerted by running water in undermining cliffs and rounding off the angles of hard rock is mainly due to the intermixture of foreign ingredients. Sand and pebbles, when hurried along by the violence of the stream, are thrown against every obstacle lying in their way, and thus a power of attrition is acquired, capable of wearing through the hardest siliceous stones, on which water alone could make no impression. End of chapter 14, part 1《Principles of Geology》Chapter 14, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Newly Formed Valleys when traveling in Georgia and Alabama in 1846, I saw in both those states the commencement of hundreds of valleys in places where the native forest had recently been removed. One of these newly formed gullies or ravines is represented in the annexed woodcut, figure 14, from a drawing which I made on the spot. It occurs three miles and a half due west of Milledgeville, the capital of Georgia, and is situated on the farm of Pomona, on the direct road to Macon. Twenty years ago, before the land was cleared, it had no existence, but when the trees of the forest were cut down, cracks three feet deep were caused by the sun's heat in the clay, and during the rains, a sudden rush of water through the principal crack, deepened it at its lowest extremity, from whence the excavating power worked backwards, till in the course of twenty years a chasm, measuring no less than fifty-five feet in depth, three hundred yards in length, and varying in width from twenty to one hundred and eighty feet, was the result. The high road has been several times turned to avoid this cavity, the enlargement of which is still proceeding, and the old line of road may be seen to have held its course directly over what is now the wildest part of the ravine. In the perpendicular walls of this great chasm appear beds of clay and sand, red, white, yellow, and green, produced by the decomposition in situ of hornblendic gneiss, with layers and veins of quartz, which remain entire, to prove that the whole mass was once solid and crystalline. I infer, from the rapidity of the denudation, 
which only began here after the removal of the native wood, that this spot, elevated about 600 feet above the sea, has been always covered with a dense forest from the remote time when it first emerged from the sea. The termination of the cavity on the right hand, in the foreground, is the head or upper end of the ravine, and in almost every case, such gullies are lengthened by the streams cutting their way backwards. The depth at the upper end is often, as in this case, considerable, and there is usually at this point, during floods, a small cascade. Sinuosities of Rivers In proportion as such valleys are widened, sinuosities are caused by the deflection of the stream, first to one side, and then to the other. The unequal hardness of the materials through which the channel is eroded tends partly to give new directions to the lateral force of excavation, when by these or by accidental shiftings of the alluvial matter in the channel, the current is made to cross its current line of descent, it eats out a curve in the opposite bank, or in the side of the hills bounding the valley, from which curve it is turned back again at an equal angle, so that it recrosses the line of descent, and gradually hollows out another curve lower down in the opposite bank, till the whole sides of the valley or riverbed present a succession of salient and retiring angles. Among the causes of deviation from a straight course by which torrents and rivers tend in mountainous regions to widen the valleys through which they flow, may be mentioned the confluence of lateral torrents, swollen irregularly at different seasons by partial storms, and discharging at different times unequal quantities of sand, mud, and pebbles into the main channel. When the tortuous flexures of a river are extremely great, as often happens in alluvial plains, the aberration from the direct line of descent may be restored by the river, cutting through the isthmus, which separates two neighboring curves. Thus, in the annexed diagram, the extreme sinuosity of the river has caused it to return for a brief space in a contrary direction to its main course, so that a peninsula is formed, and the isthmus at A is consumed on both sides by currents flowing in opposite directions. In this case, an island is soon formed, on either side of which a portion of the stream usually remains. Transporting Power of Water In regard to the transporting power of water, we may often be surprised at the facility with which streams of a small size and descending a slight declivity bear along coarse sand and gravel, for we usually estimate the weight of rocks in air and do not reflect on their comparative buoyancy when submerged in a denser fluid. The specific gravity of many rocks is not more than twice that of water, and very rarely more than thrice, so that almost all the fragments propelled by a stream have lost a third, and many of them a half, of what we usually term their weight. It has been proved by experiment, in contradiction to the theories of the earlier writers on hydrostatics, to be a universal law regulating the motion of running water, that the velocity at the bottom of the stream is everywhere less than in any part above it, and is greatest at the surface. Also that the superficial particles in the middle of the stream move swifter than those at the sides. This retardation of the lowest and lateral currents is produced by friction, and when the velocity is sufficiently great, the soil composing the sides and bottom gives way. A velocity of three inches per second at the bottom is ascertained to be sufficient to tear up fine clay, six inches per second, fine sand, twelve inches per second, fine gravel, and three feet per second, stones of the size of an egg. When this mechanical power of running water is considered, we are prepared for the transportation before alluded to of large quantities of gravel, sand, and mud by torrents which descend from mountainous regions. 
But a question naturally arises. How the more tranquil rivers of the valleys and plains, flowing on comparatively level ground, can remove the prodigious burden which is discharged into them by their numerous tributaries, and by what means they are enabled to convey the whole mass to the sea. If they had not this removing power, their channels would be annually choked up, and the valleys of the lower country and plains at the base of mountain chains would be continually strewed over with fragments of rock and sterile sand. But this evil is prevented by a general law regulating the conduct of running water, that two equal streams do not, when united, occupy a bed of double service. Nay, the width of the principal river, after the junction of a tributary, sometimes remains the same as before, or is even lessened. The cause of this apparent paradox was long ago explained by the Italian writers, who had studied the confluence of the Po and its feeders in the plains of Lombardy. The addition of a smaller river augments the velocity of the main stream, often in the same proportion as it does the quantity of water. Thus, the Venetian branch of the Po swallowed up the Farinese branch and that of Panero, without any enlargement of its own dimensions. The cause of the greater velocity is, first, that after the union of two rivers, the water, in place of the friction of four shores, has only that of two to surmount. Secondly, because the main body of the stream, being farther distant from the banks, flows on with less interruption. And lastly, because a greater quantity of water moving more swiftly digs deeper into the river's bed. By this beautiful adjustment, the water which drains the interior country is made continually to occupy less room as it approaches the sea, and thus the most valuable part of our continents, the rich deltas and great alluvial plains, are prevented from being constantly under water. River Floods in Scotland, 1829 Many remarkable illustrations of the power of running water in moving stones and heavy materials were afforded by the storm and floods which occurred on the 3rd and 4th of August, 1829, in Aberdeenshire and other counties in Scotland. The elements during this storm assumed all the characters which mark the tropical hurricanes, the wind blowing in sudden gusts and whirlwinds, the lightning and thunder being such as is rarely witnessed in our climate, and heavy rain falling without intermission. The floods extended almost simultaneously and with equal violence over that part of the northeast of Scotland, which would be cut off by two lines drawn from the head of Loch Rannoch one towards Inverness, and the other to Stonehaven. The united line of the different rivers which were flooded could not be less than from five to seven hundred miles in length, and the whole of their courses were marked by the destruction of bridges, roads, crops, and buildings. Sir T. D. Lauder has recorded the destruction of thirty-eight bridges and the entire obliteration of a great number of farms and hamlets. On the Nairn, a fragment of sandstone, 14 feet long by 3 feet wide and 1 foot thick, was carried above 200 yards down the river. Some new ravines were formed on the sides of mountains where no streams had previously flowed, and ancient river channels, which had never been filled from time immemorial, gave passage to a copious flood. The bridge over the D at Balaterre consisted of five arches, having upon the whole a waterway of 260 feet. The bed of the river, on which the piers rested, was composed of rolled pieces of granite and gneiss. The bridge was built of granite and had stood uninjured for twenty years, but the different parts were swept away in succession by the flood and the whole mass of masonry disappeared in the bed of the river. The River Don, observes Mr. Farr Carson, in his account of the inundations, has upon my own premises forced a mass of four or five hundred tons of stones 
many of them two or three hundred pounds weight, up an inclined plane, rising six feet in eight or ten yards, and left them in a rectangular heap, about three feet deep on a flat ground. The heap ends abruptly at its lower extremity. The power even of a small rivulet, when swollen by rain, in removing heavy bodies, was exemplified in August 1827 in the college, a small stream which flows at a slight declivity from the eastern watershed of the Cheviot Hills. Several thousand tons weight of gravel and sand were transported to the plain of the Till, and a bridge, then in progress of building, was carried away, some of the arch stones of which, weighing from half to three quarters of a ton each, were propelled two miles down the rivulet. On the same occasion, the current tore away from the abutment of a mill dam a large block of greenstone porphyry, weighing nearly two tons, and transported it to the distance of a quarter of a mile. Instances are related as occurring repeatedly, in which from one to three thousand tons of gravel are in like manner removed by the streamlet to still greater distances in one day. Floods Caused by Landslips, 1826 The power which running water may exert in the lapse of ages, in widening and deepening a valley, does not so much depend on the volume and velocity of the stream usually flowing in it, but on the number and magnitude of the obstructions which have at different periods opposed its free passage. If a torrent, however small, be effectually dammed up, the size of the valley above the barrier and its declivity below are not the dimensions of the torrent, will determine the violence of the debacle. If a torrent, however small, be effectually dammed up, the size of the valley above the barrier and its declivity below, and not the dimensions of the torrent, will determine the violence of the debacle. The most universal source of local deluges are landslips, slides, or avalanches, as they are sometimes called, when great masses of rock and soil, or sometimes ice and snow, are precipitated into the bed of a river, the boundary cliffs of which have been thrown down by the shock of an earthquake, or undermined by springs or other causes. Volumes might be filled with the enumeration of instances on record of these terrific catastrophes. I shall therefore select a few examples of recent occurrence, the facts of which are well authenticated. Two dry seasons in the White Mountains in New Hampshire, United States, were followed by heavy rains on the 28th of August, 1826, when from the steep and lofty declivities which rise abruptly on both sides of the river Sacco, innumerable rocks and stones, many of sufficient size to fill a common apartment, were detached, and in their descent swept down before them, in one promiscuous and frightful ruin, forests, shrubs, and the earth which sustained them. Although there are numerous indications on the steep sides of these hills of former slides of the same kind, yet no tradition had been handed down of any similar catastrophe within the memory of man, and the growth of the forest on the very spots now devastated clearly showed that for a long interval nothing similar had occurred. One of these moving masses was afterwards found to have slid three miles with an average breadth of a quarter of a mile. The natural excavations commenced generally in a trench a few yards in depth and a few rods in width, and descended the mountains, widening and deepening, till they became vast chasms. At the base of these hollow ravines was seen a confused mass of ruins, consisting of transported earth, gravel, rocks, and trees. Forests of spruce fir and hemlock, a kind of fur somewhat resembling our yew in foliage, were prostrated with as much ease as if they had been fields of grain, for where they disputed the ground, the torrent of mud and rock accumulated behind, till it gathered sufficient force to burst the temporary barrier. 
The valleys of the Amanusuk and Sacco presented, for many miles, an uninterrupted scene of desolation, all the bridges being carried away as well as those over their tributary streams. In some places, the road was excavated to a depth of from 15 to 20 feet. In others, it was covered with earth, rocks, and trees to as great a height. The water flowed for many weeks after the flood, as densely charged with earth as it could be without being changed into mud, and marks were seen in various localities of its having risen on either side of the valley to more than 25 feet above its ordinary level. Many sheep and cattle were swept away, and the Willie family, nine in number, who in alarm had deserted their house, were destroyed on the banks of the Sacco. Seven of their mangled bodies were afterwards found near the river, buried beneath driftwood and mountain ruins. Eleven years after the event, the deep channels worn by the avalanches of mud and stone and the immense heaps of boulders and blocks of granite in the river channel, still formed, says Professor Hubbard, a picturesque feature of the scenery. When I visited the country in 1845, eight years after Professor Hubbard, I found the signs of devastation still very striking. I also particularly remarked that although the surface of the bare granitic rocks had been smoothed by the passage over them of so much mud and stone, there were no continuous parallel and rectilinear furrows, nor any of the fine scratches or strii which characterize glacial action. The absence of these is nowhere more clearly exemplified than in the bare rocks over which passed the great Willie Slide of 1826. But the catastrophes in the White Mountains were insignificant when compared to those which are occasioned by earthquakes, when the boundary hills, for miles in length, are thrown down into the hollow of a valley. I shall have opportunities of alluding to inundations of this kind when treating expressly of earthquakes, and shall content myself at present with selecting an example of a flood due to a different cause. Flood in the Valley of Ban, 1818 The Valley of Ban is one of the largest of the lateral embranchments of the main valley of the Rhone, above the Lake of Geneva. Its upper portion was, in 1818, converted into a lake by the damming up of a narrow pass, by avalanches of snow and ice precipitated from an elevated glacier into the bed of the river Dransa. In the winter season, during continued frost, scarcely any water flows in the bed of this river to preserve an open channel, so that the ice barrier remained entire until the melting of the snows in spring, when a lake was formed above, about half a league in length, which finally attained in some parts a depth of about 200 feet and a width of about 700 feet. To prevent or lessen the mischief apprehended from the sudden bursting of the barrier, an artificial gallery, 700 feet in length, was cut through the ice before the waters had risen to a great height. When at length they accumulated and flowed through this tunnel, they dissolved the ice and thus deepened their channel until nearly half of the whole contents of the lake were slowly drained off. But at length, on the approach of the hot season, the central portion of the remaining mass of ice gave way with a tremendous crash, and the residue of the lake was emptied in half an hour. In the course of its descent, the waters encountered several narrow gorges, and at each of these they rose to a great height, and then burst with new violence into the next basin, sweeping along rocks, forests, houses, bridges, and cultivated land. For the greater part of its course, the flood resembled a moving mass of rock and mud, rather than of water. Some fragments of granitic rocks of enormous magnitude, and which from their dimensions might be compared without exaggeration to houses, were torn out of a more ancient alluvian 
and borne down for a quarter of a mile. One of the fragments moved was sixty paces in circumference. The velocity of the water in the first part of its course was thirty-three feet per second, which diminished to six feet before it reached the Lake of Geneva, where it arrived in six hours and a half, the distance being forty-five miles. This flood left behind it on the plains of Martinique, thousands of trees torn up by the roots, together with the ruins of buildings. Some of the houses in that town were filled with mud up to the second story. After expanding in the plain of Martigny, it entered the Rhone and did no farther damage, but some bodies of men, who had been drowned above Martigny, were afterwards found at the distance of about thirty miles, floating on the larger side of the Lake of Geneva, near Vevey. The waters, on escaping from the temporary lake, intermixed with mud and rock, swept along for the first four miles at the rate of about twenty miles an hour, and M. Escher, the engineer, calculated that the flood furnished 300,000 cubic feet of water every second, an efflux which is five times greater than that of the Rhine below Basel. Now, if part of the lake had not been gradually drained off, the flood would have been nearly double, approaching in volume to some of the largest rivers in Europe. It is evident, therefore, that when we are speculating on the excavating force which a river may have exerted in any particular valley, the most important question is not the volume of the existing stream, nor the present levels of its channel, nor even the nature of the rocks, but the probability of a succession of floods at some period since the time when the valley may have been first elevated above the sea. For several months after the debacle of 1818, the Dranse, having no settled channel, shifted its position continually from one side to the other of the valley, carrying away newly erected bridges, undermining houses, and continuing to be charged with as large a quantity of earthy matter as the fluid could hold in suspension. I visited this valley four times after the flood, and was witness to the sweeping away of a bridge and the undermining of part of a house. The greater part of the ice barrier was then standing, presenting vertical cliffs 150 feet high, like ravines in the lava currents of Etna or Auvergne where they are intersected by rivers. Inundations, precisely similar, are recorded to have occurred at former periods in this district, and from the same cause. In 1595, for example, a lake burst, and the waters descending with irresistible fury destroyed the town of Martigny, where from 60 to 80 persons perished. In a similar flood 50 years before, 140 persons were drowned. End of chapter 14, part 2. The Principles of Geology. Chapter 14, part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Flood at Tivoli, 1826 I shall conclude with one more example, derived from a land of classic recollections, the ancient Tiber, and which, like all the other inundations above alluded to, occurred within the present century. The younger Pliny, it will be remembered, describes a flood on the Aeneo, which destroyed woods, rocks, and houses, with the most sumptuous villas and works of art. For four or five centuries consecutively, this headlong stream, as Horace truly called it, has often remained within its bounds, and then, after so long an interval of rest, has at different periods inundated its banks again, and widened its channel. 
The last of these catastrophes happened 15th of November, 1826, after heavy rains, such as produced the floods before alluded to in Scotland. The waters appear also to have been impeded by an artificial dike by which they were separated into two parts, a short distance above Tivoli. They broke through this dike, and leaving the left trench dry, precipitated themselves with their whole weight on the right side. Here they undermined, in the course of a few hours, a high cliff, and widened the river's channel about fifteen paces. On this height stood the church of St. Lucia, and about thirty-six houses of the town of Tivoli, which were all carried away, presenting as they sank into the roaring flood a terrific scene of destruction to the spectators on the opposite bank. As the foundations were gradually removed, each building, some of them edifices of considerable height, was first traversed with numerous rents, which soon widened into large fissures, until at length the roofs fell in with a crash, and then the walls sunk into the river and were hurled down the cataract below. The destroying agency of the flood came within two hundred yards of the precipice on which the beautiful Temple of Vesta stands, but fortunately this precious relic of antiquity was spared, while the wreck of modern structures was hurled down the abyss. Vesta, it will be remembered, in the heathen mythology, personified the stability of the earth, and when the Samian astronomer Aristarchus first taught that the earth revolved on its axis and round the sun, he was publicly accused of impiety, quote, for removing the everlasting Vesta from her place, end quote. Playfair observed that when Hutton ascribed instability to the earth's surface, and represented the continents which we inhabit as the theater of incessant change and movement, his antagonists, who regarded them as unalterable, assailed him in a similar manner with accusations founded on religious prejudices. We might appeal to the excavating power of the Aeneo as corroborative of one of the most controverted parts of the Huttonian theory, and if the days of omens had not gone by, the geologists who now worship Vesta might regard the late catastrophe as portentous. We may, at least, recommend the modern votaries of the goddess to lose no time in making a pilgrimage to her shrine, for the next flood may not respect the temple. Excavation of Rocks by Running Water the rapidity with which even the smallest streams hollow out deep channels in soft and destructible soils is remarkably exemplified in volcanic countries, where the sand and half-consolidated tufts, opposed by a slight resistance to the torrents which descend the mountainside. After the heavy rains which followed the eruption of Vesuvius in 1824, the water flowing from the Atrio de Cavallo cut in three days, a new chasm through strata of tough and ejected volcanic matter to the depth of 25 feet. I found the old Mule Road in 1828 intersected by this new ravine. The gradual erosion of deep chasms through some of the hardest rocks by the constant passage of running water charged with foreign matter is another phenomenon of which striking examples may be adduced. Illustrations of this excavating power are presented by many valleys in central France where the channels of rivers have been barred up by solid currents of lava, through which the streams have re-excavated a passage to the depth of from 20 to 70 feet and upwards, and often of great width. In these cases, there are decisive proofs that neither the sea, nor any denuding wave or extraordinary body of water has passed over the spot since the melted lava was consolidated. Every hypothesis of the intervention of sudden and violent agency is entirely excluded, because the cones of loose scoriae, out of which the lavas flowed, 
are oftentimes at no great elevation above the rivers, and have remained undisturbed during the whole period which has been sufficient for the hollowing out of such enormous ravines. Recent Excavation by the Semeto But I shall at present confine myself to examples derived from events which have happened since the time of history. At the western base of Etna, a current of lava, figure 16, descending from near the summit of the great volcano, has flowed to the distance of five or six miles, and then reached the alluvial plain of the Semeto, the largest of the Sicilian rivers, which skirts the base of Etna and falls into the sea a few miles south of Catania. The lava entered the river about three miles above the town of Aderno, and not only occupied its channel for some distance, but, crossing to the opposite side of the valley, accumulated there in a rocky mass. Gamalero gives the year 1603 as the date of the eruption. The appearance of the current clearly proves that it is one of the most modern of those of Etna, for it has not been covered or crossed by subsequent streams or ejections, and the olives which have been planted on its surface were all of small size when I examined the spot, in 1828, yet they were older than the natural wood on the same lava. In the course, therefore, of about two centuries, the Semeto had eroded a passage from fifty to several hundred feet wide, and in some parts from forty to fifty feet deep. The portion of lava cut through is in no part porous or scoriaceous, but consists of a compact homogeneous mass of hard blue rock, somewhat inferior in weight to ordinary basalt, and containing crystals of olivine and glassy felspar. The general declivity of this part of the bed of the Semeto is not considerable, but in consequence of the unequal waste of the lava, two waterfalls occur at Passo Manzanelli, each about six feet in height. Here the chasm, B, figure 16, is about 40 feet deep and only 50 broad. The sand and pebbles in the riverbed consist chiefly of a brown quartzo's sandstone derived from the upper country, but the materials of the volcanic rock itself must have greatly assisted the attrition. This river, like the Caltabiano, on the eastern side of Etna, has not yet cut down to the ancient bed of which it was dispossessed, and of which the probable position is indicated in the annexed diagram. See figure 16. On entering the narrow ravine, where the water foams down the two cataracts, we are entirely shut out from all view of the surrounding country, and a geologist who is accustomed to associate the characteristic features of the landscape with the relative age of certain rocks can scarcely dissuade himself from the belief that he is contemplating a scene in some rocky gorge of a primary district. The external forms of the hard blue lava are as massive as any of the most ancient trap rocks of Scotland. The solid surface is in some parts smooth and almost polished by attrition, and covered in others with a white lichen, which imparts to it an air of extreme antiquity, so as greatly to heighten the delusion. But the moment we reascend the cliff, the spell is broken, for we scarcely recede a few paces before the ravine and river disappear, and we stand on the black and rugged surface of a vast current of lava which seems unbroken, and which we can trace up nearly to the distant summit of that majestic cone which Pindar called the Pillar of Heaven, and which still continues to send forth a fleecy wreath of vapor, reminding us that its fires are not extinct, and that it may again give out a rocky stream wherein other scenes like that now described may present themselves to future observers. Falls of Niagara. 
The Falls of Niagara afford a magnificent example of the progressive excavation of a deep valley in solid rock. That river flows over a flat tableland, in a depression of which Lake Erie is situated. Where it issues from the lake, it is clearly a mile in width and 330 feet above Lake Ontario, which is about 30 miles distant. For the first 15 miles below Lake Erie, the surrounding country, comprising Upper Canada on the west and the state of New York on the east, is almost on a level with its banks, and nowhere more than 30 or 40 feet above them, see figure 17. The river being occasionally interspersed with low wooded islands, and having sometimes a width of three miles, glides along at first with a clear, smooth, and tranquil current, falling only fifteen feet in as many miles, and in this part of its course resembling an arm of Lake Erie. But its character is afterwards entirely changed on approaching the rapids, where it begins to rush and foam over a rocky and uneven limestone bottom for the space of nearly a mile, till at length it is thrown down perpendicularly 160 feet at the falls. Here the river is divided into two sheets of water by an island, the largest cataract being more than a third of a mile broad, the smaller one having a breadth of 600 feet. When the water has precipitated itself into an unfathomable pool, it rushes with great velocity down the sloping bottom of a narrow chasm for a distance of seven miles. This ravine varies from 200 to 400 yards in width from cliff to cliff, contrasting therefore strongly in its breadth with that of the river above. Its depth is from 200 to 300 feet, and it intersects for about seven miles the table land before described, which terminates suddenly at Queenstown in an escarpment or long line of inland cliff facing northwards toward Lake Ontario. The Niagara, on reaching the escarpment and issuing from the gorge, enters the flat country, which is so nearly on a level with Lake Ontario that there is only a fall of about four feet in the seven additional miles which intervene between Queenstown and the shores of that lake. It has long been the popular belief that the Niagara once flowed in a shallow valley across the whole platform, from the present site of the falls to the escarpment called the Queenstown Heights, where it is supposed that the cataract was first situated, and that the river has been slowly eating its way backwards through the rocks for the distance of seven miles. This hypothesis naturally suggests itself to every observer, who sees the narrowness of the gorge at its termination, and throughout its whole course, as far up as the falls, above which point the river expands as before stated. The boundary cliffs of the ravine are usually perpendicular, and in many places undermined on one side by the impetuous stream. The uppermost rock of the tableland at the falls consists of hard limestone, a member of the Silurian series, about 90 feet thick, beneath which lie soft shales of equal thickness, continually undermined by the action of the spray, which rises from the pool into which so large a body of water is projected, and is driven violently by gusts of wind against the base of the precipice. In consequence of this action, and that of frost, the shale disintegrates and crumbles away, and portions of the incumbent rock overhang forty feet, and often, when unsupported, tumble down, so that the falls do not remain absolutely stationary at the same spot, even for half a century. Accounts have come down to us from the earliest period of observation of the frequent destruction of these rocks, and the sudden descent of huge fragments in 1818 and 1828, are said to have shaken the adjacent country like an earthquake. The earliest travelers, Hennepin and Kalm, who in 1678 and 1751 visited the falls, 
and publish views of them, attest the fact that the rocks have been suffering from dilapidation for more than a century and a half, and that some slight changes, even in the scenery of the cataract, have been brought about within that time. The idea, therefore, of perpetual and progressive waste is constantly present to the mind of every beholder, and as that part of the chasm which has been the work of the last hundred and fifty years resembles precisely in depth, width, and character, the rest of the gorge which extends seven miles below, it is most natural to infer that the entire ravine has been hollowed out in the same manner by the recession of the cataract. It must at least be conceded that the river supplies an adequate cause for executing the whole task thus assigned to it, providing we grant sufficient time for its completion. As this part of the country was a wilderness till near the end of the last century, we can obtain no accurate data for estimating the exact rate at which the cataract has been receding. Mr. Bakewell, son of the eminent geologist of that name, who visited the Niagara in 1829, made the first attempt to calculate from the observations of one who had lived 40 years at the falls, and who had been the first settler there, that the cataract had during that period gone back about a yard annually. But after the most careful inquiries, which I was able to make during my visit to the spot in 1841-2, to I came to the conclusion that the average of one foot a year would be a much more probable conjecture. In that case, it would have required 35,000 years for the retreat of the falls from the escarpment of Queenstown to their present site. It seems by no means improbable that such a result would be no exaggeration of the truth, although we cannot assume that the retrograde movement has been uniform. An examination of the geological structure of the district as laid open in the ravine, shows that at every step in the process of excavation, the height of the precipice, the hardness of the materials at its base, and the quantity of fallen matter to be removed must have varied. At some points it may have receded much faster than at present, but in general its progress was probably slower, because the cataract, when it began to recede, must have had nearly twice its present height. From observations made by me in 1841, when I had the advantage of being accompanied by Mr. Hall, state geologist of New York, and in 1842, when I re-examined the Niagara district, I obtained geological evidence of the former existence of an old riverbed, which, I have no doubt, indicates the original channel through which the waters once flowed from the falls to Queenstown, at the height of nearly 300 feet above the bottom of the present gorge. The geological monuments alluded to consist of patches of sand and gravel 40 feet thick, containing fluviatile shells of the genera Unio, Cyclus, Melania, etc., such as now inhabit the waters of the Niagara above the falls. The identity of the fossil species with the recent is unquestionable, and these freshwater deposits occur at the edge of the cliffs bounding the ravine, so that they prove the former extension of an elevated shallow valley four miles below the falls, a distinct prolongation of that now occupied by the Niagara, in the elevated region intervening between Lake Erie and the falls. Whatever theory be framed for the hollowing out of the ravine further down, or for the three miles which intervene between the Whirlpool and Queenstown, it will always be necessary to suppose the former existence of a barrier of rock, not of loose and destructive materials, such as those composing the drift in this district, somewhere immediately below the whirlpool. By that barrier, the waters were held back for ages when the fluviatile deposit, 40 feet in thickness and 250 feet above the present channel of the river, originated. 
If we are led by this evidence to admit that the cataract has cut back its way for four miles, we can have little hesitation in referring the excavation of the remaining three miles below to a like agency, the shape of the chasm being precisely similar. There have been many speculations respecting the future recession of the falls and the deluge that might be occasioned by the sudden escape of the waters of Lake Erie if the ravine should ever be prolonged 16 miles backwards. But a more accurate knowledge of the geological succession of the rocks brought to light by the state survey has satisfied every geologist that the falls would diminish gradually in height before they traveled back two miles, and in consequence of a gentle dip of the strata to the south, the massive limestone, now at the top, would then be at their base, and would retard and perhaps put an effectual stop to the excavating process. End of chapter 14, part 3「Chapter 15, Part 1 of Principles of Geology」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Chapter 15 – Transportation of Solid Matter by Ice Carrying Power of River Ice Rocks annually conveyed into the St. Lawrence by its tributaries. Ground ice. Its origin and transporting power. Glaciers. Theory of their downward movement. Smoothed and grooved rocks. The moraine unstratified. Icebergs covered with mud and stones. Limits of glaciers and icebergs. Their effects on the bottom when they run aground packing of coast ice, boulders drifted by ice on the coast of Labrador, and blocks moved by ice in the Baltic. The power of running water to carry sand, gravel, and fragments of rock to considerable distances is greatly augmented in those regions where, during some part of the year, the frost is of sufficient intensity to convert the water, either at the surface or bottom of rivers, into ice. This subject may be considered under three different heads— First, the effect of surface ice and ground ice in enabling streams to remove gravel and stones to a distance. Secondly, the action of glaciers in the transport of boulders and in the polishing and scratching of rocks. Thirdly, the floating off of glaciers charged with solid matter into the sea and the drifting of icebergs and coast ice. River Ice Pebbles and small pieces of rock may be seen entangled in ice and floating annually down the Tay in Scotland, as far as the mouth of that river. Similar observations might doubtless be made respecting almost all the larger rivers of England and Scotland. But there seems reason to suspect that the principal transfer from place to place of pebbles and stones adhering to ice goes on unseen by us under water. For although the specific gravity of the compound mass may cause it to sink, it may still be very buoyant, and easily borne along by a feeble current. The ice, moreover, melts very slowly at the bottom of running streams in winter, as the water there is often nearly at the freezing point, as will be seen from what will be said in the sequel of ground ice. As we traverse Europe in the latitudes of Great Britain, we find the winters more severe, and the rivers more regularly frozen over. M. La Rivery relates that, being at Memel in the Baltic in 1821, when the ice of the river Neiman broke up, he saw a mass of ice thirty feet long which had descended the stream and had been thrown ashore. In the middle of it was a triangular piece of granite about a yard in diameter, resembling in composition the red granite of Finland. 
when rivers in the northern hemisphere flow from south to north the ice first breaks up in the higher part of their course and the flooded waters bearing along large icy fragments often arrive at parts of the stream which are still firmly frozen over great inundations are thus frequently occasioned by the obstructions thrown in the way of the descending waters as in the case of the mackenzie in north america and the Irtish, obi yanisi lena and other rivers of siberia a partial stoppage of this kind lately occurred on january thirty first of eighteen forty in the vistula about a mile and a half above the city of danzig where the river choked up by packed ice was made to take a new course over its right bank so that it hollowed out in a few days a deep and broad channel many leagues in length through a tract of sand hills which were from forty to sixty feet high in canada where the winter's cold is intense in a latitude corresponding to that of central france several tributaries of the st lawrence begin to thaw in their upper course while they remain frozen over lower down and thus large slabs of ice are set free and thrown upon the unbreaking sheet of ice below then begins what is called the packing of the drifted fragments that is to say one slab is made to slide over another until a vast pile is built up and the whole thing being frozen together is urged onwards by the force of the dammed up waters and drift ice thus propelled it not only forces along boulders but breaks off from cliffs which border the rivers huge pieces of projecting rock by this means several buttresses of solid masonry which up to the year eighteen thirty six supported a wooden bridge on the st maurice which falls into the st lawrence near the town of the tree riviere latitude forty six degrees twenty minutes were thrown down and conveyed by the ice into the main river and instances have occurred at montreal of wharfs and stone buildings from thirty to fifty feet square having been removed in a similar manner we learn from captain bayfield that anchors laid down within high water mark to secure vessels hauled on shore for the winter must be cut out of the ice on the approach of spring or they would be carried away in 1834, the Gulnare's bower anchor, weighing half a ton, was transported some yards by the ice, and so firmly was it fixed that the force of the moving ice broke a chain cable suited for a ten-gun brig, and which had rowed the Gulnare during the heaviest gales in the Gulf. Had not this anchor been cut out of the ice, it would have been earned into deep water and lost the scene represented in the annexed plate from a drawing by lieutenant bowen r n will enable the reader to comprehend the incessant changes which the transport of boulders produces annually on the low islands shores and bed of the st lawrence above quebec the fundamental rocks at richelieu rapid situated in latitude forty six degrees north are limestone and slate which are seen at low water to be covered with boulders of granite these boulders owe their spheroidal form chiefly to weathering or action of frost which causes the surface to exfoliate in concentric plates so that all the more prominent angles are removed at the point a is a cavity in the mud or sand of the beach now filled with water which was occupied during the preceding winter of eighteen thirty five by the huge erratic b a mass of granite seventy tons weight found in the spring following eighteen thirty six at a distance of several feet from its former position many small islands are seen on the river such as c and d which afford still more striking proofs of the carrying and propelling power of ice these islets are never under water yet every winter ice is thrown upon them in such abundance that it packs to the height of twenty and even thirty feet bringing with it a continual supply of large stones or boulders and carrying away others the greatest number being deposited according to lieutenant bowen on the edge of deep water on the island d on the left of the accompanying view a lighthouse is represented consisting of a square wooden building 
which having no other foundation than the boulders requires to be taken down every winter and rebuilt on the reopening of the river these effects of frost which are so striking on the st lawrence above quebec are by no means displayed on a smaller scale below that city where the gulf rises and falls with the tide on the contrary it is the estuary between the latitudes of forty seven and forty nine degrees that the greatest quantity of gravel and boulders of large dimensions are carried down annually towards the sea here the frost is so intense that a dense sheet of ice is formed at low water which on the rise of the tide is lifted up broken and thrown in heaps on the extensive shoals which border the estuary when the tide recedes this packed ice is exposed to a temperature sometimes thirty degrees below zero which freezes together all the loose pieces of ice as well as the granite and other boulders the whole of these are often swept away by a high tide or when the river is swollen by the melting of the snow in spring one huge block of granite fifteen feet long by ten feet both in width and height and estimated to contain fifteen hundred cubic feet was conveyed in this manner to some distance in the year eighteen thirty seven its previous position being well known as up to that time it had been used by captain bayfield as a mark for the surveying station ground ice when a current of cold air passes over the surface of a lake or stream it abstracts from it a quantity of heat and the specific gravity of the water being thereby increased the cooled portion sinks this circulation may continue until the whole body of fluid has been cooled down to the temperature of forty degrees fahrenheit after which if the cold increase the vertical movement ceases the water which is uppermost expands and floats over the heavier fluid below and when it has attained a temperature of thirty two degrees fahrenheit it sets into a sheet of ice it should seem therefore impossible according to this law of congelation that ice should ever form at the bottom of a river and yet such is the fact and many speculations have been hazard to account for so singular a phenomenon m arago is of opinion that the mechanical action of a running stream produces a circulation by which the entire body of water is mixed up together and cooled alike and the whole being thus reduced to the freezing point ice begins to form at the bottom for two reasons first because there is less motion there and secondly because the water is in contact with solid rock or pebbles which have a cold surface whatever explanation we adopt there is no doubt of the fact that in countries where the intensity and duration of cold is great rivers and torrents acquire an increase of carrying power by the formation of what is called ground ice even in the thames we learn from dr plot that pieces of this kind of ice having gravel frozen on their underside rise up from the bottom in winter and float on the surface in the siberian rivers whites describes large stones as having been brought up from the river's bed in the same manner and made to float glaciers in the temperate zone the snow lies for months in winter on the summit of every high mountain while in the arctic regions a long summer's day of half a year's duration is insufficient to melt the snow even on land just raised above the level of the sea it is therefore not surprising since the atmosphere becomes colder in proportion as we ascend in it that there should be heights even in tropical countries where the snow never melts the lowest limit to which the perpetual snow extends downwards from the tops of mountains at the equator is an elevation of not less than sixteen thousand feet above sea while in the swiss alps in latitude forty six degree north it reaches as low as eighty five hundred feet above the same level the loftier peaks of the alpine chain being from twelve to fifteen thousand feet high 
the frozen mass augmenting from year to year would add indefinitely to the altitude of alpine summits were it not relieved by its descent through the larger and deeper valleys to regions far below the general snow line to these it slowly finds its way in the form of rivers of ice called glaciers the consolidation of which is produced by pressure and by the congelation of water infiltered into the porous mass which is always undergoing partial liquefaction and receiving in summer occasional showers of rain on its surface in a day of hot sunshine or mild rain innumerable rills of pure and sparkling water run in icy channels along the surface of the glaciers which in the night shrink and come to nothing they are often precipitated in bold cascades into deep fissures in the ice and contribute together with springs to form torrents which flow in tunnels at the bottom of the glaciers for many a league and at length issue at their extremities from beneath beautiful caverns or arches the waters of these streams are always densely charged with the finest mud produced by the grinding of rock and sand under the weight of the moving mass the length of the swiss glaciers is sometimes twenty miles their width in the middle portion where they are broadest occasionally two or three miles their depth or thickness sometimes more than six hundred feet when they descend steep slopes and precipices or are forced through narrow gorges the ice is broken up and assumes the most fantastic and picturesque forms with lofty peaks and pinnacles projecting above the general level these snow-white masses are often relieved by a dark background of pines as in the valley of the chamonix and are not only surrounded with abundance of the wild rhododendron in full flower but encroach still lower into the region of cultivation and trespass on fields where the tobacco plant is flourishing by the side of the peasant's hut the cause of glacier motion has of late been a subject of careful investigation and much keen controversy although a question of physics rather than of geology it is too interesting to allow me to pass it by without some brief mention de Sachur, whose travels in the alps are full of original observations as well as sound and comprehensive general views conceived that the weight of the ice might be sufficient to urge it down the slope of the valley if the sliding motion were aided by the water flowing at the bottom for this gravitation theory chapentier followed by agassiz substituted the hypothesis of dilation the most solid ice is always permeable to water and penetrated by innumerable fissures and capillary tubes often extremely minute these tubes imbibe the aqueous fluid during the day which freezes it is said in the cold of the night and expands in the act of congelation the distension of the whole mass exerts an immense force tending to propel the glacier in the direction of least resistance in other words down the valley this theory was opposed by mr hopkins on mathematical and mechanical grounds in several able papers among other objections he pointed out that the friction of so enormous a body as a glacier on its bed is so great that the vertical direction would always be that of least resistance and if a considerable distension of the mass should take place by the action of freezing it would tend to increase its thickness rather than accelerate its downward progress he also contended and his arguments were illustrated by many ingenious experiments that a glacier can move along an extremely slight slope solely by the influence of gravitation owing to the constant dissolution of ice in contact with the rocky bottom and the number of separate fragments into which the glacier is divided by fissures so that freedom of motion is imparted to its several parts somewhat resembling that of an imperfect fluid to this view professor james forbes objected that gravitation would not supply an adequate cause for the sliding of solid ice down slopes having an inclination of no more than four or five degrees still less would it explain how the glacier advances where the channel expands and contracts 
the myrrh de glace in chamonix for example after being two thousand yards wide passes through a strait only nine hundred yards in width such a gorge it is contended would be choked up by the advance of any solid mass even if it be broken up into numerous fragments the same acute observer remarked that water in the fissures and pores of glaciers cannot and does not part with its latent heat so as to freeze every night to a great depth or far in the interior of the mass had the dilation theory been true the chief motion of the glacier would have occurred about sunset when the freezing of the water must be greatest and it had in fact been first assumed by those who favored that hypothesis that the mass moved faster at the sides where the melting of the ice was promoted by the sun's heat reflected from boundary precipices Agassiz appears to have been the first to commence in 1841, aided by a skillful engineer, M. Escher de la Linth, a series of exact measurements to ascertain the laws of glacier motion, and he soon discovered, contrary to his preconceived notions, that the stream of ice is moved more slowly at the sides than at the center, and faster in the middle region of the glacier than at its extremity. Professor James Forbes, who had joined Mr. Agassiz during his earlier investigations in the Alps, undertook himself an independent series of experiments, which he followed up with great perseverance to determine the laws of glacier motion. These he found to agree very closely with the laws governing the course of rivers, their progress being greater in the center than at the sides, and more rapid at the surface than at the bottom this fact was verified by carefully fixing a great number of marks in the ice arranged in a straight line which gradually assumed a beautiful curve the middle part pointing down the glacier and showing a velocity there double or treble that of the lateral parts he ascertained that the rate of advance by night was nearly the same as by day and that even the hourly march of the icy stream could be detected, although the progress might not amount to more than six or seven inches in twelve hours. By the incessant, though invisible, advance of the marks placed on the ice, time, says Mr. Forbes, was marked out as by a shadow on a dial, and the unequivocal evidence which I obtained, that even while walking on a glacier we are, day by day and hour by hour, imperceptibly carried on by the resistless flow of the icy stream filled me with admiration in order to explain this remarkable regularity of motion and its obedience to laws so strictly analogous to those of fluids the same writer proposed the theory that the ice instead of being solid and compact is a viscous or plastic body capable of yielding to great pressure and the more so in proportion as its temperature is highest and as it approaches more nearly to the melting point he endeavors to show that this hypothesis will account for many complicated phenomena especially for a ribboned or veined structure which is everywhere observable in the ice and might be produced by lines of discontinuity arising from the different rates at which the various portions of the semi-rigid glacier advance and pass each other many examples are adduced to prove that a glacier can model itself to the form of the ground over which it is forced exactly as would happen if it possessed a certain docility and this power of yielding under intense pressure is shown not to be irreconcilable with the idea of the ice being sufficiently compact to break it into fragments when the strain upon its parts is excessive as where the glacier turns a sharp angle or descends upon a rapid or convex slope the increased velocity in summer is attributed partly to the greater plasticity of the ice when not exposed to intense cold and partly to the hydrostatic pressure of the water in the capillary tubes which imbibe more of this liquid in the hot season on the assumption of the ice being a rigid mass mr hopkins attributed the more rapid motions in the centre to the unequal rate at which the broad stripes of ice intervening between longitudinal fissures advance 
but besides that there are parts of the glacier where no such fissures exist such a mode of progression says mr forbes would cause the borders of large transverse rents or crevices to be jagged like a saw instead of being perfectly even and straight-edged an experiment recently made by mr christie secretary to the royal society appears to demonstrate that ice under great pressure possesses a sufficient degree of moulding and self-adapting power to allow it to be acted upon as if it were a pasty substance a hollow shell of iron an inch and a half thick the interior being ten inches in diameter was filled with water in the course of a severe winter and exposed to the frost with the fuse hole uppermost a portion of the water expanded in freezing so as to protrude a cylinder of ice from the fuse hole and this cylinder continued to grow inch by inch in proportion as the central nucleus of water froze as we cannot doubt that an outer shell of ice is first formed and then another within the continued rise of the column through the fuse hole must proceed from the squeezing of successive shells of ice concentrically formed through the narrow orifice and yet the protruded cylinder consisted of entire and not fragmentary ice End of chapter fifteen part one Chapter 15, Part 2 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter 15, Part 2. The agency of glaciers in producing permanent geological changes consists partly in their power of transporting gravel, sand, and huge stones to great distances, and partly in the smoothing, polishing, and scoring of their rocky channels, and the boundary walls of the valleys through which they pass. At the foot of every steep cliff or precipice in high alpine regions, a talus is seen of rocky fragments detached by the alternate action of frost and thaw. If these loose masses, instead of accumulating on a stationary base, happen to fall upon a glacier, they will move along with it, and, in place of a single heap, they will form in the course of years a long stream of blocks. If a glacier be twenty miles long and its annual progression about five hundred feet, it will require about two centuries for a block thus lodged upon its surface to travel down from the higher to the lower regions or to the extremity of icy mass. This terminal point remains usually unchanged from year to year, although every part of the ice is in motion, because the liquefaction by heat is just sufficient to balance the onward movement of the glacier, which may be compared to an endless file of soldiers pouring into a breach and shot down as fast as they advance. The stones carried along on the ice are called in Switzerland the moraines of the glacier. There is always one line of blocks on each side or edge of the icy stream, and often several in the middle, where they are arranged in long ridges or mounds, often several yards high. The cause of these medial moraines was first explained by Agassiz, who referred them to the confluence of tributary glaciers. Upon the union of two streams of ice, the right lateral moraine of one of the streams comes in contact with the left lateral moraine of the other, and they afterwards move on together in the center if the confluent glaciers are equal in size, or nearer to one side if unequal. All sand and fragments of soft stone which fall through fissures and reach the bottom of the glaciers, or which are interposed between the glacier and the steep sides of the valley, are pushed along and ground down into mud, while the larger and harder fragments have their angles worn off. At the same time, the fundamental and boundary rocks are smoothed and polished, and often scored with parallel furrows, or with lines and scratches produced by hard minerals, such as crystals of quartz, which act like diamond upon glass. 
this effect is perfectly different from that caused by the action of water or a muddy torrent forcing along heavy fragments for when stones are fixed firmly in the ice and pushed along by it under great pressure in straight lines they scoop out long rectilinear furrows or grooves parallel to each other the discovery of such markings at various heights far above the surface of the existing glaciers and for miles beyond their present terminations affords geological evidence of the former extension of the ice beyond its present limits in switzerland and other countries the moraine of the glacier observed chapentier is entirely devoid of stratification for there has been no sorting of the materials, as in the case of sand, mud, and pebbles, when deposited by running water. The ice transports indifferently, and to the same spots, the heaviest blocks and the finest particles, mingling all together, and leaving them in one confused and promiscuous heap wherever it melts. Icebergs in countries situated in high northern latitudes like spitzbergen between seventy and eighty degrees north glaciers loaded with mud and rock descend to the sea and there huge fragments of them float off and become icebergs scoresby counted five hundred of these bergs drifting along in latitudes of sixty nine and seventy degrees north which rose above the surface from the height of one to two hundred feet and measured from a few yards to a mile in circumference many of them were loaded with beds of earth and rock of such thickness that the weight was conjectured to be from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand tons specimens of the rocks were obtained and among them were granite gneiss mica schist clay slate granular felspar and greenstone such bergs must be of great magnitude because the mass of ice below the level of the water is about eight times greater than of above wherever they are dissolved it is evident that the moraine will fall to the bottom of the sea in this manner may submarine valleys mountains and platforms become strewed over with gravel sand mud and scattered blocks of foreign rock of a nature perfectly dissimilar from all in the vicinity and which may have been transported across unfathomable abysses if the bergs happen to melt in still water so that the earthy and stony materials may fall tranquilly to the bottom the deposit will probably be unstratified like the terminal moraine of a glacier but whenever the materials are under the influence of a current of water as they fall they will be sorted and arranged according to their relative weight and size and therefore more or less perfectly stratified in a former chapter it was stated that some ice islands have been known to drift from baffin's bay to the azores and from the south pole to the immediate neighborhood of the cape of good hope so that the area over which the effects of moving ice may be experienced comprehends a large portion of the globe we learn from von buch that the most southern point on the continent of europe at which a glacier comes down to the sea is in norway in latitude sixty seven degrees north but mr darwin has shown that they extend to the sea in south america in latitudes more than twenty degrees nearer to the equator than in europe as for example in chile where in the gulf of penas latitude forty six degrees forty minutes south or in the latitude of central france and in sir george erie's sound and the latitude of paris they give origin to icebergs which were seen in eighteen thirty four carrying angular pieces of granite and stranding them in fjords where the shores were composed of clay slate a large proportion however of the ice islands seen floating both in the northern and southern hemispheres are probably not generated by glaciers but rather by the accumulation of coast ice when the sea freezes at the base of a lofty precipice the sheet of ice is prevented from adhering to the land by the rise and fall of the tide nevertheless it often continues on to the shore at the foot of the cliff and receives ascensions of drift snow blown from the land under the weight of this snow the ice sinks slowly if the water be deep 
and the snow is gradually converted into ice by partial liquefaction and recongelation in this manner islands of ice of great thickness and many leagues in length originate and are eventually blown out to sea by offshore winds in their interior are enclosed many fragments of stone which had fallen upon them from overhanging cliffs during their formation such floating icebergs are commonly flat-topped but their lower portions are liable to melt in latitudes where the ocean at a moderate depth is usually warmer than the surface water and the air hence their center of gravity changes continually and they turn over and assume very irregular shapes in a voyage of discovery made in the antarctic regions in eighteen thirty nine a dark-colored angular mass of rock was seen embedded in an iceberg drifting along in mid-ocean in latitude sixty-one degrees south that part of the rock which was visible was about twelve feet in height and from five to six in width but the dark color of the surrounding ice indicated that it much more of the stone was concealed a sketch made by mr mcnab when the vessel was within a quarter of a mile of it is now published this iceberg one of many observed at sea on the same day was between two hundred and fifty and three hundred feet high and was no less than fourteen hundred miles from any certainly known land it is exceedingly improbable says mr darwin in his notice of the phenomenon that any land will hereafter be discovered within a hundred miles of this spot and it must be remembered that the erratic was still firmly fixed in the ice and may have sailed for many a league farther before it dropped to the bottom captain sir james ross in his antarctic voyage in eighteen forty one forty two and forty three saw multitudes of icebergs transporting stones and rocks of various sizes with frozen mud in high southern latitudes his companion dr j hooker informs me that he came to the conclusion that most of the southern icebergs have stones in them although they are usually concealed from view by the quantity of snow which falls upon them in the account given by messrs dees and simpson of their recent arctic discoveries we learn that in latitude seventy one degrees north longitude one hundred and fifty six degrees west they found a long low spit named point barrow composed of gravel and coarse sand in some parts more than a quarter of a mile broad which the pressure of the ice had forced up into numerous mounds that viewed from a distance assumed the appearance of huge boulder rocks this fact is important as showing how masses of drift ice when stranding on submarine banks may exert a lateral pressure capable of bending and dislocating any yielding strata of gravel sand or mud the banks on which icebergs occasionally run aground between baffin's bay and newfoundland are many hundred feet under water and the force with which they are struck will depend not so much on the velocity as the momentum of the floating ice islands the same berg is often carried away by a change of wind and then driven back again upon the same bank or it is made to rise and fall by the waves of the ocean so that it may alternately strike the bottom with its whole weight and then be lifted up again until it has deranged the superficial beds over a wide area in this manner the geologist may account perhaps for the circumstance that in scandinavia scotland and other countries where erratics are met with the beds of sand loam and gravel are often vertical bent and contorted into the most complicated folds while the underlying strata although composed of equally pliant materials are horizontal but some of these curvatures of loose strata may also have been due to repeated alternations of layers of gravel and sand ice and snow the melting of the latter having caused the intercalated beds of indestructible matter to assume their present anomalous position there can be little doubt that icebergs must often break off the peaks and projecting points of submarine mountains and must grate upon and polish their surface furrowing or scratching them in precisely the same way as we have seen that glaciers act on the solid rocks over which they are propelled 
to conclude it appears that large stones mud and gravel are carried down by the ice of rivers estuaries and glaciers into the sea where the tides and currents of the ocean aided by the wind cause them to drift for hundreds of miles from the place of their origin although it will belong more properly to the seventh and eighth chapters to treat of the transportation of solid matter by the movements of the ocean i shall add here what i have farther to say on this subject in connection with ice the saline matter which sea waters hold in solution prevents its congelation except where the most intense cold prevails but the drifting of the snow from the land often renders the surface water brackish near the coast so that a sheet of ice is readily formed there and by this means a large quantity of gravel is frequently conveyed from place to place and heavy boulders also when the coast ice is packed into dense masses both the large and small stones thus conveyed usually travel in one direction like shingle beaches and this was observed to take place on the coast of labrador and gulf of st lawrence between the latitudes fifty and sixty degrees north by captain bayfield during his late survey the line of coast alluded to is strewed over for a distance of seven hundred miles with ice-borne boulders often six feet in diameter which are for the most part on their way from north to south or in the direction of the prevailing current some points on this coast have been observed to be occasionally deserted and then again at another season thickly bestrewed with erratics the accompanying drawing for which i am indebted to lieutenant bowen r n represents the ordinary appearance of the labrador coast between the latitudes of fifty degrees and sixty degrees north countless blocks chiefly granitic and of various sizes are seen lying between high and low water mark captain bayfield saw similar masses carried by ice through the straits of belle isle between newfoundland and the american continent which he conceives may have travelled in the course of years from baffin's bay a distance which may be compared in our hemisphere to the drifting of erratics from lapland and iceland as far south as germany france and england it may be asked in what manner have these blocks been originally detached we may answer that some have fallen from precipitous cliffs others have been lifted up from the bottom of the sea adhering by their tops to the ice while others may have been brought down by rivers and glaciers the erratics of north america are sometimes angular but most of them have been rounded either by friction or decomposition the granite of canada as before remarked has a tendency to concentric exfoliation and scales off in spheroidal coats when exposed to the spray of the sea during severe frosts the range of the thermometer in that country usually exceeds, in the course of a year, a hundred degrees, and sometimes a hundred and twenty degrees Fahrenheit. And, to prevent the granite used in the buildings of Quebec from peeling off in winter, it is necessary to oil and paint the squared stones. In parts of the Baltic, such as the Gulf of Bothnia, where the quantity of salt in the water amounts in general to one-fourth only that in the ocean, the entire surface freezes over in winter to the depth of five or six feet. Stones are thus frozen in, and afterwards lifted up about three feet perpendicularly to the melting of the snow in summer, and then carried by floating ice islands to great distances. Professor von Baer states, in a communication on this subject to the Academy of St. Petersburg, that a block of granite, weighing a million of pounds, was carried by ice during the winter of 1837-38 to 38 from Finland to the island of Hochland, and two other huge blocks were transported about the years 1806 and 1814 by packed ice on the south coast of Finland, according to the testimony of the pilots and inhabitants, one block having traveled about a quarter of a mile, and lying about 18 feet above the level of the sea. More recently, Dr. Forkhammer has shown that in the Sound, the Great Belt, and other places near the entrance of the Baltic, ground ice forms plentifully at the bottom and then rises to the surface, charged with sand and gravel, stones and seaweed, 
Sheets of ice, also with included boulders, are driven up on the coast during storms and packed to a height of fifty feet. To the motion of such masses, but still more to that of the ground ice, the Danish professor attributes the striation of rocky surfaces forming the shores and bed of the sea, and he relates a striking fact to prove that large quantities of rocky fragments are annually carried by ice out of the Baltic. In the year 1807, he says, at the time of the bombardment of the Danish fleet, an English sloop of war riding at anchor in the roads of Copenhagen blew up. In 1844, or 37 years afterwards, one of our divers, known to be a trustworthy man, went down to save whatever might yet remain in the shipwrecked vessel. He found the space between the decks entire, but covered with blocks from six to eight cubic feet in size, and some of them heaped one upon the other. He also affirmed that all of the sunk ships which he had visited in the Sound were in like a manner strewed over with blocks. Dr. Forkhammer also informs us that during an intense frost in February 1844, the Sound was suddenly frozen over, and sheets of ice, driven by a storm, were heaped up at the bottom of the Bay of Tarbeshki, threatening to destroy a fishing village on the shore. The whole was soon frozen together into one mass and forced up on the beach, forming a mound more than sixteen feet high, which threw down the walls of several buildings. When I visited the spot the next day, I saw ridges of ice, sand, and pebbles, not only on the shore, but extending far out into the bottom of the sea, showing how greatly its bed had been changed and how easily, where it is composed of rock, it may be furrowed and streaked by stones firmly fixed in the moving ice. End of chapter 15, part 2section 34 of principles of geology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah principles of geology by charles lyle chapter 16 part 1 phenomena of springs origin of springs artesian wells borings at paris distinct causes by which mineral and thermal waters may be raised to the surface their connection with volcanic agency calcareous springs travertin of the elsa baths of san vignon and of san filippo near rotocofani spheroidal structure in travertin lake of the solfatara near rome travertin at cascade of tivoli gypsius silicious and ferruginous springs brine springs carbonated springs disintegration of granite in auvergne petroleum springs pitch lake of trinidad origin of springs the action of running water on the surface of the land having been considered we may next turn our attention to what may be termed the subterranean drainage or the phenomena of springs every one is familiar with the fact that certain porous soils such as loose sand and gravel absorb water with rapidity and that the ground composed of them soon dries up after heavy showers if a well be sunk in such soils we often penetrate to considerable depths before we meet with water but this is usually found on our approaching the lower parts of the formation where it rests on some impervious bed for here the water unable to make its way downwards in a direct line accumulates as in a reservoir and is ready to ooze out into any opening which may be made in the same manner as we see the salt water flow into and fill any hollow which we dig in the sands of the shore at low tide 
the facility with which water can percolate loose and gravelly soils is clearly illustrated by the effect of the tides in the thames between richmond and london the river in this part of its course flows through a bed of gravel overlying clay and the porous superstratum is alternately saturated by the water of the thames as the tide rises and then drained again to the distance of several hundred feet from the banks when the tide falls so that the wells in this tract regularly ebb and flow if the transmission of water through a porous medium be so rapid we cannot be surprised that springs should be thrown out on the side of a hill where the upper set of strata consist of chalk sand or other permeable substances while the subjacent are composed of clay or other retentive soils the only difficulty indeed is to explain why the water does not ooze out everywhere along the line of junction of the two formations as to form one continuous land soak instead of a few springs only and these far distant from each other the principal cause of this concentration of the waters at a few points is first the frequency of rents and fissures which act as natural drains secondly the existence of inequalities in the upper surface of the impermeable stratum which lead the water as valleys do on the external surface of a country into certain low levels and channels that the generality of springs owe their supply to the atmosphere is evident from this that they become languid or entirely cease to flow after long droughts and are again replenished after a continuance of rain many of them are probably indebted for the constancy and uniformity of their volume to the great extent of the subterranean reservoirs with which they communicate and the time required for these to empty themselves by percolation such a gradual and regulated discharge is exhibited though in a less perfect degree in every great lake which is not sensibly affected in its level by sudden showers but only slightly raised so that its channel of efflux instead of being swollen suddenly like the bed of a torrent is enabled to carry off the surplus water gradually much light has been thrown of late years on the theory of springs by the boring of what are called by the french artesian wells because the method has long been known and practised in artois and it is now demonstrated that there are sheets and in some places currents of fresh water at various depths in the earth the instrument employed in excavating these wells is a large auger and the cavity board is usually from three to four inches in diameter if a hard rock is met with it is first triturated by an iron rod and the materials being thus reduced to small fragments or powder are readily extracted to hinder the sides of the well from falling in as also to prevent the spreading of the ascending water in the surrounding soil a jointed pipe is introduced formed of wood in artois but in other countries more commonly of metal it frequently happens that after passing through hundreds of feet of retentive soils a water-bearing stratum is at length pierced when the fluid immediately ascends to the surface and flows over the first rush of the water up the tube is often violent so that for a time the water plays like a fountain and then sinking continues to flow over tranquilly or sometimes remain stationary at a certain depth below the orifice of the well this spouting of the water in the first instance is probably owing to the disengagement of air and carbonic acid gas for both of these have been seen to bubble up with the water
at sheerness at the mouth of the thames a well was bored on a low tongue of land near the sea through three hundred feet of the blue clay of london below which a bed of sand and pebbles was entered belonging doubtless to the plastic clay formation when this stratum was pierced the water burst up with impetuosity and filled the well by another perforation at the same place the water was found at the depth of three hundred twenty eight feet below the surface clay it first rose rapidly to the height of one hundred eighty nine feet and then in the course of a few hours ascended to an elevation of eight feet above the level of the ground in eighteen twenty four a well was dug at fulham near the thames at the bishop of london's to the depth of three hundred seventeen feet which after traversing the tertiary strata was continued through sixty-seven feet of chalk the water immediately rose to the surface and the discharge was about fifty gallons per minute in the garden of the horticultural society at chiswick the borings passed through nineteen feet of gravel two hundred forty two and a half feet of clay and loam and sixty seven and a half feet of chalk and the water then rose to the surface from a depth of three hundred twenty nine feet at the duke of northumberland's above chiswick the borings were carried to the extraordinary depth of six hundred twenty feet so as to enter the chalk when a considerable volume of water was obtained which rose four feet above the surface of the ground in a well of mr brooks at hammersmith the rush of water from a depth of three hundred sixty feet was so great as to inundate several buildings and do considerable damage and at tooting a sufficient stream was obtained to turn a wheel and raise the water to the upper stories of the houses in eighteen thirty eight the total supply obtained from the chalk near london was estimated at six million gallons a day and in eighteen fifty one at nearly double that amount the increase being accompanied by an average fall of no less than two feet a year in the level to which the water rose the water stood commonly in eighteen twenty two at high water mark and had sunk in eighteen fifty one to forty five and in some wells to sixty five feet below high water mark this fact shows the limited capacity of the subterranean reservoir in the last of three wells bored through the chalk at tours to the depth of several hundred feet the water rose thirty-two feet above the level of the soil and the discharge amounted to three hundred cubic yards of water every twenty-four hours by way of experiment the sinking of a well was commenced at paris in eighteen thirty four which had reached in november eighteen thirty nine a depth of more than sixteen hundred english feet and yet no water ascended to the surface the government were persuaded by m arago to persevere if necessary to the depth of more than two thousand feet but when they had descended above eighteen hundred english feet below the surface the water rose through the tube which was about ten inches in diameter so as to discharge half a million of gallons of limpid water every twenty-four hours the temperature of the water increased at the rate of one point eight degrees fahrenheit for every one hundred one english feet as they went down the result agreeing very closely with the anticipations of the scientific advisers of this most spirited undertaking mr briggs the british consul in egypt obtained water between cairo and suez in a calcareous sand at the depth of thirty feet but it did not rise in the well but other borings in the same desert of variable depth between fifty and three hundred feet 
and which passed through alternations of sand clay and siliceous rock yielded water at the surface the rise and overflow of the water in artesian wells is generally referred and apparently with reason to the same principle as the play of an artificial fountain let the porous stratum or set of strata a a rest on the impermeable rock d and be covered by another mass of an impermeable nature the whole mass a a may easily in such a position become saturated with water which may descend from its higher and exposed parts a hilly region to which clouds are attracted and where rain falls in abundance suppose that at some point as at b an opening be made which gives a free passage upwards to the waters confined in a a at so low a level that they are subjected to the pressure of a considerable column of water collected in the more elevated portion of the same stratum the water will then rush out just as the liquid from a large barrel which is tapped and it will rise to a height corresponding to the level of its point of departure or rather to a height which balances the pressure previously exerted by the confined waters against the roof and sides of the stratum or reservoir a a in like manner if there happens to be a natural fissure c a spring will be produced at the surface on precisely the same principle among the causes of the failure of artesian wells we may mention those numerous rents and faults which abound in some rocks and the deep ravines and valleys by which many countries are traversed for when these natural lines of drainage exist there remains a small quantity only of water to escape by artificial issues we are also liable to be baffled by the great thickness either of porous or impervious strata or by the dip of the beds which may carry off the waters from the adjoining highlands to some trough in an opposite direction as when the borings are made at the foot of an escarpment where the strata incline inwards or in a direction opposite to the face of the cliffs the mere distance of hills or mountains need not discourage us from making trials for the waters which fall on these higher lands readily penetrate to great depths through highly inclined or vertical strata or through the fissures of shattered rocks and after flowing for a great distance must often reascend and be brought up again by other fissures so as to approach the surface in the lower country here they may be concealed beneath the covering of undisturbed horizontal beds which it may be necessary to pierce in order to reach them it should be remembered that the course of waters flowing underground bears but a remote resemblance to that of rivers on the surface there being in the one case a constant descent from a higher to a lower level from the source of the stream to the sea whereas in the other the water may at one time sink far below the level of the ocean and afterwards rise again high above it among other curious facts ascertained by aid of the borer it is proved that in strata of different ages and compositions there are often open passages by which the subterranean waters circulate thus at st owen in france five distinct sheets of water were intersected in a well and from each of these a supply obtained in the third water-bearing stratum at the depth of one hundred fifty feet a cavity was found in which the borer fell suddenly about a foot and thence the water ascended in great volume the same falling of the instrument as in a hollow space has been remarked in england and other countries at tours in eighteen thirty a well was perforated quite through the chalk when the water suddenly brought up from a depth of three hundred sixty four feet a great quantity of fine sand 
with much vegetable matter and shells branches of a thorn several inches long much blackened by their stay in the water were recognized as also the stems of marsh plants and some of their roots which were still white together with the seeds of the same in a state of preservation which showed that they had not remained more than three or four months in the water among the seeds were those of the marsh plant gallium uliginosum and among the shells a freshwater species planorbus marginatus and some land species as helix rotundata and h striata monsieur duhardin who with others observed this phenomenon supposes that the waters had flowed from some valleys of auvergne or the vivere since the preceding autumn an analogous phenomenon is recorded at rimke near bosham in westphalia where the water of an artesian well brought up from a depth of one hundred fifty six feet several small fish three or four inches long the nearest streams in the country being at a distance of some leagues in both cases it is evident that water had penetrated to great depths not simply by filtering through a porous mass for then it would have left behind the shells fish and fragments of plants but by flowing through some open channels in the earth such examples may suggest the idea that the leaky beds of rivers are often the feeders of springs end of chapter sixteen part one